Yakuza 5 is big. Huge, colossal, grandiose, towering, pretty stonking large. Five playable characters, each with their own combat styles and gameplay shifting side stories. Five cities, each with their own stores and mini games. 500 quid on Patreon. And we're already way beyond the next few stretch goals. I'll get to them, don't worry. But Yakuza 5 is a beast. It had a two year development time in which they aimed to both double the content and write a thematically stronger story. The game came out in 2012 and was made to be a snapshot of a country and its culture. People petitioned for their cities to be included in its gargantuan narrative which spread across the nation. This game was big in so many ways. You know what else was big? The weight. It was worse in the West. After Foreign Dead Souls didn't make much of an impact, localization ceased. The series was dead outside of Asia, save for a cult fandom in the West importing copies. Most of us in the West wouldn't see it until 2015 with a digital-only PS3 release. Sega was testing the waters, seeing if there was much of a fan base left to serve. And well, it did good enough to get us Yakuza 0, where a newcomer boom guaranteed the series would continue to see its way over to us. When it did come out, I had to replace my hard drive to even install the thing. The game was demonstrating its sheer girth before I even got to play it, trading one Tokyo jungle for another. From there, being in university at the time, having coursework and other business to attend to, it took me well over a year to actually muddle my way through Yakuza 5, which only inflated how big the game felt. I remember a friend coming over at a few points throughout the year and I'd put the game on while we talked. He'd look at the screen and say, You're still in this damn city, as I trudged my way through snowy Tsukimino. When I got to the end, so long after I started, my memories of the early story were hazy or just gone. There was so little I could recall, which frayed an ending that may have been trying to intertwine so many narrative threads experienced over many hours, many months earlier. In the years since, Five has become an assortment of half-remembered scenes, made up mostly of people saying the word dreams ten times a minute, before being sent to the bloody land of Nod. That attempt at a stronger theme was weakly remembered as little more than a repeated statement of intent. It wasn't a thought, it was a word. This video will have spoilers, and yes, I'm aware it's long. I said at the end of Yakuza 4 I'll make this one shorter, and as I sit down to write, I doubt I'll keep that promise, and well, I'm beyond the point of caring whether or not I do. These videos are a compendium, an exploration, a journey, and an analysis of a series that I adore. Yakuza 5 is big, and we're going to go through it, bit by bit. If you can't watch this in one sitting, I understand. That's what chapters are for, if YouTube hasn't culled that very nice feature when you're watching this. I hope you enjoy the video, sit back and relax. We do actually have install screens for a little bit longer. No absurd English lyrics this time, sadly. Just an introduction to our playable lineup with a fan translation. There's a lot more motion and really nice transitions between the characters. The main menu also shows a step up in presentation, setting a mood for the story to follow. Kiryu in unfamiliar threads, walking away from Kamurocho, something's wrong here. The simplicity of previous menus honestly surprised me going back, they are downright utilitarian. But the sooner you can get people's minds going like this menu does, the better. So let's see what's up. It turns out Kiryu has walked quite a ways. Our story opens in December 2012, not in Kamurocho but Nagasugai, Fukuoka, based on the red light district of Nakasu. Yakuza just naturally gravitate towards such pleasure centers. Civilians stay clear of a standoff between foot soldiers, a car pulls up alongside the Tojo. Inside is Daigo, having just finished his talk with Tadashi Madarame, head of the local Yamagasa family. And it seems things have gone well. His humility and trust have impressed the man, and so the troops are dismissed for the evening by Tojo Chief of Headquarters Minoru Aoyama, and Yahata family captain... Yahata. Aoyama is a little confused as to why the hotel meeting was cancelled for this. Daigo says there's always risk, but the Yamagasa aren't so stupid they'd try anything against him. Aoyama then tries to usher his boss back to the hotel for the evening, but Daigo wanders off, saying he needs some time to himself. Aoyama summons Morinaga and Aizawa to keep track of the chairman. He heads to a taxi stand and picks a specific cab. And wouldn't you know who's driving it? 
Man, Daigo's making trouble for Kiryu in record time. With such efficiency, it's only fair he gets a fair. Kiryu's attempts to move him along fall flat, and so do two take off, heading nowhere in particular. Take Daigo, seeing that his driver is under the name Taichi Suzuki, and no, I'm not going to do that joke for an entire fifth of the runtime, starts a one-sided conversation layered in doublespeak. Talking about how the Tojo's fortunes have shifted since March 2010, now 30,000 men strong with money troubles sorted thanks to a business alliance with none other than the Omi. However, this deal and their chairman are not much longer for this world. The man is terminally ill, and none of his likely successors like the Tojo. Daigo knows that when any of them take power, the agreement folds, and war is likely to follow. In preparation for this, Daigo and the Tojo top brass have spread across the country, forming alliances, so that when the time comes, they'll have plenty of allies. This is all a very exciting setup for a crime thriller. So Kiryu, what's your response? Well, he wants nothing to do with it. The reins of the Tojo that he foisted on Daigo are his and his alone. Yakuza 5 does a lot to redeem Daigo in my eyes. I've cracked a lot of jokes about his less than stellar leadership and that's going to continue. But in this scene... <laughs> He's winning some respect. The game isn't done raising questions and painfully rubbing Kiryu's past in his face. As he gets some grub, we see Haruka being interviewed on TV. Two other drivers talk about how scummy the idol business is. A place where parents throw their kids to the wolves, hoping they'll achieve dreams they never could. All Kiryu can do is storm off. This gives a pretty solid idea about what has happened, but why and how? The opening of Yakuza 5 is slow, downbeat, atmospherically heavy, and really intriguing. 4 began in a Tokyo we know with faces we don't. Whatever disconnection is felt quickly dissipates because Akiyama brings us into his Kamurocho and reminded us that Kiryu's influence is still felt. This opening instead weaponizes disconnect. Kiryu's life is a haze and we're led to wonder how he got here and it's easy to imagine he's asking himself much the same. And when confronted with his past, he shows it the door. And this conflict runs deep. It hits you of how uncomfortably different everything is. So many shocking swerves back to back. Kiryu is not only not acting like himself, he isn't himself. He's lost his kids. He's miles from either place he could call home. Haruka's on TV and Daigo isn't fucking everything up. It doesn't take a detective to see that things are wrong. Back at Kiryu's workplace, Nagasu Taxi, he's about to turn in for the night but has one last piece of business to attend to. He's summoned by his boss Nakajima overtaking a queue jumping customer. Another firm had complaints and he's about to go apologize on our behalf but Kiryu insists he should be the one to do it. So we're told to head down to Tenjin Transportation. Outside, Kiryu figures he can't turn up empty handed and at the gates he hears a couple of tourists talking souvenirs, saying Fukuoka is well known for Mentaiko. So, that's a gift sorted. Yakuza 5 leans into the virtual tourism aspect with a much greater focus and scale. It introduces three new cities, Fukuoka, Sapporo, and Nagoya, which join the returning Osaka and Tokyo. While each of them are less interesting in layout than Kamurocho, they each have a unique visual identity and are very pleasant to soak in. Though, speaking of soak, sadly no rain. The cities are more densely populated than before. I don't mean there's more people, I mean they're really heavy. I love and loathe this. 
Plus, it's plainer than ever to see how the game tries to populate its streets, and the results are messy. What it tries to do is place a lot of people around corners so they'll wander out and fill the space. What tends to happen is they get stage fright, miss their cue, and now we have a 30-man mosh pit to muddle through. And since they're more tangible, you can't glide through them as easily, so we wind up with a lot more congestion. It's annoying, but also kind of funny. I never figured I'd get stuck in foot traffic. I have no idea why so many people are hanging out in this pocket of the Camaro Theatre cut-through, but man, this stairway is bumping. I have never knocked so many people flat. While the locations are lovingly rendered, food is the real star of the show. Eateries have always been a big part of the Yakuza experience, and with so much more ground to cover, Five puts dining front and center. Local delicacies are often the subject of sub-stories. There's a whole new power-up system based around dining. And the game makes Grub a focal point from very early on in the story. One of the earliest conversations Kiryu has is his boss being able to tell where he's from based on how he likes his broth base. Yakuza 5 is many things, and oddest amongst them is being a celebration of food. In each city, we also find a man from the local tourism board. He recruits us to go and snap five landmarks. This is a great way to get the player to really look at each city. Not just as the means to connect objectives and activities, but as an actual space. This game is about five nightlife hotspots, but a lot of effort has gone into making each of them feel distinct, and it's a great effort. This tourism angle also helps Kiryu. We're building familiarity with the place the same way he is. He's framed as a tourist along with us. Each of the characters in Yakuza 5 have a similar disconnection with their hub. A reason they're there even though it isn't truly their home. And in Kiryu's case, it does sit a little awkwardly with the fact that this game is also trying to make us love these locales while he'd sooner be elsewhere. Besides that, I do adore that when we finally make it to Camarocho, Tourism Board Man asks us not to get the same old spots, so we hand him such in-the-no sights as... The Gate? The Millennium Tower? The Hills? Yeah, it's a real deep dive. Why not show him the absurdly large sewers if we want to impress? Fishing's good down here. Give him Purgatory and have Kage kill us. I mean, oh well, he's happy, so... All's good, I guess. Getting a good gift is optional, and in New Game Plus I almost started blasting. But I let Tenjin get off easy. I don't want to make the boss's life harder by ending this guy's. So apology accepted, and banger news, it's payday, and Nakajima wants Suzuki to join him for a night out. Suzuki just has a little errand to run first. Kiryu is anonymously sending money to the orphanage, which further begs the question of why he isn't there. After that, he joins Nakajima for a night on the town. As we booze and brawl our way across Nagasugai, we get the story of how these men met. Nakajima found Suzuki on the bad end of a beating trying to defend a woman. New in town, lost, and without a job, the old cabbie sympathized. Nakajima has had a rough go of life himself, and formed Nagasu Taxi to be a place for good people dealt a bad hand. It's there Suzuki was welcomed and has remained since. <laughs> Nakajima is hands down the best boss Kiryu has ever had, and this kindness kills Kiryu a little, since he can only repay this man's generosity with dishonesty, keeping his true identity from the company for their benefit. Kiryu has always been a man of few words, but he's always been able to be honest with those around him. He's not a man of guile, and while he is trying to make the most of his new life, it's a life where he works to keep everyone at arm's length, and the nicer they are, the more painful that is. Nakajima knows there's more to Taichi Suzuki than meets the eye, but he lets him live the lie because he trusts that there's still a good man behind a very poorly worn mask. With their touchy-feely talk out of the way, Nakajima tells Kiryu rumors are circulating around the firm that he swings a certain way. Oreka? So with that, he's strong-armed into ending the night at Hostess Cabaret Olivier. Upon learning what the place is, he hesitates. But by now, Nakajima is too drunk and belligerent to be talked down. He demands their number one girl and blusters his way in. When Mayumi turns up, her and Kiryu share a look before she gets to work entertaining Nakajima. All Kiryu can do is sip his drink and say as little as possible. Luckily, two sloshed goons are there to do all the talking. The Tojo's visit has rubbed the lower rungs of the Yamagasa the wrong way, and these punks don't like having their lower rungs rubbed wrongly. They make a scene, berate the staff, and when Bossman heads over to have a word, 
Communications break down. If that makes it easier, why did they beat us, Kiryu? Yakuza 5 marks another engine change. Dead Souls, the zombie spin-off, was actually titled Of The End in Japan, since it was seen as closing the era of Kenzan, 3, 4, and itself. That's why we're seeing sleeker menus, more tangible crowds, and further refined combat to go along with it. The changes are subtle, but they do add up. For starters, characters feel a smidgen heavier. Combos no longer feel like a string of individual attack animations, but a series of flowing interconnected strikes, giving each greater heft and momentum. It took me a moment to get used to coming off of 4. These two incredibly easy goons genuinely caught me off guard. And yeah, I game over here. I guess they got boss fight music for a reason, but still pretty embarrassing. But within short order, it feels natural, and it's hard to go back after this. Frame stop has been added on big knockout strikes, instantly letting the player know to move on to another opponent. The difference a single stop frame can make is staggering. It adds a ton of impact to blows, while serving as a handy little indicator for the player. They've added a wall toss where in certain situations, instead of a standard throw, characters will instead send bastards barreling into barriers, where you can do a really weak follow-up. I don't care for this addition much. It mostly just got in the way of what I wanted to do, which is to throw a guy into more guys. But speaking of throws, I'm not sure this is meant to work. Your ability to turn when tossing is much greater, which can wind up looking crazy, but it does make a ton of mid-combo throws a lot more viable and useful in the same way turn hitting was earlier in the series. When it comes to this spinning, I'm a fan. Along with all this are some small quality of life improvements. A button to switch grapple positions has been added, which helps with some heat moves. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there is a heat suppression button, meaning you can throw out heavy attacks without worrying whether you'll spend meter. The ability to pump the brakes is fantastic, and I can't believe it took this long to come around. There have been so many times earlier in the series when I wanted to conserve heat, where I'd step on eggshells to hold on to a move. This fixes that. I can keep cutting loose. So, this is all a few steps forward, but there is one weird step back. Climax heat moves are a rather shallow addition that makes sure the issue still exists. Over multiple fights, you'll fill up one extra bar, and with it, you can do a highly damaging climax heat attack. Each character has three of these moves, but the one each of them starts with will have a pretty universal setup. The system does what it sets out to do, which is to give you a stronger, slower building heat move, but I hate what it does to the flow of combat. If I have one stored and want to save it for a boss, I now have to be very careful and dance around it. It weighs down on moment-to-moment -moment decision making and limits how I can fight for fear of accidentally setting the thing off. These moves have to be able to be triggered in a boss fight, so as stated, their trigger is simple, almost universal, and for that reason I wish they weren't just tied to hitting the heat action button the same as any other heat move, since I wasted these more often than not and their build up is so slow that I can't really plan around them. <laughs> That is one complaint though, and for the most part, after adjusting to it, the combat is snappy and more cathartic than ever. Kiryu's moveset hasn't seen much expansion, but he has improved his dropkick and he is clearly much, much angrier than before. Jesus Christ, Kiryu. So, the goons are got, and Kiryu hands the victory to Nakajima. Nakajima is the one who killed the Shachou. Is that the one? Oh, I love that guy. Outside, the two part ways, and it seems Kiryu's long, tiring evening is coming to a close. Let's go! 
The additions to street fighting are nice and small. They can fit in your pockets. Goons can now pull out cell phones to call in backup, and with this there are new heat actions to shut them down and spare their friends the pain. The enemies have another new bit of tech. The ability to run away. As their numbers dwindle, further defeats and big heat moves will send some of them packing. I'm proud. They finally realize they can run. Overall, I'm fond of these additions. They give the fights a bit more dynamism. Alongside this is a new diversion that makes street battles feel a little bit more meaningful, and that is the Victory Road Tournament. All across Japan, this mysterious yet somehow familiar gentleman is seeking out the toughest fighters, gathering them for a showdown in Tokyo's famed Pleasure District. Hopefuls are roaming the streets to provide, well, really easy battles still, but after a few run-ins you'll get a boss fight or two for each character. Again, I do wish these were just a mite tougher, and part of me wishes that all the Victory Road bosses roam the map rather than just the last one. The boss battles wait in place and they're flagged up. Admittedly more convenient, but it robs the Victory Road of some energy. It's a subplot that runs through the whole game and it builds excitement for the Colosseum, making it feel like we're on the cusp of something big, that this is a nationwide event. Okay, that's done. Kiryu can surely head to bed now, right? No. We're stopped by a dashing young lad. His name is Sasuke. Sasuke Kamaki. Having seen us wallop some goons earlier tonight, he takes Kiryu aside and says he sensed that the man was holding something back. Sasuke here wants a fight, and he wants us to give it our all. This unlocks Dragon Spirit, Kiryu's big new ability. Instead of a heat move, Kiryu can become incredibly pissed off. Attacks will bounce right off him and he'll instant shift to the nearest unfortunate soul and destroy them. It's unwieldy, uncontrollable, sort of jank, and a lot of fun. It's a great side option to heat moves. It's fantastic against crowds, but bosses will shut it down pretty quickly. Sosuke then goes on to reintroduce many of Kamaki's moves that Kiryu has forgotten all over again, including the dreaded Tiger Drop. Each character gets a master or two, each with a unique storyline and occasional requirements. We'll cover them as we get to each city. Sasuke in his youth was kept away from his grandfather, but sought the old master out when he was bullied at school. After training under him, Sasuke wanted to go and seek out his bullies, but the elder Kamaki told him not to. This has never sat right with Sasuke, who thinks it's a waste to sit in a dojo doing nothing but sparring. He believes that strength is meant to be used. He's blunt and rude and egotistical. But through talking with Kiryu and accidentally having his lack of success with women rubbed in his face, he starts to confront his ego, realize how stupid he's acting, and actually consider his grandfather's words, even if he doesn't quite get them yet. This is another frustration he has to grapple with. Understanding his grandfather's words aren't wrong, but being unable to comprehend why. That's his rather low unique requirement besides beating his increasingly difficult fights. His ego is brittle, so occasionally you'll have to go and find him about town and coax him back. The relationship begins with Sasuke noticing Kiryu is rusty and wanting to get him back up to speed, pretty much solely for his own gratification and wanting to fight someone he can clearly see as a fellow Kamaki-style practitioner. It ends when Kiryu, now limbered up, notices that Sasuke isn't at his full potential either. He's effective, but his martial arts is little more than violence, it lacks grace and control. Which is a pretty good explanation of why the first thing we get from Sasuke is Dragon Spirit, which is effective but directionless rage. Useful for overcoming most, but ineffectual against a skilled fighter. And I do love that by this point, Kiryu is not above babying the guy, telling him his tough guy act is paper thin, and Sasuke will never improve if he doesn't actually confront himself. After one last strop, Sasuke swallows his pride, and then spits it back up again when asking Kiryu for help paying his way back to Tokyo. But you'll want to pony up the dough. It's pretty important for... about 100 in-game hours from now. And this was a fun little story. It's strange that at this point, the most human connection Kiryu has formed has been with the grandson of an old hobo who taught Kiryu how to break the game he's in. But I'll take it. So now, at long last, can Kiryu head home? He's got work in the morning. Okay, alright. No interruptions so far. All clear. He's at the door. And he's safe. So, now with some time to himself, Kiryu indulges in his favourite hobby. 
staring at a wall and smoking himself to death. Daigo's words linger in his mind. <sighs> but he's knocked out of his reverie. The next morning, Kiryu and number one hostess and housemate Mayumi have a chat. She's the one Kiryu helped all those months ago and their relationship is strange. Kiryu is keeping a distance that Mayumi is trying to bridge, undeterred by Kiryu's polite, consistent pushing away. This is the only person Kiryu has let in to any extent, besides Sosuke. He doesn't hide his ink from her, but in being closer, she's so much further away. I love the music choice for this scene. It gives the whole thing an oppressive air. There's ground that neither is willing to give, questions neither are ready to ask, an uncomfortable dishonesty that both seem aware of. Anyway, off to work. Unlike Kiryu with his stellar stamina, Yakuza 5 is going to have a lot of pacing problems as we go along. Like Yakuza 4, each character has a unique activity, but 5 expands these into entire side stories with new gameplay systems and self-contained plotlines. So Kiryu doesn't get to walk into work without first drawing the ire of the Devil Killers, as some of the creeps we beat up last night want revenge on Kiryu and drag their gangster buddy into the mix. All the momentum of that intro, with questions raised and tones set, that's about to be put on hold for an hour to set up an entirely different story and give tutorials on a new set of mechanics. Now, this would have to go somewhere in the game, and it's probably best to get it out of the way now. We're going to see this happen several more times over the course of the game, and this is probably the second worst instance of it, and it's not that bad. Inside the Nagasu taxi office, no one questions why they heard bones breaking outside. Before we can start work for the day, Kiryu's senior at the company, Wada, asks if he can get a ride home. Suzuki obliges, and Nakajima encourages Wada to give the newbie some tips. We also meet the young, by the books and boring Muramatsu, and Hirakawa. Wada takes us on a lap of Nagasugai, and Kiryu is briefed on how he should drive for passengers. As soon as Wada is dropped off, an actual client is picked up. This guy tries to chat with Kiryu, and when he can't keep the conversation going, the guy basically teaches Kiryu how to do small talk, and tells us that people in these parts like their drivers chatty. Being a Londoner I can't relate, but I can suggest exporting every cabbie I've ever met. Kiryu, mate, you gave Daigo bad service. The two are interrupted when the car is rear-ended by a devil killer. They used to only challenge other races, but they're now stooping so low as to harass civilians. So our passenger, who turns out to work for the police, encourages Kiryu to take up the challenge. So this happens. Mm. The guy we beat turns out to be the guy we beat, so he beats it. The cop, who by the way is named Furumichi, treats Kiryu to a meal and asks him to take on the rest of the devil killers. A cop can't be seen street racing since it would hurt their image, but Kiryu might be a way to infiltrate and take down the gang. There is some apprehension, but when he's told about the potential harm the devil killers might do, he agrees to give it a go. Back at the office, we tell Nakajima about our run-in. <coughs> well, there's obviously a story there. He gives Kiryu the go-ahead and says he'll contact Furumichi himself. But something here is digging at him. And so with that out of the way, we can get back to the other crime drama. Or we can spend five hours doing this, and this, and this. So let's get to work. Whoa, 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 slow down. We're not there yet. You've got to learn the rules of the road before you can break them. The taxi side story doesn't have an ongoing narrative, with each mission being its own vignette. Kiryu talks to his passenger, and through his words and more importantly, exceptional driving, he helps them a little. It's a sub-story in motion. The gameplay is mundane in a way that's really enjoyable. You have to obey traffic laws, use your indicators, and watch out for... People who have it coming. 
all the while making conversation. There's a lot jockeying for your attention, and it does come together into something genuinely engaging. Plus the music is chill in a weirdly classically Sega dreamcast -y way. I love it. It's less Crazy Taxi and more Chatty Cabby. It is sort of limited by the simplicity of the Nagasugai map, leading to a lot of repetition, and the aforementioned seemingly suicidal shitheads who dive into the road. And I get penalised for giving them what they want. This is a service job, and my bumper is a valuable service. This can get pretty grating when it does a tailing mission, but for the most part, all things chill. Before long, the game drops the whole driving bit, and it becomes an hour of text boxing. It is a little disappointing. Kiryu giving Sagely advice is fun and this is the perfect setup for it, but several of these back-to-back -back all put at the end, and you start wishing they scaled the quantity of content back a little to give us more regular taxi gigs, or maybe intersperse these with the driving jobs. It runs out of gas way too fast and then just sputters on for many meandering miles. Are you guys hearing that? Okay, so what we're all here for? Wild speed! Nagoshi got his start at Sega in racing games, and yeah, he's got a good track record. This obviously can't go all in on driving mechanics, but for a side mode that is far more styled at substance, has just one track with some course variation, and takes two hours to clean out, it's pretty damn fun. The driving model is arcadey and simplistic. This is about doing sick drifts and hitting boost. Parts of the circuit also have heat actions that can only be triggered once per race. You've got to pick your moments to make them most effective, either to build a stronger lead or close a gap. They're pretty entertaining to boot. Between each race, you can customize your taxi's look and stats. This is more important than your actual driving ability. The AI is a rubber band and what's really important is snapping it. Only the optional final challenge race tasks you with both optimizing the car to keep up and maintaining a slim lead through constant drifting and smart use of boost. Most of the racing is more spectacle than skill, but it's pretty good spectacle. Also, fucking baller soundtrack. This was my second run in with Eurobeat after running in the 90s on YTMND, and this time it stuck with me. I also do love the little saga of Kiryu versus the Devil Killers, though little might be underselling it. This side story not only features its own cast, it truly spends its time exploring and developing them. Kiryu meanwhile fills the role of a street racer with hilarious ease, cool and collected, has an inner intensity, and most importantly, very little regard for his own well-being. He is ready made for this. While beating them, Kiryu impresses a young devil killer hopeful named Kiyakawa, who instead joins Nagasu Taxi. He acts as our exposition for the devil killer's four kings, while in turn Kiryu acts as his senpai at the company. They're a lively bunch. Speaking of lively, we're challenged by Muramatsu. He has hated this whole situation from the get-go. We learn he was an F1 hopeful, but couldn't afford to keep chasing the dream oh hey there's that word, and had to pack it in. He hates street racers more than anything for making a mockery of proper racing, and he thinks Kiryu is just doing this for the glory. After a street race, he swallows his pride and admits he just hated us getting an attention that life has denied him, and endeavours to support our struggle. Games just exist in this wonderful reality where we can win any argument by just being better at stuff. I love it. Muramatsu also drops the bomb that Nakajima used to be a street racer, which definitely throws Kiryu for a loop. As we keep giving the devil killers the one-two punch, winning a race and then punching them, one eventually confesses that Nakajima was the original devil killer. When confronted, he finally sheds some light on his past. Twenty years back, the devil killers were nothing more than him and a bunch of gearhead friends, Wada amongst them, and Nakajima was the fastest of the lot. For them, safety was always top priority. They made certain they weren't endangering anyone else, and they raced purely for the love of speed. Nakajima hates that now it's all done on public highways and races are heavily gambled on. When Kiryu asks why Nakajima left the life, Wada has to step in and say that's the story best left in the past. Speaking of the past, the new leader of the Devil Killers has no respect for it. He despises the hobbyist nature of the group's founding, but takes great pleasure and profit in profiting from it. This is the root of the story here, people corrupting another's dream for their own selfish end. They've even turned Kiryu's confrontation with the boss into a publicity stunt, streaming it online and running the betting pool, all with hopes of a big payday. 
With an agreement, the group will disband if Kiryu wins the race. So, we crush them once, and then once more as they try to renege on the deal. It's still not over, as Onisaka turns up to keep the pedal to the metal, and with a name like that, you know we're dealing with a real speed demon. Twenty years ago, this man was meant to race Nakajima. He had been out of town training for the race for a year, but he returned to Fukuoka to find his opponent had disappeared, and he's carried a grudge ever since. We talk to the boss about this, and it leads to Nakajima revealing that his wife was put into a coma after a car accident. Nakajima didn't have it in him to be mad, it was a street racer that hit them, forcing him to realise the danger that he was always posing to others no matter how hard he tried. He and Wada left the scene, and without his direction the Devil Killers began to morph into the soulless entity we just put to rest. Nakajima loved nothing more than taking his wife out on rides, and with no skills besides driving, he took up work as a cabbie in the hopes that when she wakes up he could drive her around again. Which sadly didn't come to pass. To Onisaka's credit, he understands that Nakajima isn't a man to leave without good reason, but he's been stuck waiting a long time to prove himself. Kiryu is now the man who can step in and try and help him move on by doing sick drifts. This is Kiryu being able to pay Nakajima back for the kindness he showed him, by moving that kindness onto Onisaka, who shouldn't have to live life chained to a decades old grudge match. Kiryu triumphs, Nakajima and Onisaka bury the hatchet, and it turns out Furumichi was another devil killer. So the original gang are reunited 20 years on, so that they may properly say goodbye to it all. Optional race of a traffic cop unlocked, but Nakajima remains unchallengeable because Yakuza respects its characters. Also, we raced Wada in there somewhere. So this is really good stuff. It's its own little chronicle, treated with near as much weight, if not production value, as the main story. Only it's about street racing. The core theme of dreams is present and utilized in a unique way. I went through it mostly beat for beat to show that yes, this is a story. It's also fun to play and doesn't outstay its welcome. It's perhaps the first sign that Yakuza 5 might be one of the most absurdly stuffed experiences you'll ever get, when a purely optional tale has this much love, attention, and thematic resonance. I've got to ask, does anyone remember what's going on in the story? I mean, the story story. Kiryu's turning in after his longest day of work in Aizawa, how you been? I'm surprised I remember your name. More so Morinaga. The two take Kiryu aside. Daigo has disappeared, and his last known location was the taxi of Taichi Suzuki, and they're very surprised to learn just who that is. Throughout this part, Kiryu rejects his identity as the fourth chairman, but the Yakuza world and Kiryu's own inability to truly walk away means he'll always come back. It still affects him, whether or not he likes it. Still, Kiryu isn't there yet. He says he doesn't know where Daigo has Daigon and tries to go. This sets off Aizawa, revealing he's passionate to a fault. <laughs> eh, couldn't have been an accident. I don't remember hitting him. Aizawa does try and get Kiryu to talk, disgusted by his disregard for the clan, claiming that Daigo was always telling stories of the legendary fourth chairman. Kiryu's name still has strength amongst the Tojo. Little does he know that's not praise the man wants, as he continues to insist that he's just a taxi driver. <laughs> Morinaga steps in and winds up planting an idea in Kiryu's head. He asks if he really is just Taichi Suzuki. When Taichi agrees, Morinaga follows that, since he's just a civilian, they'll simply beat answers out of him. This seems pretty cool. We're now kicking off the real mystery, Daigo's disappearance. If you've done all the taxi stuff, it feels oddly natural to readjust to the main story with a scene that's only mildly more polished in presentation. That said, for a lot of Kiryu's part from now on, it really is just men standing around in drab locales, talking back and forth at each other and speculating for extended periods. It's a lot less dynamic and exciting than how previous games have done it. Though part of that may be reflecting that Kiryu has left a lot of himself behind and is fighting a losing battle to keep it that way. I say that because later parts can be a lot more dynamic and interestingly staged. Meanwhile, Kiryu's part has something of an emptiness about it. Wait, 
それだけは本当だこの後どうするかはお前たちの仕事だ The next day, Kiryu drives a couple of Omi men to the station. They reiterate everything Daigo said from the Omi perspective with a smidgenless doublespeak and, well, far less interesting subtext. As Kiryu gets these two Yakuza to spill a ton of stuff by just asking leading questions and spilling that Daigo is missing. I mean, damn, Furumichi really taught you how to keep the conversation going, huh, Taichi? You bloody rat. Hang on, wait, when did the Omi get here? After work, Kiryu sees the two bodyguards still trying to find leads, and the Yamagasa are not happy to have this mess on their doorstep. Back at home, Kiryu and Mayumi talk. After Kiryu once again rejects her advances, the conversation turns to the touchy topic of family. This chapter began with a flashback to Kiryu leaving the orphanage, which I'll get more into later when we have enough context to discuss the meatier themes. But suffice to say, this is weighing on Kiryu's mind right now. He has left behind everything he cares about and just asked Mayumi to leave as well. By now, there's a strong sense that Kiryu just wants to be put in a box where no one could really ever get close to him again, if only because he believes everyone he comes into contact with suffers for it. Kiryu's coldness steadily reveals itself to be his idea of protecting others. That's when Aizawa drags in a beaten and bloodied Morinaga. At the waterfront, Kiryu is told what happened. The two were ambushed by Yamagasa men and they're not alone. Ever since the meet between Daigo and Madarame, Tojo soldiers are getting jumped left and right. The tricky thing is they can't report this or ask for help. Patriarch Aoyama, the chief of headquarters, is an incredibly strict figure. He ruthlessly punishes mistakes, culls any family not pulling their weight regardless of age or prestige, and promotes go-getters no matter how junior. Kiryu says that running a Yakuza clan like a business won't work, but Aizawa points out that numbers are up and morale is high. The clan has been reinvigorated under his watchful eye. Something like the Oena Sewa incident would likely not even have got off the ground if Aoyama was around. One thing the game doesn't really go into is that Kamurocho Hills was finished. We'll visit it, and it's still under the Tojo umbrella, right? Did it do anything for them? Ah, never mind, it was probably all Aoyama, who by the way was this guy. Part of the fun of following this franchise for me has been charting how circumstances change game to game, which is usually sensible and has all these little causes and effects. Every game is self-contained, but the bigger picture is always there. Now, this isn't a big issue, it's more a nitpick, but it stands out to me. For the hills to be little more than set dressing, when it was seen as instrumental to fixing the Tojo's money troubles last game, that's a little bit weak. But hey, a downturn led to them forming their alliance with the Omi that's now being broken to kick the plot off. Kiryu, for all his attempts at disconnection, can't help but offer his perspective that perhaps his generation are no longer necessary, that the white-collar Yakuza have completely uprooted the old soldiers. Even Mine stained himself red in wanting to shed his corporate ties, but Aoyama is nothing more than a businessman, and he'll toss out anything that doesn't meet demand. We're going to have a lot more discussion over the shifting image and demands of the Yakuza for the next two games, but for now, let's just say Aoyama may be a little bit ahead of his time. Back at the apartment, Mayumi rifles through Morinaga's jacket. The other two return, and Kiryu asks her to head home for the night. Much like Morinaga, Kiryu has opened up a little. The leading suspects are the Yamagasa, but Aizawa doubts they'd take such a risky move. Their talk is interrupted by a phone call. Aoyama, who, by the way, is still this guy, has declared himself acting chairman despite Daigo being gone for a measly two days. The two head off for a meeting. そうだ。桐生さんに一つ伝えておいた方が良いことがなんだ。あの女性、真由美さんでしたっけ。あの女には。お気づきでしたか。それじゃ。<笑> The next evening, Wada dumps some more of Kiryu's past on him. It's good to see you, Mac. We'll talk about Revelation when I had some free time. While out working, Kiryu is confronted by Serizawa, an Osakan detective who's been sent here to track Omi Captain and Chairman Hopeful Watase. Today, 
関係ねえってことはねえだろうてめえの古巣だろうよ,よ桐生さんよ And well, he doesn't care for Kiryu pretending not to know anything. Serizawa thinks that Fukuoka is going to be ground zero for a war between the clans, and he wants the Osaka PD to be the ones to stop that from happening. After a certain detective of theirs fell in love with a certain Tojo, well, they've been a laughing stock, so now they have an image to rebuild. Now there's that continuity I was talking about. Man, Sayama would be really confused if she got back now. Serizawa says Watase is here to stop the Alliance. He suspects the Omi have kidnapped Daigo to stall negotiations and swing things in their favor. The detective wants us to get to Watase and talk him down before Morinaga, or well, more likely Aizawa, spark this whole powder keg. We're told the man is at Olivier and Serizawa here will make sure the police don't bulldoze our life. So off Kiryu goes. <laughs> What to say is an interesting guy. Yes, he wants a war with the Tojo, but no, he hasn't kidnapped Daigo, a fact which Kiryu refuses to believe. What to say also has the best measure of Kiryu anyone has had so far. What to say realizes the dragon won't be swayed by simple denial. He sends his men at Kiryu to check if the man still breathes fire, and when satisfied, wants nothing more than to share a drink. I like what to say. He's confident he's going to be the next chairman, so he's focused on what comes afterwards. It turns out his sworn brother is Aoyama, no love lost between those two, but it was good for the Tojo and Omi's business alliance, just like feudal lords marrying their kids off. And it was from Aoyama that Watase learned Kiryu was in town. He claims to be here for him and nothing else. He came here to beg the man to return to the Tojo, so that when his war begins, it will be one worth fighting, because right now he thinks the Tojo weak. And it's nice to know someone has the Tojo's well-being in mind. To that end, he didn't kidnap Daigo. He doesn't want the man missing since that leaves the Tojo rudderless, ill-fit for a fight. In the last couple of games, the reason the Omi didn't pounce on the Tojo during moments of weakness was for fear of Kiryu, and the plotters of those games tried to keep him out of the picture. In 5, Watase invites him in. He wants to be the one to finally take down the fourth chairman. I said that Watase has had the best measure of Kiryu. The two of them are classic Yakuza. But where Watase fails to grasp Kiryu is the reason why he fights. It's a good speech, and important for where we're going. It's worth noting that this is the most Kiryu has seemed himself so far. Watase is the first person he has had anything approaching a proper conversation with. He may be pissed at him, but this is the sort of confrontation where Kiryu is most comfortable. Instead of these two sparking a war, this scene sparks some life in Kiryu. <laughs> Right now, these three believe that Aoyama tricked the Omi into coming here, putting pressure on the local Yakuza to quickly agree to an alliance. After learning what Watase wants, Kiryu is fairly sure the Omi don't have Daigo. And that just leaves one suspect. We're off to check in with the Yamagasa. And when I say check in with, I mean... Assault. I love that stealth breaks down the moment Kiryu encounters a door and his instincts literally kick in. And the heat moves that follow have probably soured any chance of an alliance thanks to guilt by association. The gameplay starts picking up pace with the story here. After some interruptions like having a job and the slow reintroduction of gameplay elements, we're in, busting heads and having the big speeches. Upstairs we find Madarame stabbed. 
Aoyama intended to trick him with a suitcase bomb, but the old man was two steps ahead and a few shots wide. Aoyama doesn't want an alliance, considering the Tojo above such a small backwater clan, and as long as he's chairman, what he says goes. Well, no need to jump the... oh. <laughs> Damn, Aoyama. Learning from the best. I have to guess that your heart is the world's heaviest sleeper. Because as Aoyama kicks the gun over to us and collapses in a heap, he finally arrives just in time for us to take the blame. And all we've done is give Aoyama an opening to flee. Kiryu tells Aizawa to get his anarchy out of here, and respecting that masterful deception Aoyama put on, doesn't even try and avoid a fight. That would be rude. Let's talk about the tiger drop. I watched some Dante Devil 12 and Gunkshot videos, both very good channels ran by people very, very good at Yakuza, and while there's much more variety to their vids than tiger dropping bosses, I did start to notice how they were pulling them off. I will warn that picking up on how they did it and putting that into practice has had some repercussions. Nothing gameplay ruining, and I'm surprised it took me this long to notice, but honestly, I can be very slow on the uptake. It's all about spacing. A lot of bosses can be very easily baited into using nothing but their gap closers, moves made to punish reticence that turn out to be very, very easy to punish. While I'm nowhere near batting 100, I can now land counters so much more consistently. I have to hold myself back from baiting these. It trivialized some legend boss fights. Luckily, it never stops being satisfying to land. Still, sorry Yahata, you're getting played by me and, well, by Aoyama. Kiryu fights his way out, and makes sure to leave in style, giving the Yamagasa plenty of reason to think he's dunking on them. The next morning, Kiryu Tiger drops Mayumi's own gap closer. Mayumi brings Kiryu to her father, Madarame. He knew Aoyama was going to betray him thanks to a warning from none other than Daigo. It turns out the young chairman had long suspected their lives were in danger. Whoever arranged their meeting placed them in an obvious killing field, so Daigo switched the meeting and asked Madarame to pretend he requested the change. I gotta give it to Daigo, he's way more charismatic than I've given him credit for. He didn't get Madarame to agree to an alliance, he got him to agree to be bait on the hook, to potentially look guilty of kidnapping the Tojo's chairman, all in a bid to make the traitor within that man's clan reveal himself. Daigo in the meanwhile has gone into hiding, and all we know is that he has business to attend to before he'll reveal himself. Also, the fact Daigo already suspected Aoyama of something means he's not the real traitor. While this is true, I don't know how they thread that needle. I may be being an idiot. The point is, things go deeper than Aoyama. Mayumi was sent to keep an eye on us at Daigo's request, to make sure his cover is maintained and he's kept out of the life. Until now, anyway. Madarami regrets this since, well... She's a spy, but her feelings are genuine, and Kiryu doesn't return them. He probably means while well saying it, but... Probably cuts pretty damn deep, especially if you've been doing hostess content. Maybe the only reason Kiryu hasn't spat in Mayumi's face is he worries she'll like it. Jesus, that was fucking mean. Oh, that was a line. 
Madarame hands Kiryu an official order to dissolve the Yamagasa. He has an idea how the Tojo and Omi will move from here on out, and he doesn't want his boys to get hurt. Kiryu sets off to deliver this order to Yahata, but after the whole incident last night, they're not so willing to talk. It's here we run into the most dangerous foes we've seen yet. Nothing better against heat. The only buggers I broke out the golden gun for on my legend run. At least, out of fear, not impatience. So we come face to face with a captain for a second time, and he rejects the order. It doesn't matter to him whether or not the Yamagasa stands. They're loyal to Madarame and will fight on his behalf. <laughs> They've put together that last night was not Kiryu's fault and Aoyama was the real culprit. And man, if word could have spread a little bit faster, you would have far fewer injuries in your ranks. Kiryu, hearing these lads will not back down, tears up the letter and takes control of the situation. Kiryu, in what is the beginning of a strange miniature arc that will last all of half an hour, says he drives a taxi in town, and the Yamagasa falling would be bad for business, so he'll protect them. This upsets Kubal, which pleases Kiryu, though he says they'll need more than spirit to win this one. Kicking off the most hilarious boss fight in the series. Well, it's not a tiger drop, but I'll take it. With their respect won, Kiryu vows to take down every last Tojo in Fukuoka. What happens next is setting up the best shit you'll ever see. Aoyama gets a call, Yahata cockily setting a time and place for a good old-fashioned brawl. He is genuinely unable to comprehend what he's hearing. Look at this fucker, cool as a cucumber. As for Aoyama, well, this is not the kind of decision he's equipped to weigh up, and that makes him act rash. His pride forces him to take up the challenge. So tomorrow night, rumble at the docks. Better known as the docks. Kiryu's gotta make amends and deal with any pressing business before the big blowout. Outside, one of Minamida's assistants is asking for testers to try out the brand new IF-8. Oh yeah, other people can wait. It's time for some video games. Kiryu may have just had a scene where he embraced who the world thinks he is more than ever, but nah, he's gonna lie to this kind old man who has expanded his brain in many back alleys. But before we play IF-8, let's talk leveling. Yakuza 5 merges the Soul Orb system with the older categories you put points into, which does make leveling feel more weighted and considered. There is strategizing and delayed gratification, some light maths involved since you get three Soul Orbs per level and many upgrades are multiples of two. While I like the freedom of four, I imagine to a newcomer this much choice is stifling when you may not even yet know the intricacies of its combat, while this more limited system can better point you in the right direction. There's a level cap of 20, Kinda like D&D, but we start as epic level fighters and ascend from there to godhood. When we finally make it to Kamurocho, Kiryu can find Sasuke working with his granddad, and the elder Kamaki reveals the secret of how his age isn't slowing him down. We need a physical breakthrough. A test of endurance so punishing, it pushes you past your limits. And now, with his grandson here, he can provide that breakthrough. By breaking you. Yeah, it's the toughest fight in the game. Fortunately, A shotgun is just a ranged tiger drop when you think about it. Hang on, Kamaki, what are you doing? Each character can take this test. It raises the level cap and adds some incredibly busted endgame moves. Since you'd had to be late in the game anyway and have gotten each character to what was formerly max level, these moves are wild and this is a great payoff, really fun. However, you will not have enough orbs through regular leveling to get everything. So now let's talk about Inner Fighter 8, Road Battle. Cool idea, lackluster result. In each city, players can find and play this new iteration, now in the form of a side-scrolling beat-em-up. It's very simplistic and incredibly easy. Enemies slowly saunter in and character combos when translated into 2D are devastating. There's no attempts to add depth by way of juggling or really any sort of crowd management. The pace is too slow and you're way too fast for it. This feels less like owing an upgrade and more like putting in the time for one. 
It looks neat, and I respect that something new was attempted, but this winds up cutting away what I liked about Inner Fighter, which was in the way it recontextualized and remixed boss fights for new abilities. This winds up feeling relatively pared down and uninspiring. This'll net you a heat gauge boost. Later on, also in Kamurocho, we'll find Minamida working on the main unit. If we've cleared every stage, we can play the Kamurocho level. With investment, each playable fighter also gets a singular flashback battle where they can face off against one of their bosses. Again, for a heat gauge boost. There's no sharing boss fights or character battles, the bosses don't gain new gimmicks. But there are more soul orbs. Once you've got all of those heat gauge upgrades, just grind out the same battle eight times for those last remaining soul orbs. And if you're doing crafting as well, then keep grinding out battles to get materials. It's cool that it also ties in with Kamaki in a way. You've got to put all of your tools and experiences together to truly hit your peak. It is very Yakuza. But this is a step down from 4 in content and is a bit of a bum note after a game of build-up. It's cool that Yakuza 5 has crammed so much gameplay variety in, but many things do wind up feeling like novelties, and Minamida's final creation is sadly a little lacking. Yep, this is the last we'll see of him. This is the video game market. One bad game and funding falls through. Kiryu's been tidying up around town. Literally. Each city has their own version of locker keys, a way to get some bonus items and make sure you're looking at the floor. Nagasu Taxi joins an initiative to tackle the local littering problem, so we get rewarded for our civic service. While the rewards are lesser than lockers and take more effort, it's a little something to do while you're wandering about town and reflects Kiryu's new role in the community. Okay, let's get on to Mac. He lamented how Kiryu had gone quiet. It really hurt the guy. So Kiryu can provide all of one, count them, one new revelation. Sorry, Mac. I guess you can't teach an old dragon new tricks. There is a slight change. Instead of guessing what you should learn, now they need to be readied with a substory, setting up a punchline. Which, hey, I like the mechanics which tie into each other like this. Though really, these substories tend to be incredibly simplistic. They're an excuse to get the revelation in place. This is sort of the last game to feature revelations, and it feels like they're running out of steam. Bowing out as well, as gracefully as watching fat people fall off a bridge to learn a new dance move can really be. Hey Haruka, who's that guy? Some substories focus on life at Nagasu Taxi. One of them even involves Kiyakawa. This is pretty cool, having him not just exist in the side story but moved into a substory feels like a reward onto itself. It makes his role feel a little fuller and like we've actually impacted the world a little. Him and Muramatsu, the fools, well they drag Kiryu to a mixer where his job is to make the two of them look more appealing than him. Rough gig. Back at the office, we have three computer illiterates trying to solve. That. A handful of substories get a bit more mileage out of the driving. Just having Kiryu in the workplace is amusing. There's a lot of potential gags and they do hit a few, but having more gameplay styles to lean on expands what can happen. Kiryu's a great character, his stoicism and straightforwardness can work for drama and comedy without him having to really act out of character. But as games go by and his reputation develops, it does feel like there's a bit less he can do. Mundanity can start feeling a little at odds with him. Yakuza 5, for its change of circumstance, can give Kiryu more down-to-earth things to do since only the audience is in on how big he is. The idea of Kiryu just doing a 9-to-5 is funny to begin with. One substory even opens up an entirely new minigame. Tatsuya Noodles is a rhythm-cooking timing management game. You have to stay on top of several customers' preferred hardness of noodles by managing how long they're cooked. It's an ingenious little mixture of situational awareness and timing that I just can't handle. It's like rubbing your belly and patting your head if you had twice as many heads, hands, and guts. I can stand the heat, but I am not cut out for this kitchen. Each town has one of these little mini-games. They're just there. You don't have to do them. God, how stuffed with content are we already? And it's just somewhere in here. And that makes it so cool. Besides that, a great deal of substories have Kiryu confront aspects of his past. These are effective both for pulling on the heartstrings and giving us a few more clues as to what happened to him. Yakuza 4 had a lot of Kiryu's run-ins be transformative periods in people's lives, where his help over the years was starting to bear fruit. Now Kiryu is in a less fortunate time in his own life, and that's when we bump into Yuya. He creates a bit of a scene, and I feel bad for the guy. He is so hurt by Kiryu trying to blank him in front of a co-worker.
when they're alone, Kiryu spells it out. He has to hide his identity for Haruka's sake. The why is left up in the air, but it's a warm display of trust for him to say that much. Yuya himself is in an odd situation. Stardust is running so smoothly that he no longer feels needed, and with that his motivation for the job is drying up. Seeing Kiryu gives him the idea to uproot his life, take a new name and start from the bottom. He craves challenge. It's the only way a person can grow. I think I heard that in a game somewhere. And so he winds up as... A waiter at a cabaret. Yeah, you're really uh, flipping the script on yourself. With his expertise, he quickly wins hearts and makes a place for himself, until his boss is about to cave to the Yakuza and he can't bring himself to make him do otherwise. Kiryu reminds him what he once fought for, reminding him of who he was five games and so many years ago when he spoke English. Fuck you! Then we tag team those racketeering rascals and send them running. Yuya tells his boss who he really is and says he has to return to Kamurocho, back where he belongs. Right after starting a fight with the Yakuza. We're seeing a hero off. It's bittersweet, and we'll get some parallels in the main plot shortly. Yuya makes it out a bit better than Kiryu, and considering current circumstances, God damn, Yuya does sort of rub it in. Not purposefully, and Kiryu doesn't take it that way, but unlike him, he can return to what he wants to protect, no worries. Speaking of parallels, we run into a girl named Haruka protecting a stray pup from some pricks. <laughs> Kiryu, struck by the coincidence, winds up telling his story to the girl. And she in turn tells hers. Just like Kiryu's Haruka, her dad isn't her biological father. The two had an argument and words were said that neither meant. Now she's ran away and is scared they'll be happier without her. Kiryu then opens up further, now once again fully the man he has to hide. In many of these stories, Kiryu's kindness is very much intact, but filtered through his new identity and somewhat waning patience. Here he gets to express his worldview and in turn reassure Haruka. After collecting her scared and regretful father and sending the Fukuoka fart gang running, <laughs> The two reunite and Haruka repeats some of his wisdom back to Kiryu, and this hurts. He realizes how far he has strayed from who he wanted to be. This is where he's trapped. It's a really sad, nice little exchange, and honestly one of the best slices of Kiryu's character in Yakuza 5. A reminder that, no, the story hasn't forgotten who he is, he's just not allowed to be that person anymore. And to close off, one weirdly effective little sub-story, at least for me. Kiryu sending anonymous donations to Morning Glory so they can get Christmas presents. He sends differing amounts, hoping the kids will know who gets what amount. He imagines what they'd spend it on. It's simple in execution, you're really just standing at an ATM and inputting numbers over and over again, and it's sweet. And it's very, very sad. It's sort of easy to forget during this segment that this is a Christmas Yakuza, just like those first two entries, but this one kind of sidelined me and it it's heavy. There are many more, both in Kiryu's part and beyond. This is a selection of those I found noteworthy for doing something new, or referring back to the old, and or giving me something to just talk about. We get a bit more insight into how Kiryu sees his new life, him talking with Yuya and Haruka, and when he's by himself sending off gift money. It lets him be himself, more casually, more privately. It lets him be himself, period, if only for a moment. This game has not forgotten who Kiryu is and what he stands for, and we're about to get really deep into that. At Nagasu Taxi, Kiryu comes clean about who he is and what's going on, and tries to quit the company, saying he doesn't want them to come under fire for being associated with him. Yeah, that thing Kiryu said to Yahata, trying to make the taxi thing cool, well, he was coming here to hang it up right afterwards. <laughs> But Nakajima isn't having it. To him, Kiryu is still a good man, so he still has his job, and he'd better come back safe. And then the sly bugger, spying an advertising opportunity, even lends Kiryu a cab for the task ahead. Nakajima, you're a real boss, you're a real friend, and I'm real sorry for the number of lawsuits. Yeah! At the docks, the lines once again form, back then for peace and now for war. Behind the troops, Aoyama and Watase watch the only man telling his Tojo brother he's missing out by not mucking in. And once again, a chairman pulls up.
Okay, that's one point for the taxi thing. Aoyama steps out to confront Kiryu, and pretty much reveals how out of his element he has always been. Kiryu puts forward a deal, the sickest shit I've ever heard. Cheers for the idea, Morinaga. Aoyama tries to play this off. He thinks the man's insane, that it doesn't work this way anymore. But rank and reality come crashing down. <laughs> なんか。人を馬鹿にするのも大変にせ、ガキが。それじゃ始めよ。この剣が立ち合いにはこの足。何をしてるお前ら。4代目だからといって手加減はいらない。行け。ああ、そうだ。手加減はいらねえ。So, this is the coolest fucking thing. Kiryu facing down an army of Tojo to save Nagasugai, to save the Yamagasa. It's the best. I am fully woken up. The track that plays during this battle, which is also fantastic, is called The Place Where I Used to Be, which is a pretty melancholy name for a song going this hard. This makes Kiryu out to be more force of nature than man. So, while this incredibly hype fight is happening, let's talk about just how much is going on in this part. I've skimmed over Kiryu's character up until now, so while he's laying into these poor sods, let's dig into him. I didn't much care for his character in 4. I felt it was closer to a caricature. He was the sagely, legendary Yakuza dad, the mythic guardian of the Tojo, wise and arguably merciful. These parts of him are all to some extent true, but that doesn't make up how he acts. While Ford did take him in a weird direction, there is one thing that it got right. Kiryu is the top of the food chain. There is nothing left to really challenge him. How do you top Tower Battle 2010? Five is incredible for course correcting Kiryu, and then topping four anyway. He fights an entire army. The Tojo isn't even really a boss fight. You are. You're the boss. And that's what's so fascinating right now. Yakuza 5 makes Kiryu a character again. It decided to do something new with him, and that's more than just being a cabbie in a new city. It wanted new insights into his character. So five is filled with them. In this part, the central conflict isn't Kiryu versus conspiracy, it's Kiryu versus himself. He exists as free people. There's Kazuma Kiryu, the doting owner of Morning Glory, the man he wants to be but cannot return to. There's Taichi Suzuki, the soft-spoken Kyushu cabbie who keeps everyone at arm's length because, well, there's no one really there. That's the man he has to be. Then there's the legend, the fourth chairman, the dragon of Dojima, the protector of the Tojo. This isn't who Kiryu really is. It's the role the world keeps foisting on him without understanding what it's ever really meant to him. People always talk about dreams, but there is just as big an element, a theme that runs through Yakuza 5, and that is identity and the conflicts people have with who they are versus how people perceive them. Kiryu and the player have built this legend over many games, but it's only a side effect of everything Kiryu and you have done. And when is the last time it's done anything good for him? All it serves to do is drag him into more trouble and threaten those he cares about without fail. In this fight, Kiryu says he's just a cabbie, he's just a civilian. But in doing that, he's taking control of the legend. He tells this chubby, adorably naive Yakuza that yeah, 
He's here to help the Tojo, just like the legends say he does, but then he shatters that illusion. Kiryu has always been willing to crush the Tojo when it strays from the path. He has only ever saved the clan for the sake of those he cares about, to grant someone else's wishes or to prevent a greater threat. By the end of each game, Kiryu is fighting for reasons that go beyond just protecting the Tojo itself. In this battle, Kiryu takes on the mantle of 4th Chairman to set the record straight, with Watase as witness. Over the course of this part, we see Kiryu reckon with how the world has come to see him, what it wants from him and what he wants from it. We're even made to confront a side of him we know to be wrong. Stripped of everyone he cares about, who is Kiryu? Well, he's still a good man, one who never lets go of what he sees as right. But his patience has worn thin, his kindness is more reserved. He's weary of the Yakuza world, but at the same time, it's the only arena left in which he thrives. We see his pre-Morning Glory self, who was more irritable and brutish, start coming to the surface. And that's just another layer of why this fight is so fucking cool. There's so much going on under the hood. And I mean, it's cool as shit on the surface of it. An amazing spectacle. The remaster cuts the subtitle here. Besides being fucking raw, yeah, that about sums up what's going on here. The Tojo have prided themselves on this man's strength, on the idea that he will be there for them, without understanding what that strength meant. But right now, he is there. For them. And yeah, that's why I love parts of Yakuza 5. So everyone is blown the fuck out, and that rat fuck Aoyama thinks he can simply not hold up his end of the deal. Aoyama makes a good villainous counterpart. While everyone fails to understand Kiryu, Aoyama fails to understand much of anything. His arrogance and business savvy let him trick himself into thinking he's invincible, too prideful and cocky to realize that he is being outplayed at every step and severely miscalculating his moves. Daigo spotted his trap. He thought he was calling Yahata's bluff. And he brought Watase here thinking that an oath of brotherhood meant he would blindly be at his beck and call. Aoyama doesn't understand the Yakuza, much less Watase. And now this lack of respect has turned on him. He may have prospered in times of peace, but he was not cut out for war. And so, as Kiryu beats him to a pulp, Aoyama turns into a sniveling wreck and brings that misunderstanding to the fore. There's a lot to unpack there. Kiryu is forgiving, but has he ever truly been merciful? He beats people who have it coming, and pretty badly at that. He's never been outright opposed to killing, he's been in plenty of situations where others have killed on his behalf, and he's never gotten on their case about it. There's a lot more to this next game, we'll come back around to it. Watase drags the crying Aoyama up off the floor, yelling at him to shape up, and the blubbering mess spills something interesting. <laughs> Then spills some more. Morinaga appears, and in a moment, I am really confused. The reveal that Morinaga and Aoyama were in cahoots until he spilled just then is great. Really recontextualizes Morinaga as trying to raid the Yamagasa base loaded down with squibs and terrified of just bursting blood everywhere at a moment's notice. Kiryu realizes someone is missing. He questions where Aizawa is, and we're told he's been disposed of. Furious, Kiryu tries to rush him down, and in a panic, Morinaga puts one in his leg. Whatever's going on, Kiryu isn't allowed to die just yet. He's told that if he wants answers, he'll find them in Tokyo, and Morinaga sets off. Two days later, Kiryu's back at work, and Serizawa comes to check in. 
Watase stopped by the morgue to light some incense for his brother before heading back to Kanzai, saying he'll handle things on the Omi's side, but expects Kiryu to go settle things in Tokyo, and he's not planning on going. Kiryu, the taxi thing was cool once, but you can't make this cool cabbie thing work without drifts. Anyway, Serizawa tells him to check the news. Kantoi Yakuza 5 is big. That is one fifth of the game. We have covered so much ground and there is still so much more to go. It's a strong first impression. The politics are intriguing, Kiryu is fascinating, Daigo's finally pulling his weight. There's a bit of a slump in the middle, but it's all building to an explosive payoff. Kiryu, after being too much last game, is wonderfully re-examined here, starting distant and cold but slowly reintroducing himself in a new light. One that still makes sense to his character and advances his relationship with the Tojo. Plus, there is a simple joy to being the big deal in a new town where no one knows you, so they all get their worlds rocked. It's a trope that I never tire of. The wealth of content we're hit with does slow the story down a little, but for the most part, it's cleverly kept to the side. You're never reaching for something to do, but by that same token, it never feels overwhelming. So the game makes a fantastic first impression. Let's see how the next part fares. Saijima's story opens two years earlier, in December 2010. Saijima sends a waitress off to get more grub, and Majima's acting like a sad sack. Could be worse, could be dead. Tonight, the two Oath brothers will once again be split. Saijima is returning to jail in a few hours and is having one last meal with his bristling best mate. Majima's glumness leads to Saijima making a tripe speech. Sorry, a speech about tripe. Hmm. This is going to be Saijima's deal now. He's the speech guy. He can eat forever, but he is stuffed. With wisdom. In 4 he had a lot of speeches, but they tended to either come at a dramatically appropriate time or give us a key insight into his life or his strife. With basically his entire backstory resolved in his introductory game, this aspect of him is less propped up and more played out. Far less of these speeches will work or are delivered to the right people. We're okay for now, he shouldn't have to cheer up his bro on a night like this, but Majima's being a strop. Saijima is returning to jail as a promise to Kiryu. His charge is lessened from murder to assault, giving him only two years inside. And he can't afford to be in there any longer. He's displeased with the new crop of Tojo, who join the Yakuza but aren't ready for any real hardship. Like Tripe, a Yakuza is no good until they've been burned. I hope this isn't a Looney Tunes bit. He wants the younger Yaks to see the old timers radiating strength so they'll have an example to follow, get them all a little crispy. So while he's gone, he hopes Majima will keep the clan going and support Daigo. The Tojo is at a record size, but the leadership, save for Daigo, is apparently weak. They're good businessmen, but they aren't prime time material. I can only guess Daigo put out a listing for an accountant. Now, if
This small section before Saitama goes to prison is amusing in an odd way. Besides the dramatic irony piled higher than the food, it takes place just months after 4, but it feels years removed. Daigo got wrecked on a rooftop, the commissioner's dead, the Oena Sewa dissolved, and the Tojo should still be having money troubles. I mean, they were already at record size and struggling, but the whole paradigm seems to have already shifted, and the issue is the quality of the men, not their paychecks. Maybe Daigo asked that no one mention how embarrassing the last year has been for him. I wonder if Majima's still feeling a little raw over the whole betrayal. よっしゃ。ほな俺も腹いっぱい食うとくか。あ。はよと弁当、燃えかすになって迷うよるが。いくらゴミ言うても貸すになって思うたら意味ないねんで。な。くそ。人がせっかくやる気になったっちゅうの
Plus, it doesn't lend us any new insight. Its other task, wrap up Yakuza 4 and reframe the Tojo again. And I just find it muddies the waters. I have less of an idea of how things are going than when I knew nothing as Kiryu. I sort of wish, beyond just seeing Majima, we could have seen Saijima really settling his affairs, maybe meeting with Daigo, Aoyama, and so on, to give us a little more information and insight into how things are really faring in the recovery from the Ueno Sewa incident. It's a bit of a sloppy beginning, but it gives us a chance to see Kamurocho, and this is the last taste of freedom we're going to have for a while. First off, the positives. Thank god, they shaved him. I don't know why he looks so much younger, maybe he got Yasuko's leftover years, maybe Majima ironed him. Two, Abashiri Prison is a pretty interesting place, though you wouldn't know it from Yakuza 5. Okay, that's the positives. I mentioned in Yakuza 4 that Saijima's portion was a much needed dose of energy and emotion to break up info dumps, and I was surprised by how entertaining and economical the prison break was. It set up everything in good time and didn't get too bogged down. This game won't do that. The two chapters and two hours plus that encompass our prison turn will reintroduce Saijima, as well as introduce and explore in needless detail his cellmates Himura, Oshima, and Baba, his comically evil torturer Kugihara, and Deputy Warden Kosaka. The only ones who matter in here are Tiger and the little boy but everyone gets a turn in the spotlight, and the bad news is, most every other character puts Barber in the corner. They are all more interesting than him. I wish it did focus in on the relationship between these two, since Barber will be a driving force, but instead it flips between the motivations of an entire ensemble rather than using the extended cast to add to the dynamic of the leads. I didn't think I'd miss the simplicity of Saito, but hey ho, here we go. Not that I could be certain that focus would even help. It's not so bad on the first playthrough, but you can still feel this section dragging its feet. Doesn't help that we know Majima is dead and we're behind the actual big mystery and waiting to be brought back into the loop. By the time it hits, it can leave you thinking, oh yeah, he died. This is made worse by moments that are entirely superfluous. I like Himura, a detective caught up in a corruption charge. He's lighthearted and easygoing, and yeah, for how boring this section can be, he is a fun character. What I did not like was having two incredibly slow and meaningless image training sessions to explore one of his past cases. This adds nothing to the plot, and exists just to let us know that Saijima can sing and shag now. And there's a love song in Himura's head. If you've neglected karaoke throughout Kiryu's part, which, by the way, how foolish, this may wind up being your introduction to Bakamitai. It's not my favourite track, but I have an idea of why this song has become something of an unofficial anthem for the series. In this game alone, three of the playable characters have a rendition, with Kiryu's being the most fitting story-wise and Akiyama's my favourite. You're hearing Spike Spiegel, or the dub voice of Eddie Murphy if you prefer, banging out a belter. Simply put, it's a song of forlorn regret, looking back at the past and seeing with painful hindsight all of the mistakes made, but the biggest one of all was running away. It's applicable enough to each Yakuza character in some fashion that it can stick around as long as it has. It's quite sappy, but effectively emotional if you buy into it. And then... <laughs> A picture deflates all of that build-up, but it continues uncommented on. The picture may have been a joke, but to the character, those feelings were very much real. That is the Yakuza experience, the essence of Yakuza, if you will. A wonderful juggling of emotions that seem contradictory on the surface, but are often really not. It is honest in its emotional beats and stands by them, but isn't afraid to make light of its characters or have fun along the way. The song works as a straightforwardly sad piece, a sappy screed that's far too overblown to take seriously, and as a lead up to a punchline. It can be all free depending on who you are and what mood you're in listening to it. The stories build up casts of emotionally burdened but still decidedly heroic criminals, washouts, and dreamers. But the side content plays with them, putting their self-serious traits under a comedic light while still respecting the character and not undermining who they fundamentally are for cheap jokes. 
If anything, it adds to the dramatic moments. There's no light without shadow, and well, life has to be worth living if it's worth it to be sad during the sad parts. There are people who enjoy the franchise for all kinds of reasons. Some like the crime dramas, some straightforwardly, some ironically. There are those who love the comedic side stories in isolation, or as an accompaniment that bolsters the leads elsewhere, and for many more reasons besides these. I consider Yakuza to be one of the most mature game series going, owing in large part to this. Maturity often seems touted as misery with vague hope. There's nothing ultimately wrong with that, I like a sad story from time to time, but I would hesitate to call that mature. Maturity is understanding that the world can indeed be tough, but being capable of letting your guard down when the time is right. To have fun and try and help out even when the going is tough. To understand that the ability to enjoy yourself, to make light and be merry, doesn't mean you can't treat the serious aspects of life with their due respect. With every Yakuza character, I buy why they keep fighting on because they don't seem, at their core, absolutely miserable. They can go away and have fun and try to help other people and still see the bright aspects of life. As that crazy sucker Lewis said, When I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I was found to be doing so. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. I failed myself by taking this long to mention Ryosuke Hori. He directed Like a Dragon, but had been working his way up the ladder of the series since 2. His effect on Yakuza can't be understated. You'll notice he wrote the lyrics to most of the karaoke tracks and has been instrumental in increasing the scope of side content. Substories, and in this game, side stories were his department, along with many of the minigames. The man is, in my opinion, a master of juggling tones in a way that makes each of them more meaningful, appealing to both joy and melancholy by letting them run side by side. Bakumi Tai encapsulates this in miniature. It's a song for everyone in and out of the game. It's still not my favorite, but I get at least some of the reasons why it became the meme song, which is nothing to do with whatever, whatever I said, actually. It got in everyone's head, though. Not just Himura's. Hostesses have seen some changes. They're a lot cheaper now. 200,000 yen should see you max out affection through a combination of charm, alcohol, and fruit platters. I mean, assuming you can stomach watching this terrifying cutscene, which we have actually seen before, but I totally forgot about it. That whole minigame is just gone from my head. This time around, hostesses are fully voice acted, and they've removed that weird bit where you have to stare at the right part of them. Each character also has just one hostess to date. Since each town has just one girl, they go a lot deeper into local cultures, customs, and accents. That voice acting? It's doing more than just upping the presentation, it's educational. It's a good way to frame a lot of the tourism and learn a little bit more about different parts of the country. Also, they play into karaoke. Somehow I never mentioned that. Oh yeah, we're in prison. I'm going to compress these two hours down a lot since very little of it actually matters. So, Kugihara and his lads torture Saijima, who doesn't fight back because he wants out of here sharpish. Kosaka is wise to this and asks why he doesn't defend himself. The man hates Yakuza and is likely going to stave off Saijima's parole regardless of good behavior. Baba, a Yakuza 10 years into a murder charge and years old, comes to Saijima for advice because his own parole is coming up and he's scared about having to go to middle school. His cellmates tell him to confront the outside world and Saijima gives him a speech, so he endeavors to gain parole and escape another one. On the day of his hearing, he's framed by Kugihara's crew. So the detective, the captain, and Oshima, who turns out to be the legendary thief businessman Heihachiro, work together to prove his innocence. Hijinks ensue, like Saijima mauling Kugihara, giving him exactly what he wants, his job being to keep Saijima locked up for as long as possible. Kosaka, surprisingly, asks why Saijima fought back, then reveals a letter of expulsion. Saijima's out of the tojo, and he seems oddly at peace with the whole thing. Kosaka now wants to help the man get out, seeing as he won't be returning to the clan, but Saijima wishes to serve his entire term. Upon returning to his cell, we finally catch up with Kiryu's story. Things are going to matter for a moment. Saijima's reaction is odd. He's sad, obviously, but seems at peace with it. If Majima's dead, it was his own fault for growing weak. Saijima's outlook on death has changed a lot. He treats life as something that has to be fought for at all times, and in the process, you have to live free. In choosing to remain in jail close to people he cares about, he is staying true to that ideal. So to be murdered, especially in the Yakuza life, is a personal failing. He has no hatred for Majima's killer. Nor does he want to track them down, except out of curiosity. 
This doesn't sit right with me, but I'll save Y for when we have more to go on, even if I feel like we have the whole of the last game to go on. Suffice to say, they wanted to give us something new with Saijima. But unlike Kiryu, it feels like a really sharp turn that is somehow nothing all that new. A 360-degree sharp turn. Stop imagining Saijima, Himura. Saijima and Barbara are summoned by Kosaka. Saijima's parole application was denied not by the regional board, but by the Ministry of Justice. That, along with an influx of incoming inmates, and the revelations about Kukihara's role along with ties to Saijima's former family, it all points to a traitor within the Tojo. There's a conspiracy afoot. It turns out Majima was in nearby Tsukimino for talks with the Kitakata family, Barbara's former family, and Chocolate Bar. But at the meet, he was gunned down, presumably by Chairman Daizo Kitakata. The warden was murdered at Sapporo Airport, and the deputy warden here is certain the new inmates are coming to kill Saijima. He's letting these two spring tonight on the promise we uncover the truth of what's happening. It's a little absurd, but Kosaka says his duty is to ensure the safety of people under his care, and this is the only move he has left if he's to stay true to himself. The prison break lasts all of a couple very large brawls against inmates. <laughs> Kukihara gets his comeuppance. <laughs> then Saijima and Sun set off on a snowmobile. Each part varies greatly in how much I enjoy it, how much meat I feel is there, how well paced it is and how much I like the cast. And part 2 opens with a 2 hour prison segment which does little to serve the larger narrative and drags its feet at every turn, it's really something. Yakuza 5 occasionally tries to flex its scale. Part 2 is when it pops a beer gut. It also doesn't help that I just can't bring myself to care about Barber, while Saijima immediately treats him like a brother. I get what he's about. Barber is a way for Saijima to exposit his view on the world to someone who is going through the same trial that he did all those years ago. I also don't dislike Barber, I just find him dull. It's going somewhere with him, and I'll dislike him then, but at least he'll be funny. And at least disliking someone means you kind of have to care. I'm saying this and it probably sounds like this part is over. It isn't. We're only halfway there. If anything can stand for Yakuza 5's sheer power, it's the fact there is a snowmobile game with unique gameplay, music, which I've replaced like a prick, and admittedly simple assets just thrown in here. I mean, hell, the whole thing is simple. Kind of like the boat chase in 4, but still crazy. Even crazier because we've already seen so much more variety and by now the game is just showing off. This mode of play happens just once more and you have to seek it out. It's easy, but it's fun. And at the end, Barber starts taking on that funny side, I promised. <laughs> ah, you can't bear to see it. Oh, fuck. Now, this fight is a bit dodgy, but I can't exactly block a bear. Still, the hitboxes are wonky and the hits are repetitive. Animal fights are, again, a bit more style than substance. And our boy Tiger taking on a bear is great for that much. <laughs> Fucking calm down, Takamura. Saijima awakens in the hut of Hunter Okudera. The old man tells him to rest, but he won't lie down while Barbara is still out there. Okudera stops him, saying he'll find his friend. If a bear gets a taste of human flesh, it would be bad for everybody. He gives Saijima a change of clothes and tells him to sit tight, but before long he needs to stretch his legs. Wandering through the hunting village, he finds the man in charge, Nishina. Upon learning Okudera went out to hunt the big bear Yamaro Roshi, he runs off to warn the others. And this makes Saijima want to get out there and find Barber even more. What follows our two hours in prison is an interminably dull hour-long hunting tutorial. Over several trips, we're taught to hunt, shoot, and trap. 
Before we even find Barber, we indebt ourselves to the village, and Saejima gets very interested in Okadera's seemingly personal grudge against a giant bear. Now, I actually like the hunting, but I hate its introduction for feeling just as locked down, if not more so, than the prison. The game hopes it can entice you to spend another several hours hunting, killing, and learning a story most thrilling. I got Barber, fed him some rabbit stew, then made him sit and wait as I worked out an old man's murderous mountain mystery. From starting Saejima's portion to hitting the hub, 10 hours may have passed. That crash, man, it really brought everything to a stop. Again. Much of the hunting story centers around our mysterious old savior. He teaches Saejima that one should only ever hunt for food or survival, to respect your quarry since it gives its life to sustain yours. Anything else is merely slaughter. Yet Okadera admits, all he wants to do is kill that bear. He knows that's hypocritical, but he has long since moved past the point of caring, and his single-mindedness in this goal has seemingly alienated him from the village. The story's central question pivots along that line. What is survival versus meaningless killing? Along the way, we rescue the cocky young hunter Narumi, and gain trust from Nishina's wife Kimiyo and fellow hunter Sakurai, who aid Saejima's quest in spite of Nishina. We learn he has his reasons. The village used to be quite well off, until new hunting laws that were meant to restrict hunting to traditional communities like theirs led to a wave of outsiders coming in for one last hunt. The mountain scared them off, but the orders for furs kept coming in. Tempted by the influx of wealth, the villagers nearly ruined the local ecosystem. Then seemingly out of nowhere, the bear appeared. Yamaro Roshi, to them, represents the mountain fighting back. Outsiders are another mouth to feed when food is always running low, and to Nishina, a reminder of where the troubles began. It's an interesting tale of a fraught community, tight-knit save for one loose thread, albeit one they're oddly protective of. During one of Okadera's numerous injuries, Sakurai admits a respect for the old man, but recoils when Saejima suggests an ambulance. The locals are high-strung, stressed out, but they're trying to do right. They want Yamura Roshi gone, but they also feel like they deserve him, and that guilt has no good answer. The story says that you should respect nature, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because nature will ultimately always win out. This messaging doesn't much affect the gameplay, where you're encouraged to blast animals by the dozen and can with relative ease. There's even a trader placed in the village who is cashing in on the carcasses. We didn't truly break out of jail, but we have broken the bank. You can rig the whole mountain up with traps and never worry about coming back, just littering the bushes with bunny bodies. Say hello to Tiger Saejima. The legendary hitman. The killer of 18. Thousand. Gameplay-wise, it's a simplistic hunting game. You sneak up on very oblivious fauna, bring your shaky, slow-firing two-shot rifle to bear, and blow them away. The simulation aspects are as follows. It takes time for Saejima to steady the sights, and there is a lot of heft in aiming. Motions on the stick are exaggerated with a speed up and a slow down. Aiming feels heavy and Saejima amateurish, and the shots have a slight travel time. These do a good job, along with the simplistic stealth system, sound effects, and animations, I love that reload, of making each landed shot feel like you put in the effort to bag your prey. Even though it's easy to get a grip on, and repetitive, it asks skill and thoughtfulness of the player without overburdening them. It got boring on the tail end of the trail, but again, for the optional time it asks, it's not so steep. Only bears can wind up posing a danger, having a sort of bull rush boss approach that is still very easy to stop dead but due to the aiming shakiness, manages to remain intimidating. I always doubted if I'd land the shot, even if I rarely missed. Oh dear. After you've alerted the animals, you wander to the next zone, separated by a corridor, and hope the game has spawned something good over yonder. And much like Kiryu, you may wind up doing a few laps of the place. There's a natural time limit in the form of your health. The game wants to pretend to be one of scarcity. It says I can only bring so much, but then doesn't stop me from teleporting non-essentials to the item box, and as for me, well, it's good right now. Fresh. There's also the abundance of Jizo statues and rebuildable lodges that top up Saejima's freakish health bar. You can be up here more or less indefinitely, and warp valuables to the item box from the middle of nowhere. I said nature always wins out, but Saejima is a force of nature. It's a draw. A draw on the purse strings. <laughs> The story does a good job making the mountain seem imposing. Many of Saejima's early expeditions wind up requiring rescue as he doesn't understand the number of ways nature can turn on him. He is repeatedly humbled and finds himself feeling more and more indebted to the people who trouble themselves to help him. 
Narumi's own quest to bring down Yamura Roshi sees him losing the use of his shooting arm and he gets off lucky in that regard, but in play, Tiger is more or less the apex predator. The gameplay is fine for what it is and the story is good. Better than the story. I mean, his. But they don't actually work together to provide the message. Still, it was a pretty enjoyable and relaxing experience. I put on a podcast and lined my fur-lined pockets for a few hours. The only scratch I got, I could spend in town. Eventually, after enough dead animals, a few hardships, and some tracking rounds courtesy of Narumi, we zero in on the giant bear. Okudera runs off on his own and gets injured for the fifth time, and while he's recovering, we're told the truth. This man is not Okudera, but an escaped convict named Sato, rescued from the mountain by the real Okudera ten years earlier. The two started hunting together until Okudera went mysteriously missing and Sato took his name. This new Okudera then saved the village during a bear attack nine years ago. The reason the villagers kept him at arm's length is because they don't want to turn in the person who saved them, who during the fur rush, continued to hunt humbly and honestly, not for money, but to survive. He's not to blame for Yamura Roshi, but he saved the village without asking, and while they sit stewing in guilt, he continues to pursue the bear relentlessly. So Saijima, about to go and attempt to take down the bear for good, confesses that he too is an escaped convict, and Nishina says that the village can't help him any further, it's the only way to protect both of them. To which Saijima agrees. We go to confront the bear, and while the rifle fails to make a dent, Saijima's guns do the job just fine. Going against his word, Nishina has chased us up here to warn that the police have been called and we should flee, but Okudera, recovered from his 15th set of injuries, arrives to say he's turning himself in, and we learn the valuable lesson that criminals are more honourable than hunters. Saejima. I was killed by Okudera for the sake of Okudera. It was a strange life. When Okudera was in the forest, when he was in the forest, 殺そうと企てたんだ。俺がオクデラの背中に銃を向けた時、奴は言ったよ。撃てなかった。この男を殺すくらいなら、だが、その瞬間だった。黒く巨大なものがオクデラに覆いかぶさったんだ。そして死に
Yakuza 5 is big. Saijima is bigger. Speaking of eating, what if, for some absurd reason, you wanted to get smaller? <laughs> the new app StimRx aids digestion by killing you on the inside. This makes filling out completion a bite easier at the cost of inventory space. Also makes triggering those low health heat moves simpler. Though I was told you could actually eat bait since free for a similar effect. I don't know, seems pretty rich in protein to me. But I imagine the kids hate seeing Uncle Kaz do that. Once Tatsuya's gotten the lay of the land, he'll take all that he's learned and use it to... Give a new dish to a big restaurant. Well, fuck me, I kind of feel bad about that, you sneaky bugger. And speaking of sneaky, or at least this is under the radar outside of Japan, this is a real guy. He's no longer as big. Apparently he left the showbiz life. But for the time, Tatsuya Kawoge was a celebrity chef, and this is a big-ass cameo. The Yakuza series is no stranger to celebrity. Many of the games have used big actors to give it an adult draw. The hostesses have for the most part been modelled on and voiced by adult actresses. Only in this game are they entirely fictitious and portrayed by voice actresses. Kiryu even met the real-world owner of Sushi Zanmai, Kiyoshi Kimura, the tuna king of Japan. And he's portrayed as just the nicest guy. Even makes a dish inspired by Kiryu for Kiryu. Celebrity is different the world over, and I can only really view celebrity cameos from my own perspective, which is to say a pretty standard western one. Which is to say, if I was playing the getaway free and had to chaperone Jamie Oliver to the finest fish and chip joint while my character nodded approvingly at Oliver Sammer's wisdom, I would be desperately trying to hit his virtual approximation with a double decker. I have nothing against the guy, but come on, if I was in a video game, I'd do that to me. My console would be powered by my eyes rolling. How people in Japan took this? Well, I'd guess that like much of the world, some cared, some recoiled, most got on with their lives. Not a very exciting conclusion for a video to draw, but people tend to be pretty varied. I'm taking it as a bonus that I didn't recognise anyone besides actors. And this isn't the last time this thing is going to happen. Anyway, sorry, back to Saijima. And I know we only just got here, but we need to head back to the mountains. Believe it or not, he's still only half-baked. He can get more burned. Up there, we meet Tendo, an old hermit who says that if we want wisdom and power from the gods, we need to make offerings. He gives cryptic hints about the items we need to hunt. Ah, hunting. Really, this is more noteworthy for being one of the few times throughout the series we can combine items. The phone may have made Saijima's revelation lazy, but the woodwork still works. So with each offering... I somehow forgot that this game features Saijima going up against a family of deities. It's more or less the same gag several times in a row mine. I like their battle music, but the fights themselves are really boring. It's a repetitive affair of just chasing down Tendo and waiting for him to let you get a few hits in. But these are worth it, because the powers Saijima gets are worthy gifts from one god to another. Key here is Herculean Spirit, the craziest passive in the series. So long as Saijima has heat, he will never, ever flinch. Ever. Perpetual, never-ending super armor. At all times, you never, ever need to weigh up your strikes or time your counterattacks ever again, since you will never need to stop attacking. This feels like a cheat code. What about your health bar, you might ask? Which one, I reply. Saijima is a monstrosity. I was just wrong. Saijima's the mountain. Saijima is a landslide. Saijima has ascended beyond godhood. Yakuza 5 is tiny before him. So let us descend the mountain one last time and bring justice to mere mortals. <laughs> Okay, let's calm it down. So how is Tsukumino? Well, it's a mixed bag. My least favourite town to navigate. A series of cramped streets where if you want to avoid the many, many random battles, you're either walking everywhere or having to backtrack a long way to cut around. That must be why the gods gave Saijima the ability to skip battles. Still, it's filled with interruptions and there are precious few interesting ways to get where you need to go. But atmospherically, man, Kiryu's section may make you forget that this is a December Yakuza, 
Tsukamino will remind you wonderfully. Jesus Christ, calm down, Saijima. In evening light, this hub is gorgeous. Saijima gets roped into playing Saint Nick to hunt down a group of young Santa-hunting punks and winds up bringing joy to every child in the process. We have to help a mapper lay out the wonderful snow festival and, uh... Haraka, something's weird about this one. Ah! Tsukamino is filled with Christmas cheer and is just very whimsical in general, and for that, I love wandering the hub, even if I hate wandering the hub. Like last time, there are a few cops, but I think the cold got to them. They're not moving. There's no real stealth segments, and the circuitous runs about town are at least led by actual gameplay. I'm okay with the cops. They're just there for context. <laughs> Excuse me, officer. We get substories to more or less substantiate the backstories of our two more interesting cellmates. An exploration of the police's ruined reputation following Hamura's corruption charges, and another cop who wasted their career trying to capture businessman Heihachiro. And the very day he had him dead to rights, the man turned himself in. Fucking ouch. The last thing Oshima stole was this guy's win. wishes their two stories in some way led into the Kitakata, especially Himura being a detective and all. These substories are fine. If you like these characters, this lends weight to their lives before jail. It's just that the time spent with them feels like a ton of setup I had to sit through to understand these very tangential tales that don't come back around to anything, beyond a couple rather stock takes on the whole hidden identity theme. Both hide who they are, just like many other characters. Saijima also gets a retelling of the little matchstick girl, with him aiding a little kid trying to save up money to get a present for their busy mother. Saijima's very sweet in these substories. His wisdom feels a little reined in and more down to earth, applicable. While he was nice if gruff in the last game, he has softened greatly. It's funny how he does less to maintain a distance from people than Kiryu given the circumstances. Luckily, no one recognizes him. While every Yakuza character has a kind streak, what I liked about Saijima in 4 was his relative bluntness. Compared to Kiryu, he tended to tackle problems even more directly. His words were less careful, he had an impatience about him. Now, dude's just unstoppably nice. On top of being just plain old unstoppable. In most cases. Also, we beat the shit out of another bear. While this has nothing to do with substories, I want to mention my favourite NPCs in this town are these two, who just dance non-stop while casually chatting about how there's a prisoner on the loose. Saijima, while hiding from the cops, winds up bumbling into a snowball fight, and decides to kill some time and put those hunting skills to the test against the deadliest prey. And this mode kinda sucks. It's a very simplistic FPS BF. The controls are cumbersome and heavy, but they do lend themselves to a unique rhythm of play. This isn't a game of accuracy, but of dodging and timing, waiting for opponents to make throws that you can evade and punish. As the rounds go by and it becomes a three-on-one, it also tasks the player with carefully blocking sightlines and defying a numerical disadvantage. It can be thrilling to dodge attacks and return fire, to shepherd NPCs into unfavorable positions and then capitalize on it, but it's more just gaining a point lead and then running out the clock. My godhood doesn't help me here, but it doesn't need to. The unique collectible also makes for a nifty change, treasure maps that form riddles. The rewards are once again far weaker than locker keys for far greater effort, but it does add to the festive vibe, even if I'm not sure which Christmas event gives out brick shit of beers for participation. So we've got just one story chapter in Tsukamino, and it is very lopsided. I find myself wanting to like it. It's doing a lot of things I love the Yakuza stories for, but the beats, the messages, and their delivery are lacking. Let's begin. The first port of call is getting into the backroom casino of Ambitious. True to its name, you have to really want it to get in there. The bartender feigns ignorance, and for Paul or pay, a patron will part with pertinent particulars. After a police raid, they started asking for a membership card. First step is finding a homeless guy. He knows what's up. 
The hunt for the past is a small series of things that aren't quite puzzles because every step tells you the solution, but it serves as an excuse to actually explore the space. Seeing as how little time is actually spent in Tsukamino, any player ignoring side content would otherwise just wind up spending no time here at all. When I first played the game many, many years ago, this was probably where I spent the longest, even though story-wise, this story has the least screen time and stuff to do. I think it's down to the fact that after the prison and the village, you'd think things would pick up here, but the immediate objectives are busy work that don't feel very exciting to do, and that makes it hard to care. It took ages to just get over that boredom and press on. That bad first impression kept me in this town for a while. Upon getting into the casino, Saijima overhears three of the Kitakata crew talking about their boss's role in the upcoming snow festival, how he's a powerful figure who drummed up sponsors to keep the annual festival going. He hates stuffed shirt events but he'll be there. Saijima walks over and asks if he can talk to their boss about his dead bro. The three goons rightfully think he's a Tojo hitman. I mean, hey, he's dumb enough. And so Saijima has to maul them. Ah, the hunter has become the hunted. By the way, love the music video for that song. Back at Polaris, the two talk about how they'll get to Kitakata. Saijima shoots down exactly two ideas before deciding, all we can do is kidnap him from the festival. Barber to his credit points out how stupid a plan it is, but Saijima insists it's the only option left, Damn it! So he's in. Barber says the only way this could be harder is if they assaulted their office, which, uh... Yeah, if time's precious, why not go that route? I know why Barber wouldn't suggest it. Saijima, on the other hand, surprised he didn't think of it himself, right away and maybe even ask Barber to use his apparent connections to them to get through the door. In any other series, Barber's incredulity would not get any comment from me, but he's making a fine point in the wrong franchise. It seems just as likely they'd get sent back to Abishiri after a broad daylight kidnapping at a public venue. The Kitakata are a well-loved four-finger family. The current patriarch is a third-generation leader. They've got deep roots in the community and have chased off other gangs before. Even the mayor gets on with the chairman. All said, these guys have it together better than the Tojo. It's unlikely for a number of reasons that Majima was killed senselessly. The next morning, the two split up and stake out the site. Saijima looks at the stage area for five seconds, says, Yep, this'll be hard, and heads back. <laughs> Time seems longer when you're young, Barber. They talk for a bit, and Saijima apologizes for dragging Barber into something so dangerous, but Barber says Saijima is only receiving what he's owed for saving his life twice over, then remembers something and has to step out for a while. Saijima heads to bed, not knowing when Barber got back. But hey, he's there in the morning. And it's the day of the kidnapping, which by the way, these two goons still don't even have a plan for yet. <laughs> Let's talk about a plan on the way over. Let's split up and go separately. Good idea. Fucking kids and their short attention spans. Outside, Saijima spies a cop and diverts into an alley, where the Kitakata lie in ambush. Stupid of you to assume I'm clever. I really enjoy this extended battle. Again, it's making sure the town space is actually put to any amount of use. I hope I don't harm anyone Barber actually knows, since, well, they might not recover, and we get a moral choice partway through. I've put both on, but really, there's only one correct option. Ho ho ho, the only stocking you're getting this Christmas is a catheter. I'll give Yakuza 5 this. It does give you a lot more gameplay as part of the narrative. More fights, extended battle sequences, chases, attempts to massage the other modes of play into the narrative to make the experience more varied. Yakuza 4, when ran through as a purely story experience, which it's not meant to be, can be a little anemic. 5 is not. It's not always for the best, but it is an improvement. Saijima regroups with Barber, ditching the outfit, sadly, and they make their way to a manhole. Barber has an idea, and as an air show turns heads, the two manage to nab the old geezer and bring him down into the sewers. Daizo, however, was expecting this. He knew Saijima was coming and what he'd want. The Patriarch takes the two to a hideout of his, away from the prying eyes of Cop and Kitakata alike. Baba takes off to scout the area. <laughs> I 
Let's not talk about that. Or the fact Daiso hasn't even acknowledged Barber. Anyway, Kit Kat and Shit Brain of Society chat. He's surprised by how easygoing Saijima is, but realizes he should have expected as much from Majima's oath brother, who, by the way, he did not kill. Saijima has a hard time believing this, thinking they clashed after a bad offer, but Kitakata reveals this wasn't the case. They weren't being coerced under the Tojo umbrella, but were being offered an equal alliance. Kitakata was raring to go ahead with this. However, at their next meeting, Majima dejectedly told him not to take the deal, that something shady was going on and to ally with the Tojo would be playing into some puppet master's hands. <laughs> Second verse, same as the first. We give chase and get one final tour of town. This time the southern block. Really getting some miles per hour out of this place. The next part deserves some examination of its own, but yeah, this chapter doesn't do it for me. I think cramming the entire Kitakata story into what little time was left over made the story of Tsukumino have no time to breathe. But even then, the sheer ropiness of Saijima and Barber's plotting is hilarious in how slack it is. The lack of presentation and how little effort it seems like Saijima is putting into his scheme is so odd. There's also just not four chapters of stuff here, in this entire part. It's stretched, padded, and slow. Then when it gets to town, it rips off its fat suit and sprints for the finale. With very few changes, it would come off as an intentional comedy caper, which could probably be remedied if they just removed lines that seem to comment on its own awkward construction. Saijima just acts like a jackass from start to finish. I usually defend characters acting less than optimally, but that's when there's thematic or emotional reasons, or just because it's in their character to see things a certain way. But that's not what this is, it's just farcical. Anyway, the sniper is... Baba? Baba? He climbs to his feet and rips off his jacket, revealing his... Jumper. In this scene, we get the truth about Shigeki Baba. He was never in the Kitakata, but was instead a Yakuza plant whose job was to control the length of Saijima's prison sentence, ensuring he left at the right time for his boss's plot. All along, Kukihara's goons were actually under Baba's thumb, Saijima's torture and Barber's own frame job were carried out at his command. The murder of Majima was a signal to incite Saijima into wanting to break out. Saijima acted exactly as predicted, to an extent that Barber finds upsetting. Hey, 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 that'll stunt your growth. Barber's actions are particularly cruel for this series. We've had some bastards, but Barber is complicit in torture, murder, and wasting my time. He kept the lie going as Saijima fought for him, but Saijima's deeds did indeed touch his heart. We learn that under that sad, scared kid is a cocky, manipulative Yakuza fixer, and under that is an even more sad, scared kid. Barber's character is a sandwich of sad, a sandwich and it doesn't work for me. It feels like an evil side that barely tries to poke through that's way too overwritten by Barber being genuinely far too pathetic for me to believe he'd ever be put forward for this role. There's a line between the facade, who he was pretending to be, and who he really is that is just way too ill-defined. And it's because everything about him is so boring. There's little progression to Barber's treachery, just some really shitty hints that he's not what he seems. Maybe this means he is a good spy, but he's also a very tedious and fuzzy character. There are some reveals later on that I think you're meant to draw a line back to Barba from and realize how much Saijima has done for him, as well as parallels with the game's villain and other such things. But those come about with five minutes of runtime left, and Barba's role in the story is over and done with. Replaying the story with that knowledge also does little to take Barba out of the crib. He is hands down one of my least favorite characters in the whole series. But this does give Saijima a chance to prove how steadfast he is to his ideals. When Saijima asks who Barber's boss baby really is, Barber says he'd have to kill Saijima if he knew and die himself if he told. Knowing what the plan is, this is a total bollocking of it to begin with. But hey, this is an in-character fuck-up. Barber can't bring himself to shoot, which leads to Saijima yelling at him not to hesitate, breaking Barber's resolve. He can't handle Saijima's relentless support. He asks why Saijima rescued him back on the mountain.
This is one element of Saijima that I do legitimately like. How his personal philosophy has broken away from the Yakuza and become his own. Its foundation lie in wanting to be a teacher, then inspired by Sasai, strengthened by Yasuko's sacrifice, and solidified by Majima, he has realized who he is as an individual, not as a soldier. His good nature has nothing to do with his role, but as the person he really is. And it shouldn't be funny, but Baba crying as Saijima practically begs to be plugged to make a point is. Then, Baba finally upsets Saijima. <laughs> Upset that he would choose to die, Saijima decides to, I shit you not, beat the fear of death into his soul. We've overstepped into parody. The man who if that wasn't a bluff, and I doubt it was, was about to throw his life away for Baba's, gets mad at Baba trying to throw away his life for him, so resolves to teach him how heavy death is by beating him halfway there. The thing is, I don't disbelieve Saijima would see it that way, but I still can't wrap my head around a good chunk of what's going on emotionally right now. The morals of this whole thing just sit awkwardly with me. Saijima is a merciful guy, but how far would Baba have to go to earn his scorn at this point? His weirdly serene response to not hating Majima's killer because it wasn't a personal slight to him, which by the way, what? Is now revealed to be pretty damn personal. Majima died as a pawn, not on his own terms, not serving the Tojo, not even messing up, but to get Saijima into the open. Kiryu is occasionally memed as being too forgiving, but I do believe the series explores the high and lows of his virtues well. And besides, you know, it's a fan joke. Obviously, I don't want Saijima to just follow that same path. After all, different character, different avenues to explore. But Saijima was interesting because he was gruffer, blunter, and behind the times. He had a personal mission which lent a great deal of weight to his values. Here he's been smoothed into mean Kiryu. He has surpassed the Kiryu. He is now big Kiryu. These are stories of high emotion, not wholly rational or coldly logical people, but Saijima is denying emotion that he's honestly in the right to feel. His rationale around Barber, not to mention Barber himself, is fucking bonkers. I've said that I love this series for its earnest melodramatics, and this is trying, but I have to at least buy them. This feels ropey, unconvincing, and it all has to work out to get to this very strange moral lesson. What was that word? You may repeat it. Anyway. <laughs> oh. I'm pretty sure after this I wouldn't fear death. I'd fear life. Fucking love that heat finish. Just shut right down. So, brain broken and spirit bent, back into shape, the two share a smoke. Sure, why not? And I guess he doesn't care about that killer, or knowing Goro's last gasps. I mean, hey, he thinks Majima might be alive. I'm glad to confirm there are sequels. I've played them. Barbara asks to be let go, saying they'll reunite when he's fulfilled his dream. And so the two leads of part two part. That's when Saijima is cornered by Serizawa, flanked by... goons. Saijima is brought up to speed, told about most of what went down in Fukuoka. Serizawa's been a busy bee. He's been tracking Saijima, Barber, and is on the hunt for Morinaga. All signs point to him being a traitor within the Tojo clan, and that they are most likely the one to have killed Majima. Also, most importantly, Kitakata's fine. Saijima has a choice. Serizawa can drive him back to jail, or he can help the Osaka PD and save the Tojo from whoever's killing it on the inside. The part ends with Serizawa smirking, knowing the tiger will bite. So that's the weakest part of Yakuza 5. It slowly plods to town and then blitzes through beats once you're actually out and doing things. It has four chapters worth of stuff, but that stuff ain't story. I'm not sure that it was really worth bringing Saijima back in such a big role. Yakuza 4 resolved all of his outstanding conflicts pretty conclusively. Now that may sound arbitrary, and to an extent it is. I mean, after all, I'm glad that Akiyama is back, and spoilers, 
the game has even less to say with him. But I think the game better understands what it's doing with the guy, even if it's not much. Each game resolves Kiryu's outstanding issues, before the next introduces new ones while expanding the depth of his character, and so far, there's only really been one misstep, which this game pretty much righted. Part 1 asks the question, who is Kazuma Kiryu? Part 2 makes me question, who the hell is Taiga Saijima? The answer turns out simple, he is the same as last time. But he has less at stake and nothing new to do, and when I say nothing new, I mean, this is the same story as last time, but told worse. Saijima breaking out of jail due to a conspiracy on the outside, his kindness reforming a fellow Yakuza, stranded and then rescued by a kindly stranger who gives him a moral lesson about the road ahead, a mission to track down a patriarchal figure who struggles to remember one of his boys, and along the way he gives advice to a fledgling punk. Hang on a second. Kido? Barber? Is that on purpose? Yakuza 4 had a similar thing going on with remixing past plot beats, but it did it for stylistic effect, using similar events to demonstrate how different the characters and circumstances really are. Yakuza 5 kinda does this with slightly different intentions, but this is basically a version of the story which manages to eschew every benefit the same plot had last time. If Yakuza 4 had played like 5, Kiryu would say, Well, Suzuki, which by the way, nice name. If Hamazaki is still out to sea, then I shall teach you to fish, for I'm hunting Umi Kairyu the demon whale. What I enjoyed last game was in how it set aside the exposition-heavy mystery to focus on delivering more emotional melodrama at a quicker pace. This retelling loses that quality by bogging it down. Even when the story is yelly melodrama, there's usually a solid foundation underneath that, characters acting in a way that is true to themselves, and I don't feel that here. It feels overlong and forced. I put a lot of that down to who Saijima wastes his breath on. I get some people don't like the ham man, but this is pearls before swine. So, fun at points but takes too long to get anywhere, Saijima is hilariously busted to play, and Tsukimino is a gorgeous hub. I do think that overall it's an okay time after far too much muddling, and the story is a series of weak moments that each take too long. Being helmed by a character who I don't find very interesting this time because removed of grit but acting the same way, he stops feeling meaningful and becomes absurd. And I can't even say he sets the stage for who's up next. This part opens in summer 2011, telling the story of why Kiryu left Morning Glory. Mireille Park, owner of the Diner Chair Talent Agency, has been researching Haruka since a chance run-in a week earlier. She sees a lot of potential in the girl and wants to take her on as an idol. Kiryu's past would be disastrous to Haruka's chances, so Park asks him to leave the orphanage, to which his answer is obvious. Kiryu's walking away, but then Park does in minutes what an international conspiracy couldn't do in years. One of Kiryu's greatest flaws is in how easy it can be to play on his sense of right and wrong. He's self-sacrificing to a fault and can't abide the thought of harming those he cares about. Park, owing to our own trauma, plays on this, saying that while his kids do love him in the orphanage, he will wind up dragging down their ambitions. Not only is his reputation a weight around their necks, but he's made life so good for them they'd sacrifice pursuing anything greater. Park asks Kiryu to let his kids be free to grow. We've seen that the easiest way to beat Kiryu is to make him think he's the bad guy. Park realized he would give his life for his kids. And so he does. In this scene, we hit a turning point in the story. It's the part where they decide not that the audience should know that the theme is dreams, but that they shouldn't be allowed to forget. Now that it's a key focus, I'm going to discuss it where appropriate, but simply put, I was wrong. This theme is strong and there is a lot to think about. In a Famitsu interview, Yakuza 5's writer Masayoshi Yokoyama said, Dreams aren't necessarily always positive. There are various ways of perceiving them. I'd like you to pay close attention to the relation between that keyword and the protagonists. It's a request to think about the underlying ambitions and motivations of each character, the abstract wants that sometimes can't be put into words. And in that process, maybe wonder for yourself what you want out of life and what the right way to pursue that dream is. So let's go over how I believe dreams are represented. I can't say whether this will wind up more revealing of me or Yakuza 5, but I'll try, and doubtless your own read will land somewhere else. Looking back, 
forwards at Kiryu's chapter with this scene and theme in mind adds another layer to it. Kiryu is a man who is devoted to his kids. He wanted them happy and healthy and to have a real shot at life. We'll learn Kiryu may have had this opportunity, but he couldn't give up on the Yakuza, at first lured in by ideas of wealth and respect, and then in time an honor-bound obligation to the clan. By the time he wanted out of the life, it was way too late. He was in way too deep to ever truly leave. His identity is forever interwoven with the Tojo. He doesn't want his kids to walk that same path. He has shielded them at every step and was just presented with an option that protects them at the cost of himself. They've been endangered before. Trouble seeks him out routinely. So he takes Park's offer, thinking it's the best move for everyone. A scene I jumped in Kiryu's portion to talk about here reveals that Haruka, besides overhearing the deal, really understood what Kiryu was doing. Kiryu pretends he's sick of the orphanage and Haruka tells him to drop the act. I really love this scene. It's one of the few times we see Kiryu interacting with someone who gets him. And it's Haruka refusing Kiryu's awful attempt to spare their feelings. He thinks if he's cruel, Haruka won't have to feel any guilt over leaving. But as Kiryu should know by now, you can't heal somebody else by hurting yourself. This is the melancholy note they leave on. Kiryu says they would have to part someday. It may as well be when everyone he cares about stands to benefit. When you sacrifice yourself for a dream, be it your own or for the sake of another's, it's inevitably stained by that. It can never be appreciated without also recalling what was lost. Dreams will take sacrifice, be it hard work, lost hours, failures, or missed opportunities along the way. But the sacrifice shouldn't be yourself or others. They can be fulfilled in a way that's unfulfilling. In a way that makes you wish you could take it back because what you wanted wasn't what you thought. Because the emotional burden weighs heavier than whatever was won. When Kiryu reflects on why he left, he sees the choice he made now as a personal failure, that he ran away from the orphanage. He would rather be back there with them. But Kiryu won't go back. The kids surely miss him, but he would never risk jeopardizing the very person he left for. Now, I am just off on my own, but that is my interpretation of what Kiryu has to do with this theme. It's a slowly dawning, horrible realization made in retrospect that, oh, this man was living the dream, Sure as shit didn't look that way. Saijima's is a lot louder and simpler, but there is substance to it. Like Yasuko said, he wanted to be a teacher. After being taken in by Sasai, he could no longer have that dream, but he could still be a mentor, always willing to help those in need and embolden those around him. When Saijima is expelled from the Tojo, he's able to recover so quickly since in actuality, his dream never depended on them. It's about being there for the people he cares about, and right now, more than anyone else, that's his cellmates. Saijima's dream is consistent but amorphous, always shifting as life deals him a new hand, kind of like the constant location changes in his part. It's a source of strength that he can always draw on. He lives to show people that they have to live true to themselves, without regrets, and if possible, balls out. Though Barber's still waiting on those to drop. So that's two very different ways to look at how dreams can shape people's lives, and Haruka still has a lot of life left to live. You sound a little unsure there. Is that my dream? Oh, this is not going to go well. This is a very strong opening to Haruka's part. It recontextualizes Kiryu's struggles and makes for a great introduction to Marei Park, and she is a very complex character. There's also the great secondary theme of Yakuza 5 which we've gone over, identity, who we wish to be, how we define ourselves, and how the world decides who we are. After Kiryu, Yakuza 5 often covers this pretty in-your-face struggle under the cloudy layer of Yume. But time and again, we see characters reckoning with their own selves while being lost in the fog of other people. Kiryu tackled it, Saijima overcomes it, and Barbara is trapped within it. Haruka, as we'll learn, isn't doing much better. Yakuza 5 isn't just big. As we're about to learn, it's also pretty brave. And part of that is because it's about to get me to care about Park after this introduction casts her in such a shady light. And she has time in the shadows yet. So we return to 2012. And to Sotenbori. It's been a while. Back to where Haruka didn't want to be an idol all those years ago. Granted, she was about eight years old and smarter. The town has been expanded, and it has my favorite alleyway in the series so far. I adore back streets like this. They're really cozy. Besides that, sort of the same old thing, though it is nice to see it from the ground level. Here's another reason Yakuza 5 is brave. 
It's about to spend several hours being a rhythm game. Herika's having some trouble learning her routine until we take over and... Honestly, there's not much to say about it. It's as simple an experience as you can get. Press buttons in a very forgiving amount of time, hit free lenient quotas, and don't watch all the dancing you're doing. Through items and masters you gain access to idle heat, where for a time your inputs earn more points. And this is useful because you earn more points. So, it's not only brave for asking that we now play another genre, but for being a very rudimentary version of one. You can't always expect people proficient in one genre to be great in another, and it would be risky to gate real progress behind a swerve like this. Setlist is also pretty small, three songs in all, but we'll get to those. Haruka's dance instructor Ogita talks of assistant Horie and Park. He was given a year to prep Haruka for stardom. That timescale has been halved. She's in the Princess League and has her big debut right after. Ogita says he'd need more time if she's going to make the grade. Park responds that making the grade isn't good enough for someone special like Haruka and, uh, yeah, way to bolster Ogita's point, Chief. You know who wins arguments? Money wins arguments. Park then goes to have a word with Haruka. The first round of the Princess League finals are tomorrow. If Haruka wins, she'll get a large marketing push. Her career will skyrocket and she'll live a whirlwind life of fame. And in preparation for Haruka's victory, Park has arranged a concert in Tokyo a week from now. If Haruka loses, and to be nice to Park, she doesn't believe Haruka will, Park's going to cut funding to the orphanage so it will shut her, and Haruka will have nowhere to return to. Now, I'd expect Haruka to be horrified by how willingly Park would leverage that against her. It's a twist of the knife that she seems to be in such a powerless, manipulative situation. But no worries, as Haruka cheerfully says that don't worry, she won't give up. And well, Park isn't quite telling the truth, but uh, we're not to know that. That's for much later. And still incredibly fucked up a thing to hold over someone. Yeah, I'm pumped thinking about the people I grew up with out on the streets. Full of piss and vinegar here, Chief. Let's get something big out of the way early. I fucking hate how Yakuza 5 tackles the idol industry. The way it's presented in 5 is like seeing someone who's broken by the system, who still exists in the system, and who hates the system, but still has to defend the system, try to explain the system. They'll talk about the glitz and glamour and how great the people are, and then... And then... They'll look into the middle distance. Their eyes will glaze over. The facade breaks and they say, Oh, and you know, the inability to lead a normal life, the, the stolen childhoods, the treating people like cattle, the, the crushing workload, the obsessive fans, the tribal rivalries between companies that turn us into cutthroat con men no better than the Yakuza, and the Yakuza, and the exploitative sex pest producers who are pressuring people's kids into the bedroom. And then they catch themselves, and their programming makes them say, and boy, am I glad to be here. And that's how it goes, an apologetic spit shine on a seedy underbelly. It's hell on earth, but we're happy to make the happies happy. That bit with Haruka and Park just now is a microcosm of the whole approach. There is one aspect where I will admit it actually makes its point before backing down. Not everyone makes it. Hard work, perseverance, and wanting it more mean nothing if the people who hold your career in their hands just don't see you as having some arbitrary it. And how crushing that can be, shut down for such vague and irreparable reasons, or how a single slip-up or just having your own life can destroy all of your work, along with the fear and loneliness that knowledge instills in idols. This dream lost at an early age for confounding reasons leads to lifelong embittered people, who often wind up falling back into the idol industry and other roles, guiding someone into taking their place, to live out their dreams vicariously, and to tell them it's their dream too. It's a cruel cycle that exploits one person's misery and another's naivety. Then Haruka, when confronted by anything, including this, will usually say, well dang, you should dance more, with infuriating straight-faced earnestness that is treated with various amounts of credulity depending on the moment. It never feels like a punchline, but the game getting 90% of the way to a condemnation before backing out. Now, I get that they would still want the gameplay to feel rewarding, and it's a harder sell when the message is, great performance Haruka, you pulled more girls into the meat grinder. 
but it's not like the series hasn't always grappled with something similarly sinister. It's called Yakuza, in the West anyway, and while it doesn't present how grim organized crime can truly be, it still shows them as dangerous organizations that ruin lives. That's why the heroes so often oppose or seek to reform them. They do something bad and Kiryu beats them up. That's good. Meanwhile, this story presents the ills of the idol industry, but treats them as part of the deal. That you can't have the good without the bad, so why rock the boat? You could argue Haruka's naivete here is intentional, but besides going against her formerly wiser than she lets on character, which pokes through in the oddest of ways, sometimes, it's also muddy because this naivete is also commented on as a positive quality. Now, I get it, she's a teenager, she's out of her depth, and maybe can't recognize the scummier things going on around her, but it'd be nice if the story could. Plus, and this is telling, it's easier to buy into with the Yakuza. For better or worse, there is still a romanticism to organized crime that makes the fantasy Yakuza of the games an easier sell than the idol industry, which in Yakuza 5 floats closer to real-world analog than glamorous fantasy, but it hasn't settled on either. Yakuza's themes are usually abstract ideals, parental bonds, honor, identity, dreams. These are themes where you can get away with thoughtful explorations without definitive answers. Ideas for the players to stew on as they beat people into paste. I doubt anyone yelled, What the fuck? I expected the truth about dads! When confronting more material topics, this approach is a lot dicier. And Yakuza has actually been definitive in these cases before and since. It doesn't say, Ah, orphans, you can take them or leave them. Now, it is known that media in general is a cutthroat business that lures people in with hopes of fame and fortune. It's a complicated topic and I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad for liking what they like, and yes, that includes idols. If an idol has brought you happiness, then they have done a noble thing. It's just that every idol has emerged from a den of wolves that they've had a part in feeding. I'm not exempt, games, movies, and music are industries with veteran soul crushers, but the idol industry is that cruelty put on fast forward and aimed at abusing the naivety of kids. So I say fuck them. But Yakuza 5 wants to softball it. Shit or get off the pot game. None of this halfway rubbish that makes me question whether it likes the industry or not, and if it does, very sorry. You gotta go balls out or else you get burned. So, that's me asking one media industry to take a stance on another. I'm clearly dreaming. And the worst part is, this trend starts with Park, who I found to be one of the few relatively contemplative characters in all of this. With all of this said, I don't even think Haruka's part is bad. Weaker than Kiryu's, better than Saijima's. The telling is dry, but there are other ideas which are handled better, if never fully. The problem lies in a bad foundation that makes everything built on top of it a lot less certain. Park does start turning this conversation around in the second half. Rather than just telling Haruka to prepare for the storm, she gives her some advice for how to actually weather it. Letting Haruka know that fans will express their love in many ways and she'll have to learn how to accept that with grace. What's more important is that it's not real love. Many idols who've grown up in normal, loving environments can't tell the difference until it's too late. The revelation leaves them distrustful and paranoid. <laughs> Park says she knows that this will not happen to Haruka. It's clear Park is harsh to Haruka out of a trust that she can take it. If Haruka would flinch from her words, then Park wouldn't dare put her in front of a much harsher world. Hence, the orphanage threat. Haruka pieces together that Park must have also had a troubled childhood. She reveals that she grew up in an abusive home, and seeing idols on the TV drew her to the love they received. I have some qualms with Haruka's character, as you may already be able to guess, but the way she's able to cut through Park's defenses and let the two of them help each other is an element I really like. She has an honesty and perceptiveness that occasionally shines through. Haruka's best quality is in her ability to see the best in others and talk to that part of them, drawing it out in the process, which occasionally surprises more jaded industry vets. Park assigns Horie as Haruka's manager. While compared to his peers, he's rather green, he's kind to Haruka and makes sure she's doing okay in areas outside of work, handling her accounts and doing other small things to make sure she's not overwhelmed. He got into the business because he's an idol fan, so he's also good at raising Haruka's spirits and letting her know what her work means to others. One problem that he can't fix is that she hasn't made any friends her own age. That is until the next morning when she runs into Akari, another girl who recently moved to Osaka. Akari dreams of being a dance instructor. Huh, I'll bear that in mind for earlier. She introduces Haruka into how she herself learned to dance through street battles.
While still easy, it's a much more complex system than the concert dances. Having to jump to different portions of the screen to hit the button presses give these dancers a more free-flowing, reactive vibe. The aim is to dance well enough to push the crowd in your favor and make the other dancer bomb. Haruka also has heat moves. Moves exist either to buff yourself or interfere with your opponent's abilities, since, well, the dancers can use heat moves back. The battle is decided by tiring your opponent out, or else by score if the song plays out. <laughs> Holy shit, Haruka, calm down. Sadly, Haruka can't drink to raise her heat, but what can you do? This mode was always going to be less feature complete. This mode is rather fun. There's a real push and pull to battles, a reactivity and freedom not found in the stuffier concert performances. The streets have a soul that the industry lacks. The amount of story mandated gameplay throughout these chapters goes back down and is rather strange. Two dance battles, a handful of concert dances between practices and stage shows, and a quiz. I said it was brave, and it is, but the story can't figure out much to do with the gameplay, and I imagine it worries people will feel held captive by the genre shift. That said, this part contains the longest chapters on average, and it can be felt at times. A lot of conversations just go on and on, and while there is a lot that is of interest, there's also a lot of strange filler which may be better served by gameplay. And outside of the story, there is a lot of it. At the office, we're introduced to the schedule board. From here, we can access Princess League events to progress the story, along with a great many optional stop-offs that make up Haruka's side story, The Road to Fame. So the first round is this afternoon. But this morning, let's make several TV appearances, do a few interviews, and really just fill every open slot in town. All part of a balanced breakfast. The Road to Fame doesn't really have much of a story of its own. It instead provides background for the main plot, a way to demonstrate how much work Haruka has had to put in. Like Taxiing, it's a series of little tales and vignettes, with a good bit of gameplay variety, featuring some activities unique to Haruka. Most on brand are a series of public concerts and dances for the Merchants Association. As mentioned, the idle playlist is just three tracks long, and uh, you're going to be playing them a lot if you want to actually complete this. The tracks are also very easy, even on the optional hard charts, which can only be played in practice. So it's not like it will take many attempts to master them, and there's little feeling of you and Haruka actually needing to improve much. This is why Haruka has her Kruger colors on, since it's a small nightmare. At this point, I do feel bad for judging Yakuza 5 for not having enough of something. Maybe the game is leaning on the monotony and labor of this, having to repeat these songs until they're utterly ingrained in you, to the point that Haruka is a dancing robot, even if the story straightforwardly treats her dancing as otherwise, saying that it's imperfect yet full of expressed emotion. The show Sotenbori Love Check Quiz is patently weird, a show that first and foremost challenges a celeb's knowledge of the town they're in, before getting bored of itself and becoming a general knowledge deal. It's the least interesting game both mechanically and thematically. Japanese light entertainment is a strange thing. Haruka is spared all of the slapstick and a lot of the cruelty. Refuse to Lose is where Haruka gets a tiny slice of that cruelty. It's a TV show pitting idols against each other in fierce competition. I've no idea if it's a stab at how vapid this sort of celebrity competition is since, well, it all comes off as incredibly sincere and from what I've heard and watched of mainstream daytime Japanese television, which isn't much, but still. This is about as brainless as it comes, so it's impossible for me as an outsider to tell if this is parody or direct representation. They introduce the show as fiery high-stakes battles where each idol must give it their all. The host wonders what unladylike things they'll do to win, which is a line that always makes me cringe a little on the inside because it's playing up so little. And then they play darts while not exchanging a word. I wish the sport still allowed players to slam back double vodkas between throws, but I doubt Haruka would come out of it looking good, but it would live up to the show's promise. We also get to experience the table tennis replacement hours ahead of schedule. Now, all of this said, Refuse to Lose is a very good way to put old gameplay in a new frame. Rather than the other side stories which introduce entirely new systems, The Road to Fame shows off Yakuza's breadth of content in a way which expresses that this is the whirlwind life of a young celebrity. The idols Haruka faces off against tell a story through their qualities. They're overworked, stressed, jealous, and occasionally hostile. Haruka isn't always able to win them over with her kindness. Some see it as a highly irritating act. It's sad that this television show, framed like a fierce battle where they can't let their guard down, also gives them the excuse to just play a game for a little bit. Some take it as that opportunity. Others absolutely cannot switch off. There is not a moment of peace left for them. Speaking of peace, we also have river fishing. There's really nowhere else to talk about it. 
it's the first half of sea fishing. Select your bait to match where the fish are, and time the press to reel in your catch. That's it, really. Not very catchy, but it can be relaxing. The strangest is Running Girl, a TV show where idols sprint through the streets of Sotenbori. The player has to tap the shoulder buttons in increasing tempo to get Haruka through the course within a time limit, with a slip in rhythm causing a stumble. It ends with the exact same joke every time, which is the director going to whack his wangle to the footage. The new localization makes it marginally less obvious what he's doing, but this man has blasted rope five times back to back. I'd be running too. A lot is made of Haruka's genuine nature. It comes up time and again throughout her part. A lot of Haruka's draw as an idol is said to be that in a sea of fakes, she feels real. There's a lot more to this, but for now, let's talk about how interesting this makes Haruka's interviews and talk show appearances. You're briefed before each interview on what you should and should not say. The interviewers themselves are confrontational. They want juicy slip-ups, so they load their questions and make underhanded comments in an effort to trip Haruka up. To that end, failing to pick an answer fast enough is seen as dodging the question, a failure for that inkraker to extrapolate the worst from. The right answers are as close to honest as Haruka can be without giving them what they want. It's not enough to be truthful, words have to be very carefully chosen to deny misunderstandings and any muddiness the journo can roll around in. When done perfectly, Haruka actually gets them to admit their intent and become a fan of hers in the process. The game treats this as a cruel necessity of the celebrity world. It's not that the people writing rags are encouraged to be parasitic opportunists who willfully misrepresent people to move copy. It's the fault of the interviewee for failing to be savvy and play the game. Celebrities undergo media training for a reason. Talking with the press is treated like a martial art. Haruka is a 16-year-old kid. Her career is only months old, but off to a roaring start. All the better for these people thinking she's easy prey. Then, the game forgives them for the attempted sabotage that is their job. I don't mind this gameplay, dull as text boxing can be. I get a challenge needs to be overcome. It's just... Fuck celebrity journalists. They shouldn't be getting this much slack. The game should be calling them pricks. The talk show Love to See You Smile presents a side to Haruka that feels a smidgen more fake, but I'm not going to blame her for it. It's an incredibly gaudy talk show taking place in a strange Technicolor hellscape where the guest is rated on how interesting they are. So, from the off, you're not expected to be honest, you're expected to be trying to impress. To succeed, Haruka has to act a little stupid, a little aggressive, and very enthusiastic. It's not really about her, it's about keeping the bit going. It also has quick time events. I don't believe Haruka is dishonest, but Park made the point that people don't love her, they love the image of her. And that image is a falsehood which does have to be carefully maintained. Nothing brings that home like the last minigame I want to talk about, Handshake Events. A game about appeasing a stream of creepy, obsessive fans one by one, deflecting their comments with mostly nonsensical platitudes because what's key here is keeping them both figuratively and literally at arm's length, and we have the remover on hand in case they try to close that distance. The awe with which they respond to Haruka could be seen as an aspirational thing, being able to inspire such strong emotions in others, but I find this insanely depressing to watch. I realize how judgmental that sounds, but I can't help but feel that being judgmental is what the game has in mind here. This is another part of the strange disconnect that Yakuza 5 brings attention to, but doesn't seem to have an answer for. Though, maybe that disconnect is being passed to us as a question. It says that no matter how bad the behind the scenes is, doing it for the fans is a virtuous thing. Haruka and others reflect on how noble it is to allow others to dream, and it's a source of strength for her. So now the game lets us meet these oh-so-wet dreamers and their leering perverts who take a big whiff of their palm after getting their handshake. Now, it isn't all of them, but by god is it a lot. And the worse they are, the more valuable they are to this game's scoring system. This one does feel like a joke at Haruka's expense, and what good is left? Well, the good that's left is that Haruka will give a big smile for a job well done, and the game will continue on saying that this is all a little bit messed up, but it's pretty certain it's worth it. It must believe it is, because it makes you do this simplistic, boring minigame over and over again, and perhaps it's meant to feel like work, perhaps it just lasts longer than it should, but still not long enough that I could work out how Yakuza 5 truly feels about any of this, why it seems so earnest in showing us what it must believe to be downsides, only to sweep them all under the rug with Haruka only too happy to work the broom. Is it professionalism or obliviousness? One handshake event is mandatory. It's here we meet Uda, 
Yes, I've marked him as a character. He scrapes by, being our contact in the Merchants Association for many of these events. He only really exists as a character in relation to Yoko, his ex. She's a famous stylist who takes Haruka for a naive country bumpkin that the industry may well chew up and spit out, which isn't really an unfair assessment. For every job done, Haruka's fame increases. These make the Princess League rounds and concert performances easier to win by boosting the strength of successful inputs. This side story is distinct in that regard. It's the only one that has any amount of main story significance outside of paralleling motifs and themes. Taking these gigs raises Haruka's profile, giving her more fans to back her in the league, making the gameplay there easier in a straightforward but believable and rewarding fashion. It's also the only one that's staggered by main story events. You can't do all of it right away, which does work out to its benefit due to the repetition of certain jobs. We also see Haruka meet people in the industry and show off more sides of her idol persona, which is... Um, uh, that wonky foundation does make any guesses about the overall intent hard to gauge. Obviously, these activities are made to be enjoyable, and for the most part, Haruka is pleased to be there. She sees each job as an opportunity for which she is grateful. The other idols are presented more bitterly, and it's hard to say if that's because it's presenting the industry as stifling, or them as ungrateful. And its presentation of the fans that we're asked to be pleased to entertain makes me question whether I'd want to please them, and I can't even tell if that's the point. It makes the life look at times exciting and from a certain angle rewarding, but also very tiring and highly repetitive and monotonous, and I can't decide if that's to reflect on its nature as work, to stretch the content further, or again, some combination of the two. At the end of the day, some activities are duller than others, and it feels like the weakest among them gets the most screen time. The life of an idol is shown as one where they have to be multifaceted and always alert, never for a second letting their guard or facade slip. So, schedule cleared. Let's get to the Princess League. Haruka and Horie head to Soten TV, and on the way to the dressing room they spy producer Manda, talking to our competitors, the much more established duo T-Set, made up of Mai and Azusa. They used to work for Dynachair, but apparently a distaste for how Park ran things made them switch to our competitor, Osaka Talent. This is a little unfair. I don't want to crush two people's dreams. <laughs> Never mind, I'll be their worst goddamn nightmare. Horie goes to confront the two but finds himself out of his depth. Nakai, T-Set's manager, further puts the screws to Dynachair. Osaka talent is far larger an entity. To respond to the bullying is falling into T-Set's trap. So Haruka steps in. Huh? To Tisa, Haruka looks a little loopy, but Nakai immediately gets what Park saw in her. Not just Ernest, she's sharper than she lets on. It's wasted on the girls. And Horie thinks what Haruka just pulled was an attempt to get under their skin. Haruka goes to get changed and... Yoko? Oh no. Actually, no need to worry, she's here to give us an edge. T-Set have an advantage when it comes to selling their beauty and Yoko wants to help close the gap. She gives Haruka a quick change outfit. Simply put, this will let us enable a permanent idle heat in the midpoint of a song, giving a large advantage. Yoko apologizes because she's helping Haruka for her own little agenda, but the girl is fine with it. Yoko is one of the duller masters. It takes two lessons to recharge the costume for the next concert battle, and doing all the lessons just lets you do this whenever. There are no new moves in all of this. Her lessons are a series of fetch quests in between beauty advice, sass, and occasional dance battles, as Haruka slowly wins Yoko's respect. Luckily, masters tend to only be 40 minutes long apiece, because it's all leading up to a rather weak punchline. Yoko worked with Haruka to see that costume up on stage. The idol she put it together for never made it, and Yoko has felt like she failed them ever since. And on the eve of Yoko leaving, we learn that idol was Uda. Uh, this payoff is his only moment of character in the game, and it's as a punchline to confuse Haruka. Well, they seem happy, having made up and all. And if there's anything stylists like, it's when they make up. Fantastic. There's a court board at the office jealous it's no longer the tackiest part of diner chair. Haruka is summoned and the show begins, and you can feel the work here. 
A TV show style production complete with believable host, gaudy set, and even credits. It's genuinely impressive when I consider that 10 hours ago I was hunting in the mountains and tens of hours before that driving a taxi. Yakuza 5 has moments where I have to look back and realize over and over again just how big and winding this adventure is. Gazing back is amazing. And I'm also looking back at my doorway and hoping no one walks in so I have to explain that no, this is a serious crime drama. Dolce Kamiya explains the rules of the tournament. The idols will all perform simultaneously on opposing stages and whoever has more fans on their side of the arena come the end of a song wins the round. Now, this sounds utterly cacophonous and like a recipe for people to get trampled, but sadly everyone makes it out okay. It's a silly setup to be sure, but it works for the gaminess of it. There will be three rounds, each of a different type of music. Pop, dance, and my favourite genre, final. Only the last round counts, but the first two can be used to gain an advantage. During these concert battles, you don't have objectives to hit. It's more a tug of war between the two sides, with idle heat and higher parameters giving Haruka more pull. Now, despite what Park said, <laughs> you can not only lose rounds, you can fail every stage of the tournament and continue on unimpeded. It's a wild change of pace for the series, and I'm not sure what's braver, diverting for a long time to tell this kind of story, or the fact they made it mechanically impossible to fail. It's sensible that it's easy. People are not buying a rhythm game and so the difficulty is kept low, at least in regards to mandatory content. But it also doesn't mind if you don't even try. While the story of Haruka and Park is part of the larger mystery, it doesn't really tie into the narrative until it becomes a brawler again. Remember, we're in Sotenbori. We're on the Omi's doorstep and that should be a lingering source of tension. Yet until a certain someone shows up, this feels just as isolated as any mountain village and look where we are and what we're doing. Even if you blitz through this content to get back to one of the other leads, this would be to some a 2-3 to three hour write-off. And that's really fascinating to me. I like this section despite how it may sound. It must truly drag for those who don't. So let's talk about the song, written by Ryosuke Hori of course. The first round has so much more, which is a bit of a guilty pleasure. I honestly feel bad for T-Set in all of this. The three songs that will play in this tournament all represent where Haruka is at and how she is feeling at any point in the story. It's no wonder people take her for genuine. So Much More is on its surface a peppy song about getting up and chasing dreams regardless of hardship. How this is only the start of a journey. The three tracks follow an arc from dreams being distant to being within reach. And there are a few lines that take on a bit of extra meaning in hindsight. This song states that regret should be ignored if you're pursuing something greater. As we get closer and closer to the end of the actual story, Haruka's regrets start boiling to the surface. This song makes it seem like right now Haruka is oblivious to or suppressing these feelings. There's also the titular line of the song. Straightforwardly a message that she'll continue to grow, as an idol, as a person, but takes on a much more sinister undertone when you remember that Haruka's past has been bought out and scrubbed from public view. Haruka has to pretend a lot of it didn't happen, and well, she's not going to be able to hold that in forever. She is so much more than anyone is allowed to see. I should briefly mention music. Unlike 4, I don't have a section's worth of stuff to say all in one place, and that isn't because the soundtrack is lesser, it's because it's so much more. Yakuza 5 doesn't have a singularly identifiable musical styling the same way 4 did. Its soundtrack is great in quality and scale. Yakuza 5 can't have a defining genre because it wants to capture where Japan was at culturally in 2012. One genre of music would not do for something like that. The variety of the soundtrack does a lot to make it all feel so vibrant and alive. There are a lot of individual tracks I wound up loving though, so here are some of them. Anyway, as I explained, I didn't need to win. But I do anyway, because T-Set made me sufficiently spiteful. Plus, looking at the spectacle of this, even through all the grime, I can see why someone would be drawn to reaching this moment. It pays you back for the work you put in on the road to fame. You put the time in and won your fans, now you have your name up in lights, all eyes on you, and you're bringing joy to this many people, from a distance, in a big clump, where they can't sniff you. This goes some way to paying the price of fame. The day is still not over. These chapters just do not end. Back at the office, we learn Horie has been helping Haruka with her bank book, and she's being sent money by a mysterious stranger. That's sweet. After a lesson with vocal coach Yamura, we go to collect Ogita, 
only to find him blowing up at Park after she questioned his teaching. She fires him, then reveals she amended his contract so that if he didn't complete his work, she wouldn't need to pay him. Smooth move, Sensei. <laughs> So, we need a new dance instructor. Park has fired basically everybody local to Sotenbori. But not to worry, the legendary Christina is in town. Not drawn by fame or power, he only teaches those he's drawn to. So, Horie and Haruka, with round two of the Princess League on... two days from now, are sent out into the night to find him. Outside, we get one of the strangest moments of player choice in the series. Horie asks if we know what Christina looks like, and yeah, sure, I've played the game. Why even give me the choice? It's like the line between me and Haruka just blurred. I stole her mind for a second and made her look like a jackass. <laughs> Sorry, Haruka. Anyway, regardless of what we choose, we're told that he's tanned, flashy, and drinks a lot. We hit some bars looking for the leathery, lurid lush, and we bump into Akari, who moments earlier had been rejected by Christina as a pupil. Oh, so you're allowed to know what he looks like, huh? Akari gets an idea. She takes Haruka to him, and then challenges her to a dance battle. A big show for a second shot. Naturally, he winds up fixated on Haruka. Akari, heartbroken, swears off dancing forever. Haruka tries to give chase, go and console her, but Christina says to let her go, let her work out her own feelings. So, for the price of Haruka being interesting and potentially a friendship, Christina is brought on to diner chair with a week of time to get Haruka ready for her Tokyo debut. He wins Park's respect by being flatly honest that, with the time he has, he can only get Haruka pointed in the right direction. The thing about Park is that she is demanding and sly, but isn't totally unreasonable, despite what Ogita's contract shows. She just prefers people to be straight with her about the work they'll do, which, uh, which he was. Anyway, quitting time. And I'd say that was a good day's work, aside from that whole Akari business. Haruka's appeal and to some extent her fame have burned her. The move Akari made was selfish, but I can't begrudge her for it. Haruka's substories pivot around the ups and downs of fame. Unlike the main story which errs on an actual topic, this makes for an interesting exploration. Fame is more abstract than the companies which thrive on it, and it permeates Haruka's life for good and ill. Haruka naturally takes most everything in stride. Being swarmed on the street for autographs? She's happy to make others smile. A struggling takayaki stand needs to drum up business. Haruka calls up Dynachair and within minutes they've got a crowd. A fledgling idol needs pointers from a pro to help her own precarious career. Haruka offers to see her through a pivotal point in her own road to fame. These substories show Haruka wielding her fame the same way other protagonists use their fists. Haruka can help plenty of people just through her presence. All it takes is time and care. And as a Yakuza protagonist, she's naturally rich in both, despite what the story may say about the former. There's an optimistic idea that celebrity status in the right hands can bring people joy and be used for good ends, to help the local community. Perhaps that's why the real-world celebrity cameos are framed as they are. That doesn't let them quite break through my guard, but it does demonstrate a consistent message that benevolent fame is something to aspire to. We also get our own sub-story with the orphanage kids. They've snuck questions for Haruka into an interview with an Okinawan tourist mag. It's nice to see that they're doing well and that life has continued on unabated. But there is a bit of sweetness that Haruka has to deny any connection to these people who are her family. Let's talk about an adjacent topic to fame, one with even less soul. Advertising. With one of the most surreal bits of product placement I've seen in a game. Haruka gets a call from Yamaura, reminding her of an audition. Watami and Wataminchi, owned by the same parent company, are holding a joint poster girl audition with the presidents of both companies presiding. When we arrive, they are bickering like children, but Haruka is able to win them both over by memorizing some basic facts and doing a dance. They argue over who should get her, and Haruka chimes in. Why can't she do both? And ultimately, she does. Watami is a real company, and for a time Haruka really was their poster girl. We just played a fictionalized account of her getting the gig, and so the line of reality blurs again. I was really glad not knowing Watami existed when I was playing because finding out left a bad taste in my mouth, which isn't great for a diner, and then I dug deeper. While I failed to find the actual ad campaign, my research took me somewhere at first hilarious and then incredibly depressing. 
Watami is marked as a black company. They were notoriously awful to work for, winning Worst Company Award in 2012 and 2013. But hey, Haruka will gladly work with them. I mean, after all, she sees the best in everyone. But I doubt there's any good to see in Miki Watanabe, the president of Watami. In 2008, he published an inspirational book and forced all of his employees to buy it. As in, the cost of the book was automatically deducted from their pay. Pay stubs, which by the way, came with such lovely personalized messages from Michan like, You should reflect on your sales this month by killing yourself. No doubt a lover of motivation. The employee training manual had the slogan, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, work to the death. Now, I was skim reading, but that caught my eye. It's so evil that I was just smiling ear to ear. It's so cartoonishly evil, so out there, that I can't look at that without being ready to laugh at it. Then I looked up, right above that, and uh, saw that one of his employees actually died due to overwork. And uh, that stopped being funny. Uh, while I'm on this, bear his motivational slogan in mind as I tell you that Watanabe also runs a nursing home. Which is once again so evil with his track record that I can't help but have to fail to suppress smiling at that, because it's absurd to an extreme. Without knowing any of this, this substory is sort of boring and corporate. With context, this might be the most vile substory in the series. It's nice to know where the bottom is. Yakuza has always had product placement. It's a series that gets away with it by being imitative of the real world. This is the one and only time it feels downright egregious, and it's for a company ran by an absolute scumbag. Anyway, I told a friend about all this, and within minutes, she found Haruka's mugshot. It's gonna be a bit tricky to pivot back to the game after talking about a subject that heavy, so let's begin with something equally tragic. Manzai is a style of Japanese double act. An idiot tells a tale where they're unwittingly stupid while the straight man interjects and slaps them. Haruka finds one half of a broken duo who begs her for help with an audition moments away. This minigame is hard. You have to read your partner's line, your responses, guess which the game considers funniest, and then time it to the pace of your comedy partner. And his pace is... Osakan. When I first played this game on PS3, it may as well have been impossible because that timing UI did not exist. You had to know the optimal point in the sentence, which meant you had to know the rhythms of Japanese speech and comedy. I didn't know any Japanese in 2015, it was all noise to me. Even now with a rudimentary understanding of the language, I could not possibly play this game without a bar telling me when to talk back. Even with it, the game is tricky and scoring is incredibly tight. This crowd is tougher than the final boss and much, much scarier. I didn't enjoy this minigame, but it's an interesting idea. Haruka's games have done a ton of dialogue-based experimentation, and I appreciate exploring that even if I'm not a big fan of it. But the result here is frustrating. Mechanizing stand-up comedy, however formulaic this form of it is, sits awkwardly with me. Let's talk downsides of fame. Haruka has to deal with paparazzi and stalkers. She can't really relax outside. While she does have people looking out for her, she is now marked as a target. This is especially difficult for her. Part of the reason she uses her fame so humbly is because fame isn't the object of what she's doing. It's a byproduct. So she doesn't put herself on a pedestal and wants to be seen as an ordinary high school girl who just so happens to have a job. One which leaves her little time to make friends. And this is made more difficult when people don't want you as a pal, but as a prize. Some of Haruka's classmates are intimidated by her, while others want to be near her just for the proximity to fame. Haruka is a bit socially awkward to begin with, but makes up for it with her friendliness. This substory where she just can't connect to these two well-meaning but sort of shallow classmates leaves Haruka uncertain if she can ever really fit in. That's until she runs into Yui, a friend who has no interest in fame and no ulterior motives. Haruka can just be normal around her. And that's the key lesson. It isn't about celebrity, you just can't be your own normal around everyone regardless of your specific circumstances. Some people have it easier, but just having one person you can be yourself to can be enough. Haruka does get to spend time with Akari and Yui, but it's always mentioned as being scant. Haruka's obligations make hanging out a tricky thing. The morning after the run-in with Christina, Haruka gets a text. A friend of Akari who runs a dance battle troupe wants a face-off. Haruka wins the battle to Akari's surprise, and the two manage to make amends, Akari is dancing again, all water under the bridge. But now every dancer worth their salt wants to take on Haruka. This is her version of the victory road, as boss dancers, all friends of Akari, fall before Haruka's sheer talent. 
and the reward for each battle are those vignettes of Haruka getting to relax with Yui and Akari. So for a moment, everything seems rosy. But it's from our opponents we learn that Akari has not taken up dance again and is just avoiding the uncomfortable topic with Haruka. At the same time Haruka learns this, she learns about the Dance Battle Summit, an event that will have a world-famous choreographer in attendance. Akari isn't going. She's worked harder than most for very little success, and it's gotten to the point where trying is painful. Akari admits she approached Haruka selfishly. She hoped Haruka would give her a leg up, but her scheme backfired, and she says the two shouldn't be friends. Akari gave up Dancer's penance, but that doesn't sit right with Haruka. Even if they're not friends, Haruka doesn't want her giving up on her dream. It's a strong moment for her. One problem I have with Haruka is that she spends so much of her own story feeling muted. When she gets to actually show her colours, I go, Oh yeah, this is Haruka. Still recognisably determined and wiser than her years. And I wish the story let this shine through more. Naturally, Akari turns up, Haruka and her repair their friendship, and Haruka sweeps the dance battle competition but Akari wins the attention of that choreographer. With an admission of selfishness and then one more genuine effort, she's a step closer to her goals. You never know how long you might chase a dream before you see it bear fruit. The biggest hurdle might not be any big dramatic thing, but the effort and discipline to keep going, even when your efforts seem for naught. It can be tempting to try and find shortcuts and use other people while hiding your intentions. But if you rush, you might trip yourself up and alienate others along the way. I consider this in some ways more of a side story than the road to fame in that it has a story and gives Haruka a few good moments along the way. Chapter 2 is about Park. It fleshes out her character, reveals much of her past, and explores her relationship with Haruka, doing a great deal to lend her greater depth and raise some questions, both about who she is and what she has done. It's good, but I wish it just had a little bit more. Turns out, we weren't done with work last we talked about the story. Chapter 1 is really like that, it just never ends. Horie and Haruka need to go apologise to Manda, and without time to get a makeup artist, Park decides she'll do it herself. The two wind up talking about beauty and fashion, and I love the little back and forth that comes from it. I don't know, it tiptoes around the edge of sickeningly saccharine. Park still has a recognisable sharp edge, but she does start blunting it a little for Haruka. The two enjoy this little moment together, so Park says she'll take Haruka out to do some shopping. The next day, when Haruka's out alone, she's ambushed by T-Set, and with no adults around, they're free to be a little meaner. There's little guile in how they bully Haruka, they just want to intimidate her, goad her into sticking up for herself so Mai has an excuse to pull out her trump card. As Haruka is on hands and knees, Park arrives and puts them in their place. Haruka? <laughs> The T-Cert girls don't know how cruel the industry can be. They themselves reinforce that because they think they're invincible. They can't conceive of the industry turning on them while Park knows just how easily it can. So trying to save face, T-Cert breaks and runs. After Park, who's headed for Tokyo tomorrow, leaves a to-do list for Horie. The two set off for a night on the town. I adore the banter between these two, but there is a sad undercurrent. Park says this will be their last chance to de-stress for a while, but she still views everything through the lens of work. It's all her life is. Yeah, Chief, it's an RPG. The two head to La Marche, and despite my lack of fashion sense, <coughs> Park will compliment whatever I pick. This will never be worn, it will just sit in my inventory. But she does grab Haruka a nice new handbag. Then it's Haruka's turn to pick and she wants to go to an arcade. And yeah, that sounds like good market research. Five marks what I'd consider an unfortunate transitionary point for arcades in the series. A move away from bespoke minigames towards purely emulating real Sega arcade cabinets. But it does have one last shoot 'em up and it has saved the best for last. Gun Rain sees you setting up turrets at incredibly high speeds to defend your platform from strange, snaking, glassy space monstrosities. 
It's an incredibly fast-paced game about charging cannons, cutting off enemies, and combining beams into bigger beams. It's hectic in the best way. Boxelios was a very twitchy, offensive affair, a mad panic of trying to hit weak points while time slipped away from you. Gunrain takes the same pace, but puts the emphasis on defense. Instead of accuracy, it demands situational awareness. It's a game about anticipating enemy movements and cutting them off. You can fire and aim manually, and at times you'll need to, and the longer you fire a turret manually, the stronger it gets, but you turn slowly while doing so. It's often better to leave a turret and keep moving. The game rewards good turret placement by having enemies killed feed its energy, keeping turrets active for longer. Successfully anticipating moves and hearing foes disintegrate against your lasers is immensely rewarding, but that safety never lasts long, and that time is best spent shoring yourself up. I'm sad to see this inventiveness go, but I'm glad it went out on such a fun minigame. Gun Rain is tons of fun. We also have Virtua Fighter 2, playable within the game itself. It's quaint now, but this was incredibly impressive then. I feel like I've already reviewed more than 10 games in Yakuza 5 alone, but here's another one, a whole ass arcade port. Now, I'm bad at most fighting games, but I'm especially bad at Virtua Fighter. I do find it interesting how Yakuza is sometimes seen as a successor to Shenmue. It isn't. Yakuza is good. Shenmue was at first conceived as a Virtua Fighter RPG before branching off and becoming more its own thing. I like to believe there was one dev who had a bone to pick with a comparison. Oh, we're, we're the new Shenmue, huh? Okay, okay, do a damn Virtua Fighter combo. Do it, do it. Come on, hit that combo. Turns out, I hardly can, so I'll stay over here in the kiddie pool. Sadly, Haruka and Park don't touch these. Seeing as this is still about work, they're here for a rhythm game. Taiko no Tatsujin. Which, well, loses a certain something when you're not actually banging a drum. Then they stop in a print circle, which has been dully gamified. Learn the timing of four gestures and hit them in time with a photo being taken. <laughs> it's boring busy work to play, but hey, these two seem to be having fun. The Arcade in 5 is pretty good. It's a fun farewell to the Boxelios lineup as future games will focus solely on arcade ports. Which makes no small degree of sense in grounding Yakuza in the real world, but also makes these arcades feel just a bit less special. And so their night is coming to a close. The two grab a taxi to get Haruka home, and... Chief, we were, we were just across the river. Park gives Haruka a gift, her fountain pen. <laughs> And it's a pen with a history behind it. When Park was making her way as an idol, she was already married. Just like her difficult childhood and half-Korean heritage, she kept this a secret from her agency and the wider world. This pen was a gift from her ex-husband. Park wound up getting pregnant and terminated it as soon as she knew. He and his anger struck her and left soon after, saying that all he'd be doing is getting in the way of her dream. At the time, Park saw all of this as sacrifices she would have to make, but when her agency found out about her hidden marriage, she was marked as a scandal in the making. Jobs dried up, her big debut went up in smoke, and all of her effort was rendered for naught. She traded everything for the dream, but reality isn't an exchange. Sometimes it just takes and gives nothing back. It's also worth considering that Park knows the pain of losing family for the sake of a dream, but she also willfully did that to Kiryu. She had him make that same sacrifice, not blind to the heartache that can follow. No matter how much sympathy you have for Park, and I myself have some, she is selfish, downright callous. Her speech to Kiryu about the orphanage being a place where dreams die takes on a darker tone when viewed in retrospect. She saw what Kiryu offered and couldn't trust it. Still, Park does know what she's dragged Haruka into and away from. And for that, she is sorry. Not that Haruka wants an apology. Haruka lost a mother and Park lost a child. However messed up this relationship started and still is, they're happy with it. Park I find fascinating because her cold front is slowly revealed to not just be a form of vengeance towards the industry and the result of a tough life. It's because Park doesn't want Haruka to carry her torch so much as light her own. We can argue over how different that truly is, but I believe her heart is somewhat in the right place. And this is part of why she can be so demanding, so short with people. She'll take the worst of the industry so Haruka can have the idealized life of an idol that others can't. We often hear from those who knew her back then that Haruka is like a young Park. Park is protecting her in the same way she wished to be protected, so Haruka doesn't have to become just like her. 
When Park finds out that Horie let Haruka get near T-Set, she slaps him for letting her glimpse the dark side of the business for even a second. A small detail only referred to here and there is that Haruka doesn't have a stipulation against relationships in her contract. Park doesn't want Haruka to have to carry that secret the same way she did. She, in this one small way, has rebelled against the cruelty of the idol industry, but she has still undeniably put Haruka in the same position she was in. She has to deny her past. The only difference is she isn't being punished for it. At least not yet, and not by Park. So, I was wrong. The game does have a stick to bash the industry with. It just so happens to be a wiffle bat that breaks after a solitary, hesitant blow. I wish that Park's role in Haruka's career was more of a point of contention, because then we could actually play out the difference between the fantasy idol business and the grimmer reality with Park as the dividing line. Flawed but genuine in her efforts to give Haruka the life she dreamed of, one that could not exist without her supervision. Her intentions are good, but she has undeniably manipulated Haruka. As it is, it's more that Park just can't be there all the time, and we see all the horror swept away not by her, but by the hand of the writer. This isn't about striking a balance between the dream and the reality, it's both being presented apologetically, which is a very weak approach. This is going to sound weird, but I have no idea if Haruka is boring or fascinating. I know what she's gone through, and it feels like she has a ton of conflicting emotions boiling under the surface. The songs definitely point to that. Regret over leaving home and awareness of the industry versus her relentless attempts to have the dream, being nice versus sticking up for herself. We get little peeks at each of these things, but that's it. Peaks. Is it a lot going on under the surface, or is it just surface? I wind up leaning surface because that's how it comes across. But I've had to think over this a lot. I keep mentally digging for snippets of character and motive, and they are undeniably there. One of my favorite moments is a really small one. This look of relief when Kiryu says he won't leave the orphanage is great. From the start, we know Haruka is uncertain of all of this. She wants Kiryu to still be at the orphanage, but also wants to take this chance. And she can't have both. You can imagine that on some level, Haruka was hoping Kiryu would win this argument and make the choice for her. That's me maybe reading a bit too much into this, but that's the beauty of Yakuza 5. It can still hit really thoughtful character beats. I have no idea what her idol personality is outside of people believing she seems genuine. But genuinely what? Genuinely boring? I suppose it's meant to just be people projecting what they want onto her. Kiryu himself spent his part trying to juggle several identities. Haruka's personas are two perfectly weighted lumps on a seesaw, ill-defined and unmoving. It's a parallel that is there, who Kiryu and Haruka have to be versus who they are, both realizing they'd sooner be with each other after they made decisions under pressure. In an interview, Yokoyama said that he wanted this feeling of distance, but that no matter how far apart they are, they will always be connected by their bonds. He said this was difficult to express, and on that I agree. It feels like all the excitement and actionable parts of this kind of character study were used up in Kiryu's section. Who Haruka wants to be will be a source of drama down the line, and these seeds are planted, it's just that the story doesn't much water them. In the past, Haruka would hit back when pushed. In this industry, that would collapse in on her. But I hate that she so rarely tries. When she does, it's a great moment to show that the fire is still burning in there and how the industry is at risk of snuffing it out. The Okinawa bit with T-Set feels like great setup for an arc that never comes. Haruka essentially refusing to be a victim, not through force, but gentle subversion. Disarming the industry by not letting it strong arm her. I'd have loved to have seen this genuine cunning being how she navigates the idol world. Sharper than she appears, unstoppably kind, but not a pushover. But, um, it's not. It's a good idea, but that's all it is. An idea. This is the central problem of this section. It's kind of prevalent in everything. Besides the telling being a little dull, it's a part with a lot of ideas and seemingly no idea what to do with them. Non-committal would be the word to sum up Haruka's solo portion, between gameplay systems you don't need to engage with to its presentation of its subject matter. It does relatively little with quite a lot. Park tells Haruka that after a recent interview about the Princess League, her ex-husband got in touch. He wants to meet after Haruka's Tokyo concert, and Park wants Haruka to go and collect him. That pen will be her key to finding the man. And that's how their night ends. I do really like this night out. It adds a lot of depth to Park's relationship with Haruka, creates some parallels to earlier parts of the story, and it greatly humanizes Park. She's had a lifetime of decisions that she has come to regret, but this time, she wants to do it right. 
She wants someone to have the dream. I still can't help but feel there's more to Haruka and Park. The way Park got Haruka is still a touchy subject, and I'm not sure there is really any bridging that gap. And then Park dies. If this part has sounded like I don't have all the answers, it's because, well, I don't think you're meant to get many, and while that's frustrating in some areas, it works out with Park. It built Park up, got me sympathetic but still not fully on board with her, and then tore her away on the precipice of seeing her dream come to fruition. Hell yeah, Akiyama is back. He's in Sotenbori setting up a new branch of Sky Finance. He's been at it for a few months, but progress is slow because he's exactly the same man from 2010. Hannah, meanwhile, has turned into a desk, low in calories and even lower in presence. Actually, I lied. There is one change. He's even more unflappable. In a plot where everyone just got flapped, this man is flap free. <laughs> Hannah calls, sadness in her voice. Marae Park, a client of theirs, has committed suicide. She told Horie Akiyama was in town and he endeavors to stop by the office right away. It's there he learns a few things from Horie. The police are analyzing her supposed suicide note, a simple two sentence affair. I'm tired, I'm sorry. Which these two agree doesn't sound like her one bit. Plus, the money Akiyama loaned her has disappeared from the safe. Until they find her account book, they can't confirm whether it's been spent or stolen. Buddy, you've got no idea how this guy's business works. Pure money magic. Horie is obviously in a bit of a state. Park had been pouring all of her energy into their new girl, and it looks like all of her efforts may go to waste. So Akiyama steps in to help. Seeing as the police have already proven useless, and hey, who can trust them after last time, we'll shun their help, find the money ourselves, and see if we can't prove foul play in the process. The investigation begins with Park's last idol. Never mind the fact these two never shared a second of screen time. It's fine. So they get to talking, and Akiyama reminds the audience how his business works. He'll do any amount, no collateral. All the client has to do is pass a test of his divining. Akiyama doesn't believe Park would give up on the eve of her dream. The vigor and determination she showed getting her loan was astounding. <laughs> Even beating out the one who wanted to get her brother off of death row? I guess so. Haruka also doesn't buy suicide, and demands that she comes along on Akiyama's investigation. Yeah, I already love these two. Akiyama hasn't really changed because he doesn't have to. He fits in with the dream theme dream team pretty much as is. The whole game is this one line of dialogue from him, from 4, writ large. So, no real need to change. But pairing him with Haruka, besides the fact it's nice that she gets to see a familiar, friendly face she's never actually seen before, is a good move since they fulfill similar but complementary roles. Both are good people in corrupt industries who use their respective talents not so much for themselves but for others. Their dreams lie in helping others fulfill their own. Just like Akiyama doesn't care about money, Haruka doesn't care about fame. For both of them, these are means to an end. Besides working well together, it's a nice closed loop. Akiyama thanks Kiryu for the windfall that rebuilt his life. 
a big chunk of that money then went to Park, who, well, she was keeping the orphanage open. That line of thought probably could have ended less tragically. Oh, and they can also do backflips to hurt people. Mostly me. More on that later. Speaking of flips, the two then inspect the crime scene. Park was said to have leapt from the roof, but Akiyama has a few reasons to doubt that. See? These two are on the same level. Charming conversation. Let's go downstairs. In the office, Akiyama tells the others that Haruka is a kid detective now. They're a little worried whether she can juggle that with her Princess League obligations. That's even if she should continue given the state of things. Princess League? Learning this, Akiyama insists that Haruka goes on, explaining that the large sum Park got from him was for a Tokyo concert, and she got it right as she recruited Haruka. Her faith in the girl has been absolute from the start, so she has to see Park's dream through. So it comes back around to that suicide note, and just like dancing, Haruka picks things up fast. ホリオ Park was down her right, leaving her just one left. All we can do is wait for the police to return the note. So it's break time. Akiyama and Haruka exchange info so they can catch up later today. <laughs> I'm gonna say something strange. Thank god Akiyama doesn't have a side story. There you go, you did it Akiyama. You bankrolled the road to fame. Why am I happy? Well... I've already forgotten who the villain of the first part was. I'm full. No, 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 I'll help you, Tatsu. I'll help you. I meant full of information. Even though you've dined twice as much here and are absconding to Tokyo with the recipe. I guess there are locker keys and, well, Haruka can collect those too. Just, for the love of God, do not use them as her. If she gets materials or equipment, they're hers. There's no getting them back. Though, I3 might help her with tea set. I want to quickly shout out Cyric Z. They wrote the game FAQ guide for Yakuza 5 that I've referred to here and again to track down some odds and ends and double check things. This absolute hero has been on that site for 21 years and writing guides since 2002. They have more will and dedication than anyone in this series. Akiyama only really has his master and his sub stories and honestly, I'm not a big fan of them. Most are a little flat and unengaging, simplistic stories with weak jokes. He gets a couple of dance battles which make for a fun novelty, an old lady teaching him how to haggle is a laugh, and he makes Haruka a new friend. After helping her in a sub story, you'll later run into her as Haruka and that's really cute. Plus he meets another real life restaurateur and fights alongside him. Sadly they don't team up to kick the shit out of Watanabe. He does have his own run-in with the idol industry. Yamura asks him to manage a girl named Maya for the day. She is struggling with the job. A lot. Usually a timid and reserved girl, her agency pushed her into the role of Strawberry Maya, a kooky, prickly princess from the Strawberry Kingdom who ends her sentences with cutesy made-up words. She hates it. It's utterly demeaning to her. In interviews and quizzes she has to act stupid, and on talk shows she has to get aggressive. After a long day of work, she tells Akiyama that what she really wanted was to sing for a kid's show. But her career trailed off course and she asks Akiyama if it's right to give up the gimmick so that she might course correct. The correct answer, which I double checked and I despise, is to tell her to keep doing it for the fans. Ah, those guys. This fills her with the strength to go on, now emotionally trapped in a role that she has made clear she hates. Which is dragging her away from the career she wants. Anyway, then Akiyama beats up a comedian who's trying to solicit Maya for sex, so I'm sure Akiyama's in the right. So that's his longest and most involved substory, but his most interesting tales don't really expand the world so much as add context to the story. Akiyama gets a text. Akihiko Yamori has been blacklisted by the Kansai Credit Ratings Board and every moneylender in town has turned him away. This name shocks Akiyama. It's his former boss, the man who sold him down the river all those years ago. Akiyama readies himself to finally close the book on that part of his life without slamming the door in Akihiko's face. 
when Yomori arrives at the office and sees who's running the joint, he expects Akiyama to try and take revenge, and he's furious when he doesn't. This is a fantastic scene. I was lying when I said Akiyama doesn't have any development. It's just that it's all contained in this small substory where he makes it clear that his past no longer controls him. He's grateful to be able to help people as he does now. And even if it came about because of betrayal, Yamori is the man who made that possible. With Jingu, the Toto Bank emerged untouched from the 10 billion yen incident. After Munakata's machinations came to light, Yamori was found out. Now he's out of the job and trusted by no one. And he in turn doesn't trust Akiyama. Getting help from the man he ruined would destroy what little pride he has left, so he turns it down. That pride leads him into a lone shark office, begging them to kill him there and then so his wife, Eri, the woman Akiyama had fallen for and Yomori had married, can collect his life insurance. He doesn't get stabbed, but he does get jabbed, and then it's up to Akiyama to resolve the negotiations. Afterwards, Akiyama gloats over how worthless Yomori's pride must be if rather than fighting for his family, he'd throw his life away, saying that money would not replace a husband and a father. Yomori finally has it in him to accept help. Akiyama was going to make his test getting a divorce, but well, after seeing what Yomori just did, he can't quite bring himself to be that petty. And besides, this is about leaving the past behind, so he just asks that Yomori accept that bygones are bygones. And this is why Akiyama feels so free in Yakuza 5. All of his change is internal, there's now nothing left in his past to weigh him down. He's now just living life and lending loans, purely on his own terms. Then we have the story of Nanako Kadama. She's a pinup girl whose agency is trying to rebrand her. She took offense to this, saying that she must stay true to her fans. So she wants 300 million to go independent and market herself. She has no plan, but plenty of spirit. And that's enough for Akiyama to shun her. Still, he gives her free tests. The old favorite, become a number one hostess, then collect a dangerous loan on Akiyama's behalf, don't worry, it's all an act, and put her body to work and earn some cash. Tiring, right? And after all of this, Akiyama springs one final test on Kadama. Change her stage name. I love the absurdly dramatic music behind her refusal to do this, along with Akiyama explaining why she has failed and won't be getting the money. Akiyama frames this as a test of will. Since she can't change her name, all of her problems lie with her agency. While somewhat true, I find this hokey as shit and just needlessly obtuse. She made clear her issue is an unwilling change of identity. To make her jump through hoops to maintain that identity, then fail her at the last second for not going against what she came here to do, it just doesn't sit right with me. It's clear Akiyama is leading her on from the get-go, and it's just fucking mean. He sensed that Kadama was making a rash move. She wasn't chasing a dream for a positive reason, but one born of spite. Her fans nothing more than a convenient excuse to stay the course, which, uh, the fans, huh? Akiyama comes off like such an obstinate prick. He told Maya to do what he's taking Kadama to task for. Should you stay true to your fans or not, dickhead? Not to mention, it's a bit rich for Akiyama to argue for trusting the decisions of your superiors, but hey, there we go. He's over it now. Anyway, then her manager runs in and apologizes for springing this on her without considering her feelings, so all's well that ends well. So, what does this part have to do with the wider story? Well, these were the same tests that Akiyama gave Park a year earlier. Wonderfully foreshadowed in a story cutscene. But what was Park's fourth and final test? Her next project had to be her last. Even if she had survived, Haruka would be the last idol Park ever managed. It meant she had to put her absolute all into this. Long story short, I hope she had enough money left over to bankroll the orphanage without the big job. Dying really dodged that bullet. And yes, it's a strong emotional pull, though a bit too strong since it pulls a little of the story out from under it. In a bid for greater meaning, this just makes the story so much darker. These tales do not wind up putting Akiyama in the best light, and it's a small shame, since it also presents him at his most nuanced and interesting. That evening, Akiyama gets a call. Haruka has been trying to get in touch with Horie with no luck. The two agree to go and check the office together. It's outside diner chair Akiyama sees a terrible sight. A crowd is gathered, a man lies near dead on the streets. It's as we all feared. It's Saigo. 
Akiyama can't remember the guy at first. I mean, yeah, Saigo, you shot at me, but so did Munakata and no one cares about him. Eventually, memories are jogged and the weird old Merc is offended. After a heated back and forth, he springs a new technique on us which puts a spring in our step. And I wish he didn't. Akiyama's combat is my least favourite in Yakuza 5 because of this technique, the launch strike. When you have heat, you can send your enemy up into the air and follow them, delivering kicks all the way. As long as your heat lasts and you can track the enemy, you are invulnerable and can put the hurt on. When used well, you can freely wail on a foe and maybe catch some other poor sods along the way. It looks cool, fits Akiyama's style, and gives him a tool to focus down an enemy during crowded battles. Here's the first big issue. It's clunky and inconsistent, and while it looks cool, I find it fiddly and annoying to keep going. Kiryu's Dragon Spirit gave him new considerations. Saijima's puppetry expands his options with knockdown opponents. Launch Strike intrudes on the core combat in a way similar to, but worse than, Climax Heat. From now on, whenever I have heat, some of my heavy strikes are overwritten with this launcher that I would only want to use situationally. I now have to keep in mind that I do not want to get pulled into this strange attack string that will eat my heat. Ironically, for something which defies gravity, it sure as hell weighs Akiyama down. I wish it was bound with a unique input so that I could only call on it when I wish to use it, instead of Akiyama getting so hyped and heated he just can't stop backflipping. Besides that, Akiyama is much the same, but Yakuza 5 has changed. It is a game with fights of fantastic scale. These work brilliantly for Kiryu and they're a piece of cake for Saijima. We're a ways into the game and this isn't as easy for Akiyama. He is not on their level, but he's going to fight his hardest all the same. And so the easy starting character of the last game smoothly transitions into a fitting light game fighter. His strengths are intact but no longer played to. The problem then is that it's sort of boring when a fight is just whittling down enemy after enemy with a toolset less pleasurable to use against crowds. It's in this chapter that 5 scale becomes a little less appealing. Not to mention Akiyama's wall kick has been made longer. Heat suppression helps, but I did tire of blundering into this move. Not to mention, Jesus Christ, calm down Akiyama. Now it should be noted that least favourite doesn't mean I dislike him. He's still a lot of fun to play and his rhythm is intact. These issues aren't a major problem but Saigo might be. He's an interesting master. Fights, chases, and missions. He has no weird hub gimmick, no moping around town, no offerings, no fetch quests. Just tackle his crazy training regime and hear his weird, nonsensical tales of life and death. I enjoy his weapons training, no matter how wonky it is, since at least it's not just another trainer boss fight, and while I do also enjoy those, I feel a bit of variety goes a long way in keeping the player interested and making the move unlocked feel more memorable. Chases are still here, they'll be gone for a while afterwards, and honestly, I get the feeling that throughout their 3-5 run, the developers never really got them to feel how they wanted. Each game expanded the chase moveset, but this never did anything to really give the chases great a depth. Still, it has a drop kick now. It's hard to aim, stops you dead, and doesn't do much damage. But it's a drop kick, so it's good by default. It's always just been close the gap and deal damage, or else hold out for a set time. It's fine, and you may not expect there to be much else, but there's an impression they wanted this mode to take on greater depth that they could never really find. Always kept easy and simple, used as a bridge between scenes in a way a cutscene could achieve. So after this, they'll be shelved until judgement, which, being a detective story, is obligated to figure them out again. With the broader scope of music, the focus on jazz from last time has gone. So they just crammed all the jazz into the chase track, and god is it good. Alright, got him. How many Wulongs is this guy worth? Quite a few, it turns out. During their training, Saigo and Akiyama come under sniper fire and have a few dangerous run-ins. Eventually, the two are confronted by an assassin. And Akiyama is now in his sights. And as Akiyama praises the man who just saved his life, they decide to call it a wrap. Turns out that all along this was an instructional film and Akiyama is the star pupil rushing to his gracious master's aid. Yeah, it's a fun twist and puts all the absurd obstacle courses in a hilarious light. So, that's Akiyama's side content. Thank god we haven't left Haruka outside the haunted office for long. Back at Diner Chair, the two fine park suicide note has been returned. So they start looking for some left-handed writing to compare. They try and crack the safe, and then Haruka has a realization. Aita. <laughs> Perfect. Everything we need to confirm a forgery. Hang on. 
Haru said he checked the safe earlier and it was empty. Was he lying? Not to mention, where is that guy? Oh, there he is. Akiyama cuts off Horie's fleeing assailant and finds it's none other than Ogita. Oh, you're going to be annoying to fight, aren't you? It's a battle of footwork, and while Ogita isn't hard, he's a slippery one. With him down for the count, Akiyama runs to ask Horie where the other safe Make sure he's okay. He's alive, but maybe not for long. <laughs> Fuck yeah, Haruka! <laughs> so, two bosses in a row, and now it's Akiyama versus an actual mountain. He's big. He's lumbering, and he's actually a lot easier than the little guy. Not to be disrespectful, but this is the stuff Park just couldn't bring to the table. So, we've got our suspects, little and large, most definitely involved in Park's death. Fuss begins part three, chapter four, by far the longest chapter present, so with nothing else on our plate but story, Let's see our way through and delve into bits that stuck out to me as interesting. It's also an incredibly jumpy chapter as Akiyama and Haruka work through their own issues while occasionally joining forces. The next morning, Akiyama tries to bring this new evidence to light, but the detective more or less says, eh, it would be embarrassing for the police to reopen a case ruled a suicide. I mean, yeah, come on, Akiyama, they looked for a minute. So, as it turns out, we'll have to do all the legwork. Good thing that's where Akiyama shines. The policeman leaves as Haruka comes in with some shopping. Ah! Ah, must be fine then. Haruka suggests looking for a forger. Then the two get calls from their respective carers. Akiyama puts an irritated and left out of the loop Hana to work finding a faker. Meanwhile, Haruka gets a call from Yamura. Round two of the Princess League is up, and with Horie in hospital, Yamura asks Haruka if she wants her to be her manager which Haruka gladly accepts. I really like Yamura. She lacks Park's relentless drive and Horie's optimism, but what she does have is a more grounded perspective. She got into the industry much the same way Park did. She had a brief stint of fame before settling into a behind-the-scenes role. The difference is Yamura chose this for herself. She didn't like the spotlight and so she was able to get out before she was burned into the public consciousness, and she's happier that way. So what she offers Haruka that the other two couldn't is a choice. She knows Haruka will fulfill Park's dream in Tokyo. But the moment Haruka wins that Princess League, she can no longer claim to be the ordinary high school girl she insists that she is. So when the final round comes, Yamura tells Haruka that there's no shame in forfeiting the competition and having at least a few more days of relative normalcy. Yamura wants Haruka to be certain that this is her dream. She's the only person to show Haruka that consideration. At Soten TV, the stakes are raised. Nakai accuses Haruka of coming here hoping for sympathy votes, needling at her for disrespecting Park by daring to perform a day after her death. This successfully gets under Haruka's skin. That fire inside has her make the utterly pathetic ultimatum that if she wins, Nakai must leave Dinah Chair alone forever. Nakai twists this back on her. If T-Set wins, Haruka has to come to Osaka Talon. Haruka, in her grief and with her pride insulted, agrees to this. Yamura's rightfully angry that Haruka fell into his trap, but there's nothing for it but to win now. Which is pretty easy when round two features the song Loneliness Loop. An energetic dance number filled with lyrics about being confused and deep in regret. Haruka just lost Park and is in the middle of a murder mystery. All of the lyrics are about loss and lack of focus. 
perfect for Haruka, who is currently at her lowest point. That dismissal of regret in the first round of living in the moment and giving it your all, well, now all of that seems a little naive. Haruka knows she's lost something by now. She just hasn't realized quite how much. Also the line, a bird without wings can no longer fly. Yeah, it's true, but given the circumstances, it's a bit fucked up. So after round two, Akiyama comes to the office with an announcement. Having had time to check the accounts, he's found out where the money is gone. And there's good reason why all 300 million yen has been spent. What little is left of Dyna Chair are shocked. To put a newcomer onto one of the biggest stages in the country and hope to fill that stadium is absurd. But Akiyama is sure Park must have had a plan of some kind. It's just that without Park or Horie, it falls to Yamura to organize, and this is way beyond her level of expertise. Christina walks in and says he'll handle it. It's his job to see Haruka through to the end here. It is a nice moment to see that despite all of the recent hardships, Dino Chair stands, well, sits, together. Hannah then comes through. This takes our detectives into the den of a forger. He used to be a fan of Park, and his enthusiasm has found its way down to her apprentice. He sets off on an earnest but bizarre aside, lamenting that everywhere he turns he sees nothing but fakes, but Haruka's genuine smile gives people the strength to go on. Kind words from the man who penned Park's suicide note and would likely benefit from a change in vocation. It's a message that this part reiterates again and again, how a genuine, good, genuinely good person can uplift others. And I guess it's meant to mean more now that it's coming from a counterfeiter? It doesn't work for me. This guy's dirt stains his gleaming message. While he can't name names, he can say that his client is large, and was seen driving around a very interesting figure, Naoki Katsuya, the president of Osaka Talent. Sounds like a name. Seems like we have our man. Akiyama decides to go and meet with him the following day. But before that, the two investigators decide to go somewhere and relax for a bit, try and catch up without the murder hanging over them. The game skips over this interaction, going ahead to them saying how nice it was for them to take a moment to themselves. And take a moment to themselves they did. I kinda wish we got to see any amount of casual interaction to see how these two get along. I'll praise this chapter for its breeziness, but it feels like a fine character beat was just skipped over. We never see these two when they're not talking about business or the ongoing plot. I like their rapport and wouldn't have minded seeing more of it, especially since we never see it when it isn't being tested. The next morning, Akiyama meets Katsuya. うちと大ナチャさんとは確かに交流がありますが、どういったお話でしょう。勝也さんは以前俳優をされていたんですね。きっと相当な縁に当たったんでしょうね。どういう意味でしょう。芸能関係者独特のやらしさなんて微塵も
Outside her dressing room, she's confronted by Tisa, who are just as wonderful as ever. This time, Haruka doesn't back down. She lets them know that she's gonna win. And that's when Yamura, despite Nakai's underhanded deal, despite the argument that just happened, asks Haruka if she's sure she wants to go ahead. Which we do. Haruka says Park's dream is now hers. So on to the final round. Oh hey, it features an ED. I guess the genre was right. Same as ever, it reflects Haruka's journey. It's a melancholy yet hopeful song about how after a long road their dream is within reach, wishing someone who meant a lot to them was still there to see how far they've come. For Haruka, this can mean any number of people, not just Park. She has lost more people she cares about than anyone her age should, but she holds on to that care all the same. Coming from T-Set, of course such a song would seem fake. And that's how Haruka basically bumbles her way into being real. And on the way out, T-Set comes running. Yeah, it was a dance, innit? You were meant to move. The two admit Haruka must have worked hard and praise her for a job well done. For Haruka, all the bullying is immediately pushed aside. I do accept this apology, though I find it pretty weak considering how T-Set are T-Set up as antagonists beforehand. It feels less like a genuine redemption and more the story making sure a later swerve won't feel really hollow. And it will anyway. <laughs> Rewinding a moment, that choice to forfeit the league. The story doesn't change a great deal, but you can do it. And in this case, there is still an apology, with Mai sending Haruka a far more heartfelt consolation. I actually like this version of events a lot more, as it shows they're not just swallowing their pride because they lost, but were actually oblivious to how harsh their words were, which are teenagers, innit? They're not meant to come across as totally rotten people, but immature and caught up in the business. And man, Nakai, Park, you industry folk are awful motivators. Also, yes, because I didn't want to trek several hours from my latest save to capture this, I had to use sourced footage and the only person I found who forfeited the league was DSP. This is the longest voicemail in human history. I have no idea if the fact he did this makes perfect sense or none at all. He doesn't strike me as the quitting type. There is a small scene in The Road to Fame which does a good deal explaining why Azusa acts as she does. In it, she sees Haruka being forcefully prepositioned by a TV producer and steps in to chase him off. Haruka is really thankful, but Azusa says she wasn't trying to help. She just hates seeing that guy get up to his tricks. You'd think a good turn like that should be rewarded, but Azusa asks Haruka not to tell anyone about this. Azusa then advises Haruka to watch herself and not be so trusting. In this, we realize that her brashness is a shield. She has been in the industry long enough to become disrespectful and defensive, and thinks telling Haruka to be the same way is to her own benefit. Azusa isn't a bad person, but she knows the industry takes advantage of good ones. It's only as Haruka wins the Princess League that Azusa drops her guard for a moment and admits, maybe that lack of a stern facade is what makes her so endearing. There is some nuance to T-Set, but very little time given to them where they're not just being shits, usually presented as little more than stock standard bullies who exist for Haruka to overcome. The tools to make them really interesting rivals for Haruka are there, but don't really see use until after Haruka has worked her way out from under them. It took me a lot of hindsight to understand why Haruka getting their approval has any value, since the game puts in overtime to make them thoroughly unlikable. It's nice to see all the threads come together looking back, but if things feel shallow during the telling, is it worth holding out on these characters for the sake of a twist? Especially if much of the twist is really just them having a character at all? Akiyama gets a visit from our favorite high-speed sleuth. 
Serizawa. Though this time, he's being oddly coy. Yeah, Akiyama, you ought to know by now. He tells us that Park's death and Horie's drop at the hands of Ogisa are linked to Osaka Enterprises, an Omi front company headed by big man Kamon Kanai. The Omi are really volatile right now, so Akiyama should definitely not do anything with this information. <laughs> I'm having a sense of deja vu. So Akiyama is left wondering how he'll find Osaka Enterprises. Luckily, the Omi goons trying to run him out of town turn up. Good timing. He doesn't even care there are 10 guys in front of him. So let's just turn that around. Well, good thing there's only one road out of town. Armed with all the directions he needs, Akiyama finds Osaka Enterprises to be an out-of-the-way waste disposal lot, and we immediately run into a lot of waste to dispose. Out of the way! The unique gimmick of this stage is the construction equipment, which can be used to... Oh, wait, yeah, that's the only one. Yeah, extended battles seem to either be really big scraps with little else, or tiny segments that exist to get into and out of one gimmick. It's in here we find Ogita, arm crushed and terrified for his life. Ogita says he didn't kill Park over money. He just hated her for demanding top-level work for bad pay, then circumventing their contract so she didn't have to reimburse him. Ogita, I get that you're bleeding, but, um, are you sure it wasn't about money? Shun, this is not the time for a coaching seminar. So, long story short, Kanai wants to find a letter from Park's ex-husband in her possession. Ogita losing his job meant he could no longer pay off his debts to the Omi, so Kanai instead gave him a task. Come along and find that letter. They turned up, Ogita ran into Park, and he accidentally killed her. Then Kanai, concerningly quickly, got a suicide note put together and tried to hide their trail. Ogita danced with the devil, and it didn't go too well. So he pleads for help to get out of here. Akiyama, who by now is pretty pissed off by this whole sordid business, tells Ogita that he's gonna go beat the shit out of Kanai. So if he's gonna run, there's your chance. <laughs> Ogita doubts Akiyama's chances. It's fine, Akiyama doesn't. This is extremely fucking cool. Man, I wish Saijima had this approach of just wandering right into enemy territory totally undaunted. I have no clue why Akiyama has become this fearless, but I kinda love it. His confidence is rivaling Kiryu's, and hey, it's working. Or at least, seems to be. So the beatdown continues into the office, and Kanai is a little confused. <laughs> It's good to keep things simple. The conversation doesn't go anywhere, and since Akiyama won't give up the letter, well, Kanai will just have to go talk to the girl. Some of his boys should be picking her up right about now. His other boys are here to put Akiyama down. So thanks, Serizawa, if that is your real name. But there is a silver lining. Ogita's dead. <laughs> One lot of boys down, and well, the others aren't doing too much better. They're struggling to get Haruka to talk. And Kanai is not best pleased. I think I see the problem here. Kanai, I don't want to tell you how to do your job. But he does. Back at Diner Chair, these three are at their wits' end. With no clue as to where Haruka is, the only option left is to wait. Luckily, they won't be waiting long, as Katsuya apologetically brings her back. He lets Akiyama in on a little more. He isn't just the CEO of Osaka Talent. He's also a high-ranking Yakuza executive, the Omi Chief of Headquarters. The Omi equivalent of, uh... What was that guy's name? What was his name? Aoyama. Sorry, it's been, uh... months since I thought about him. 
Both juggle their roles as businessmen and Yakuza, while Aoyama wanted to rule the roost with an authoritarian, business-like approach which disrespected his subordinates. Katsuya understands that these are distinct roles, a businessman and a clan demand different approaches. So Katsuya both gives and demands respect. Both are dealing with insubordination above and below. While Aoyama played it off, Katsuya acknowledges that things have slipped his notice and sets about fixing it. Katsuya is everything Aoyama failed to be, and in being more Yakuza, he's also a lot more reasonable. Katsuya admits that obtaining the letter was their goal, but he doesn't approve of the methods Kanai employed. Him and Park were actually good friends back in the heyday of their careers, and her death has been painful for him. He reveals why they're after the letter. Park's ex-husband is an important figure. Tojo Kai no Daikanbu, Majima Goro desu. Nandato? Katsuya's organization don't believe the Mad Dog was really put down, and hope this letter may tell them where he went. He tells Akiyama to have Haruka hand it over when she awakes. After he leaves, Akiyama reveals his plan. He'll take Haruka and flee to Kamurocho. The Omi would be desperate to make a move on Tojo Turf, so she'll be able to have her concert and see out Park's dream in relative safety. Katsuya was smart enough not to trust Akiyama to pass the message on, so Haruka comes too to a text demanding that she call that number. On the other end, Katsuya outlines to her what will happen to Morning Glory and Kiryu if she doesn't surrender that letter. Yeah, come on Haruka. We're obligated to threaten the joint at least once. What's the point of an orphanage if not leverage? So after a bit more back and forth and Haruka failing to make her favourite kind of deal, he leaves her with where to bring the letter, with assurances that he'll come alone and she had better do the same. That's when Christina finds Haruka awake, and the three explain what's happened and who the letter is for. Haruka tells them the letter is in the safe. Haruka then acts about as suspiciously as she possibly can while trying to leave with the letter, so Akiyama chases her to the station, and good thing too. Oh. We're meant to feel bad for Haruka here, and I do, but man, this is really rough for Kanai. He's trying and failing to intimidate a kid. <laughs> no one else is laughing, big man. You're like me doing man's eye. Haruka holds firm, so he just rips the letter from her grasp. <laughs> And well, with Park dead, Haruka terrified and Kanai confused, Akiyama brings the theme of dreams to the fore. Just as he always does, He's taking on the job of bringing somebody else's dreams true. And so begins part 3's final showdown as Akiyama fights Kanai alongside a small army of his men. So, first some thoughts on this fight. One, I love the setting. Brawls on station platforms have a lot of nostalgia for me, for really stupid reasons. Two, I wish the track for this battle, the magnificently named Dynamic and Magnificent, was Akiyama's street battle theme. Dynamic and magnificent suits Akiyama's cocksure and carefree attitude, and gives this final showdown an air of absolute effortlessness, which is probably better suited to street toughs than, well, Kanai. That said, I love how the game presents this ogre as daunting for all of five seconds, and then Akiyama says, I'm sure to win because my speed is superior, and then he does. Repeatedly. But it isn't without some difficulty. I sort of hate that Akiyama, one of the worst crowd fighters, is the one who gets the big bad boss in amongst goons. 
But then the point is, Kanai only looks intimidating. He doesn't actually have it. He has no convictions. He has no dream. And is Fuss actually a weak piss baby in a big leathery man's body? Meanwhile, Akiyama is fighting for something, for someone else, and is therefore a god. As mentioned a long time ago, each character's story plays and feels very different. It's as refreshing as often as it's disorienting. Like 4, these stories are forming a tapestry. Unlike 4, the scraps of fabric often feel a little discordant. Part 3 feels like you found two random chunks which have been stitched together. After two chapters of Haruka, there's a mid lane switch. A character I like dies, the Yakuza enter the picture. Yet because of Akiyama, the mood considerably lightens. It goes from a slow and stifling work drama to a simple but fun murder mystery. It feels like the story can breathe again. It makes sense to keep it simple, since there are characters from hours ago I'll need to recall, and the tragedy is I've forgotten most of them already, so you can't make your murder mystery too heavy. I enjoy Akiyama in 5, but him and Saijima rub me the wrong way for the same reason. He comes off as a simplified version of himself. There's nothing new to do with him, and the answer to the last lingering question in his story is the word IKEA. At most he keeps saying that he should give up smoking, but that would mean changing, so light up, kickman! The difference is that unlike Saijima, it feels like they're not even really trying. He was in town for a breezy Yakuza adventure and characters who are just experiencing a different type of story, well, they get dragged into it. The separation between these two is really just the tone and framing of their adventure. It doesn't solve the problem, it just makes Akiyama less demanding of scrutiny. Plus he's playing buddy cop with Haruka, which takes a little weight off of him to be as interesting. She's shouldering the emotional burden of this story. I find it tricky to actually sum up part 3 because of that. It's perhaps the most important part of the game, but it feels so laissez-faire. It makes certain you know that the theme is dreams, it makes sure you can't forget that, and it focuses much of its runtime on the girl who many are pinning those dreams on. Yet Haruka has so little going on, she feels more like a plot token. Passed around until someone cashes her in for one dream fulfilled, please. Akiyama's role in the story meanwhile, well, he's a cool guy who kicks things and doesn't seem to even care when a gun is stuck in his face. It's fun seeing parallels between him and Katsuya, but that's just me giving some food for thought. It's not a fixture of the narrative or something that's really all that played with, maybe not even intentional. And their interactions are fun but highly repetitive, just like Haruka's dance numbers. Also, mad respect to Yomura and Christina for turning up to work after two consecutive murder attempts at the office. Someone in my Discord put Yakuza 5 in perspective for me. I've said that each Yakuza game leans more into different genres and mediums when it comes to its storytelling. They put it that Yakuza 5 is like a TV miniseries, your Wires and Breaking Bads and Fargos. I like this comparison. There's shows with multiple leads, large casts, and interweaving plot lines. But Yakuza 5 doesn't have the benefit of being able to jump characters as needed to unravel the larger mystery and develop individual narratives at a steady pace. It does it one by one. And this approach is interesting, but it has a few big problems. Chiefly, Morinaga and Aizawa, remember them? They're actually really, really important during the finale, and basically all the little details surrounding them are pretty hard to remember three entire plots later. Another issue, as we've gone over, Saijima and Akiyama feeling a little flatter. It isn't the worst thing in the world, but it's definitely lesser compared to how defined Kiryu is. If these storylines were running in parallel, I likely wouldn't have noticed since Kiryu and Haruka are carrying the emotional weight, while Saijima unravels parts of the larger conspiracy and Akiyama lets us chill. It would probably mean we'd also remember all the key players come closing time. But when tackled piecemeal, some sections feel lacking. Characters fall to the back. Where part 1 works better than parts 2 and 3 is by having a satisfying self-contained story while also contributing to the larger narrative. It has an arc that wraps up within its own time frame, and its own questions answered while raising others important to the wider world. It makes time for that while also reintroducing Kiryu under a new light, and setting up the town he's in and their unique criminal situation. Kiryu's portion isn't even longer than the others. It's actually shorter. It just uses its time better. 2 and 3 are still self-contained, but they rely far more on being part of a larger narrative to take on meaning. They're entertaining and still meaty, but I can't help but feel like they're missing their own identity, so that when they're isolated, they feel less worthwhile. By the end of part 1, I feel Kiryu and the world around him has changed. By the ends of part 2 and 3, I feel like I'm being left waiting and wanting. In an interview, Yokoyama said that at first the story was primarily focused on Kiryu, and the other playable characters came around in the process of figuring him out. It sounds like even when you're playing as the others, 
you're meant to be thinking of Kiryu. It's presumptuous to say that was the approach, but that's what the end result feels like. This is also only talking from a story perspective. Gameplay-wise, no. These sections are just as complete as part one. Akiyama gets less to do, but by this point, I'm fine with that. He still has a healthy number of sub-stories, and he's allowed to drink. Plus, I have to admit the gameplay would likely suffer from a jumping format with this many characters. With two, let's say. Now well, that might work out well. So let's wrap up this strange, lopsided, and very long part. <laughs> Kanai is beaten as a disappointed Katsuya watches on. Akiyama and Haruka flee for Tokyo, and Kanai is punished for not only going against his boss's orders, but completely botching his own plan in the process. Sawamura Haruka to wa, ore ga hitori de ai ni ike ba tegami o watasu yo hanashi ga tsuite ita. Mata ano Akiyama to iu toku ga dejabatte kiyoru to omotta mo en sakai. Ore no te ni amaru to. Chaimasu. Da ga sono kekka, omae tachi wa Akiyama ni yabure. Katsuya then explains the similarities of the Yakuza and media worlds, and how Haruka could see right through a Yakuza as basic as Kanai. So he makes Haruka out to be way cooler than she is. And then the speech about the similarities between the two worlds forms a nice little bridge back out into the wider story. We're zooming out and getting reminded of the bigger picture, which we'll glimpse for all of two seconds. By now, it's very clear that the Tojo, yeah, you remember those guys, well, they're not the only ones dealing with insubordination. The Omi is similarly internally fucked. The whole Japanese underworld is tripping over each other as the chairman of one clan is dying and the other has disappeared. The player isn't allowed to see the full picture because not a soul knows what that is, except perhaps Serizawa owing to his ability to teleport, and he's holding out on us big time. So, all of our old favourites are headed for Tokyo. The pieces are all in play and the conspiracy is coming to a boil. We're long past due to start tying these tails together and get some answers. Let's get... Oh, wait, wait, hold up. Yakuza 5 isn't ready yet. It's still got one more story to tell and one chuckle fuck to introduce. I'd be disappointed, but don't worry. For he's one of the greatest chuckle fucks to ever walk the earth. You could argue having one more part after how the last ended would kill the pace. I'd argue the pace died so long ago that the blood on Yakuza 5's knife has dried. And we've floated on three of the concepts since. Like a dream. If you possess fantastic memory or a frankly terrifying set of notes, you'll remember that Nagoya has been mentioned once or twice thanks to some murders. So it's not like Nagoya comes out of nowhere, but I wouldn't blame anyone for forgetting about it. I knew it was coming and I'm surprised. Akiyama's part really ends like we're about to wrap all this up. But walking out is Tatsuo Shinada. His story begins 15 years ago, and well, this is a baseball game, so I'll leave it to the professionals. いや、藤田監督ずいぶん思い切った采配ですね。手の台がと考えるのが自然でしょう。さあ、ここまでワイバーンズ打線を抑えている義眼沢田投手にとっては長打を警戒さえしておけばいいわけですから。ここで一安心
But something went wrong. Let's go over our first evening with Shinada. Shinada! This is clearly not the first time this has happened. Shinada tries not to let his mate Uno know that he's in. And failing that, just decides to go back to bed. Uno is only chased off when a bigger, scarier debt collector turns up. This is Takasugi, a loan shark affiliated with local Yakuza outfit, the Nagoya family. Takasugi lets himself in and Shinada's right away, up and alert. Today is the day he has to pay off his interest and his job as a nightlife journalist isn't quite making ends meet. Lucky for him, Takasugi has a gig lined up at a metal press. Right away, this scene really hooked me. Let's start with the dialogue. The last two parts had a lot of really lofty speeches that I usually like, but not when they're so common and stuffy. Shinada's part works its way up to them. It doesn't begin larger than life and stay on a flat curve. The dialogue is a lot more flavorful and layered. This is some gangster movie banter. I can't hate Takasugi, he makes frets fun. Plus it does a lot more with body language and visuals, it's a lot more expressive. Look at Shinada, he's adorable when he's scared out of his mind. The game more or less just remembered how to talk, there's style and substance in the plotting, and so far we've only seen a diamond and a rough. So terrified for his digits, he tells Takasuki he has an interview with Milky tonight. All he has to do is write it up, get his pay, and hand it over with a handful of fingers. Takasugi is almost satisfied, but doesn't let him off without a warning. On the way over, Kinecho is established as well as Shinada's place within it. It's based on the Nishiki district, a semi-red light district in Nagoya. I don't know if it's really full to busting with erotic masseuses and brothels, but that's the way the game puts it. I'd call it mini Camarocho. It has an open, pleasant to navigate layout, but it's a bit more cramped. The park is nice and the oval stage is weird. It's a real place and you'd expect it to be used for a story or side activity location owing to its massive size, but nope. It's just there and kind of empty. Also, while I shouldn't go back there right now, I love that Shinada's house is basically a rooftop shed. It's cozy. As Shinada makes his way to Club Futomomo for his interview, he's stopped by a few barkers. His articles drum up business and he's on a friendly basis with every shady joint in town. He gets the specials, which isn't helping him much. The less shady locals like him too. The kindly woman running the pharmacy gives him an energy drink she had going spare. And Shinada is depressingly delighted that this solves the problem of dinner. She knows how bad off he is, but even that worries her. And despite running late, he has to drag himself away from a baseball report on the way over. The sport still holds dominion over him, regardless of whatever happened. At Futomomo, he gets an icy reception. Shinada has a bit of an ongoing thing with Milky. He got this soap land in hot water recently, and funnily enough, they didn't like that. He used decade-old photos of Milky, and he's here to set the record straight, by expensing a session with his favourite girl. The owner isn't impressed. Plus, there's a problem. Milky isn't in right now. Turns out her brother has been kidnapped by the company he works for. Shinada needs this interview tonight, so he begs her to sit tight while he goes and saves him. His game plan at Kubota Security is interesting. He blunders in and just asks that they let him go. And that doesn't quite work. I like Shinada. He doesn't have Akiyama's wit, he just slings grade school insults to get the fight going. He also hasn't quite got the other characters fighting chops, but damn does he try. I understand that a lot of people don't like Shinada's combat, but frankly, I love it. I've said before that I like really scrappy brawling, and this is what Shinada, more than anyone else, brings to the table. 
All he's got going for him is brute strength and tenacity, and that's compared to average goons. He's massively outmatched by the other leads. He has a very rough free hit combo, lacks double heavies, his grapple throw struggles to hit surrounding enemies, and his heat actions begin basic. They come off more like desperate brutality instead of highly skilled moves. Still, that's three fucking heat actions back to back. Jesus Christ, Shinada. I love the contrast this creates with the other characters. The others start strong and become gods. You feel them get stronger, but they don't really grow and diversify their moveset. But you feel Shinada's repertoire really expand. And even his most powerful combos require slightly more complex inputs, and these are nowhere near as effective as Kiryu's grapple combos. Even at his best, Shinada is narratively and mechanically not as talented a brawler as the others, and he has to work harder to barely keep pace. He does sort of take the role of Tanamura as the grappler. This doesn't mean he gets a ton of grapple options, but what he does get is an absurd number of ways to get an enemy into a grab. He can attack into grapple, quick step into grapple, heat move into grapple, counter into grapple, attack grapple into grapple, grapple into grapple. I love this move. No, we're not done yet. All right, off your fuck. Shinada's story is about steadily taking back control of his own life, and I love how his combat progression reflects that through the sheer number of ways he can get his mitts on others. Also, and I have no idea why, but he gets Hell's Floor as a standard heat action. It's ridiculous. This is a move Kiryu would break out for someone special, like his uncle. Shinada is not so precious. So, I love playing as Shinada. His combat feels really distinct from anyone else's, leaning into a slower, more methodical, low damage rhythm. This distinction is even lent to attack names, with things like My Essence of Dragging, My Essence of Whirlwind, and Shinada's gimmick, My Meteor Tackle. I find this naming convention very endearing. And, uh, well, I don't mind Meteor Tackle, even though it has the exact same problem as Akiyama's launcher. But Shinada gets away with it because despite having the exact same binding, it's not actually overwriting anything else, so it just works a lot more naturally. Plus it's a great crowd control option, and basically his only one outside of weapons. Shinada needs to spend heat to manage crowds where once again, the other, stronger characters have plentiful, non-costly options. He's set apart in a ton of really neat little ways where I know I'm playing the same game, but the mechanics have been meaningfully moved around to give me a really fresh character. So it's a bit of a struggle, but Shinada overcomes the security company. We find out what happened to Milky's brother. His superior at the company is trying to scam him. He gave the kid a historically valuable baseball bat, which was apparently cracked when he dropped it. Shinada skips the obvious problem with that and explains how this is just an ordinary bat. It's only when he runs into that scammer out on the street later he points out that, mate, bats don't crack from being dropped. He just wanted to flex, really shut that scheme down and spin him in circles a few times while he does it. Bossman Kubota comes in, and he's not happy that Ono has been taking big jobs and running grifts behind his back. <coughs> oh, that reminds me, we've got an article to pen. But before the interview, Shinada needs to get the ink running. Shinada and Milky have known each other for a while. They're not just business partners, but old friends, and I find the relationship they have really charming. Milky is scared of curdling. I mean, aging. She insisted on the old photos that got them in trouble last time, and to protect her feelings, Shinada says people were annoyed they used old photos when she's so much better now. Which, well, he's into it. So, job done. Spirits and much more raised. Shinada heads for the office, and runs into Uno. Knowing money is coming his way, Uno decides to follow Shinada to the printers. They get to talking about Takasugi and the Nagoya family. They're a shadowy Yakuza outfit. In their 15 years in Kineicho, neither of these two have actually seen any Yakuza, but Uno lives in fear that they can strike at any moment with only a bad word said. Why, just the other day, some guy walked into the wrong office and lost an eye. <laughs> 
俺のこと心配してくれてんのそりゃそうだろうお前が死んだら3万帰ってこねえもんよ He also reveals why he wants his money now. There's a new girl at his favorite parlor, and Uno wants to be the first in there. Shinada actually recognizes her. Turns out she's an old girl, just switched shops. Your wish is my command, you old pervert. Shinada turns his story in, and bad news his boss cribbed half his paycheck over missed deadlines and turning in handwritten work. Shinada can only take the loss. After all, he's about to wish he had half. <laughs> 回転寿司全額持っていくってのはなんとか昨日から何も食べてなくておいおいどうなってんだよ風俗ライターのギャラってのはよ 25k down 1 million 327,534 to go、oh. That's a few platinum plates With what shrapnel he has left Shinada's still got a shot at eating tonight He rushes over and easily wins the pot But Takasugi isn't far behind これだけは勘弁してくださいよ俺が小銭を取り上げないのはお情けだと思った Shinada has one last chance to eat that night He gets a call from local restaurateur Ushijima Don't worry, I don't think he's a celebrity cameo since he's portrayed pretty honestly He's pretty keyed in around town and had the lady running the batting center call when Shinada got some money Figures he can settle some of his tab in return for some soup But Takasugi happened In the diner are some Yakuza, and as mentioned, this is unusual for Kaneicho. Omi and Tojo died in mysterious accidents around here recently, so these lot are out and about on the hunt. There's also a strange masked man wandering around asking after somebody. The whole town is getting pretty weird lately. But really, all Shinada cares about is that he's starving. So, that's Shinada's evening. We're broke. We only start with a couple hundred yen to our name. Now, this lack of money may not last long in gameplay, but early on there are substories placed nearby with a monetary buy-in. And yeah, it put me in Shinada's place, if only in a small way, by not being able to access them. Plus, Shinada is far harder to play, yet you cannot buy health items until you get some money together. Sink or fucking swim. Welcome to Shinada's life. I even got KO'd by hosts. I lost in a random encounter. And then at home, Shinada runs into that mysterious figure. Huh. Something's familiar about this guy. When I was returning to 5 for this video, I barely remembered Tatsuo Shinada and I was ready to remember why. So I was surprised when I found myself absolutely loving his story. This is now my favorite part of the game by a large margin. At the last hurdle, Yakuza 5 introduces a new character, one without any baggage, and that seems to free the writing of its own baggage. Within a chapter, it has established a cast of unique characters, a city with a unique criminal situation, it raises mystery after mystery, the Nagoya family, Takasugi's connection to them. It does all of this while keeping the focus on the biggest question of the evening. What happened to Shinada? He still loves baseball, so what took him away from it? And all along, it's filled with little character beats giving you insight into the cast and their relationship. It recaptures a lot of what I loved about Yakuza 1 and 2's dialogue. The merging of emotion and exposition delivered in good time. Shinada's part is shorter than the last and admittedly less varied, but god does it do a lot more with what it has. My intent isn't to bash parts 2 and 3, this is all relative, and I'm gonna try and leave those behind after this because no doubt it's starting to get repetitive and I don't want you to think I hate those parts. It's just that this is a lot of what I feel they're lacking. The way they present details and build characters up is serviceable, but they're missing this flair. I find it especially jarring because they reintroduced Saijima and Akiyama as is. Plus, we've already seen Soten Bori. So, they have less to establish, but still seem to struggle to find their feet and use their time effectively. And based on parts 1 and 4, it's clear Yakuza 5 can still knock this stuff out of the park. Not to mention, Shinada is just unlike any prior protagonist. 
He's a horn dog for starters. He's a little less street smart and a bit more selfish. I love it when he runs into Tatsuya. Every other character is happy to help. When Shinada is told his pay will be advice... Yeah, he doesn't have time for that. I mean, he still does it, but <laughs> takes some arguing. There's a charming immaturity about him. His life is rough, but he's perpetually chipper, and he isn't as dumb as he lets on. People constantly underestimate him. He's toyed with, and I feel bad for the guy. I immediately want to know why he's lost his way, and I want to help him get it back. After a game of playing as legends, we're now going to play as someone who has denied their chance to stand amongst them. It's so much more human and personable, and it feels so unlike the rest of the game in a really good way. There is another way that Shinada is unlike the others. Earlier that night, someone drew a knife on him, and he panics. His instinct is to grab a weapon, and with that he finds a sturdy pipe, which will become a trusty companion on our journey. Shinada has a suite of unique weapon movesets and heat actions, even his weapon draws are attacks. You might think he'd be good with a bat, and you'd be right. He's very good. He'll never use it to harm another soul. He wouldn't besmirch baseball like that. Instead, he gets access to sturdy weapons, which will never break. With weapons in tow, Shinada's combat is actually pretty varied, and his movesets hit hard and hit fast. That said, the sturdy gear tends to be pretty weak, so we'll need something that hits a little bit harder. And luckily, Kamiyama has expanded his business nationwide. His workshop is a lot more manageable this time around. Rather than spending crafting ingredients for everything and needing to find recipes, you invest items once and can then buy what they unlock as much as you like. From then on, the only item requirements tend to be trading lower tier weapons for better ones, and mystery stones for the top shelf stuff. Plus, what you unlock carries over between cities. So by this point in the game, Shinada should have access to a very, very expensive and powerful set of weapons. Yeah, this system of combat luxury is encouraged the most for the poorest character. Still, weapons are easier to acquire. It's easier to track what you have to find to unlock new ones, and the introduction of repair kits makes their use far less restrictive. So I would break out the better gear, but I can't. Yakuza 5 undoes all of this good with weapon skill. I really put money into maiming people, but I won't be able to use any of this gear without a bunch of faffing around smacking people with sticks first. And weapon levels are tracked per character. I bought this stuff, but never got around to actually getting proficient enough to use any of it. So first you get materials, then you pay an exorbitant fee for a weapon, then you can't use it before you buy worse stuff first and just wander around town battering people. It's just too much. I paid for the gear. Saejima clearly can't even use swords, but the game lets him try. Weapon levels have actual upsides, increased damage and durability and so on. If it just did this without gating equipment, it would be a cool system that works in tandem with Kamiyama's improvements to encourage experimentation. As it is, it single-handedly overrides everything else. So I mostly just wound up using the sturdiest gear of all. Fists. Bit of a shame, but I had fun. The masked man tosses Shinada the ball from his one major league home run. The swing that cost him his dream. Shinada does not like being confronted by this one bit. The next morning, he's too upset to even be scared. Wrong guy. The masked man wants an answer. Will Shinada investigate why his career ended? It's made clear that Shinada has lived in some form of denial for the last 15 years. He didn't cheat, but he still hasn't recovered. The masked man breaks it down for us. If that home run was nothing special, why was Shinada blacklisted from the league the next day? Accused of sign stealing and match fixing. <laughs> Die. I mean, the masked man is offering 20 million in return for finding the truth. It's incredibly valuable to him. But this doesn't stir Shinada one bit. He is like Kiryu, a man who is living life after the dream. While neither are truly happy, Kiryu can at least content himself in that he succeeded in some way. Shinada's dream was stolen from him, and he has never recovered from it. He still loves the sport, he lives for the game, he's always going to be drawn to it. But he can't go back. When confronted by that home run, it's both the best moment of his life and by far the worst. We saw a day in his aimless life in chapter 1, and miserable as it was, he is loath to even try and turn that around. 
This whole game has featured dreams fulfilled or dreams being pursued, but now it finally asks, what about when the dream has gotten away from us? The first step to finding your feet may be to accept that it's gone, and Shinada isn't ready to do that. But Takasugi is willing to burn that hope on his behalf. You can... Oi, oi. Shinada is still unhappy. It's this or his fingers. But facing the past may be more painful than losing a pinky. There are no leads to go on. Only the fort that Shinada was set up. And even then, who stands to gain by framing a rookie? Takasugi wants to get right to it, but Shinada isn't quite ready to start digging. The man is in a funk until evening and has to drag himself out. I figure he's got to start with a bit of his past that's a bit more distant, something that hangs over him a little bit less, work his way up to the majors. And Shirakawa is here to do just that. The man is here to settle a 20 year grudge. These two played together in high school. In their second year, the team almost qualified for Koshien. But the match was a loss and Shirakawa holds Shinada responsible for all that and more. Shirakawa was the ace pitcher of West Kamuro High. The match came down to a pitcher's duel between him and Akamatsu, a beast of a kid who could pitch really fast fastballs. Shirakawa accuses Shinada of being a glory hound who refused to take a walk and kept trying to get a hit off the guy, leading to extra innings where Shirakawa blew out his shoulder. Shinada at least had his moment in the sun. For Shirakawa, the best he has is what ifs, and it has messed him up. Shinada says he really thought he could hit that shot but was too green. It wasn't arrogance, it was miscalculation. Well, Shirakawa's here to put that claim to the test. Bum shoulder or not, he has trained to recreate Akamatsu's pitch, and he drags us to the batting center to prove it. If we can hit this, then Shinada's claims are somehow true. Oh, oh hey, he's really fired up. We get 10 pitches to prove ourselves? I might need them. It takes a moment to get used to, but to represent where Shinada's talents lie, his baseball gameplay is entirely different from the others. His intimacy with the game comes through by having far more information given to the player. He has a sense of where the ball is going and when to swing, instead of the other characters who need to juggle accuracy and timing around somewhat vague animations. Shinada's baseball is a matter of prediction and timing, seeing the patterns in pitching and making hits. After some adjustment, this is far easier. Shinada can get home runs with incredible consistency. And we got RPG elements. His hit zones get bigger and his sense of where the ball is going gets sharper. With this, Yakuza 5 is 4 for 4. Every side story activity is simple but fun enough for their runtime. This is no small feat. This is the biggest game so far, but each game before it has had a bum note in this regard. At its worst, it's just fine, but manages to justify its time. And at its best, it's pretty damn fun. And I love the music, especially this track. Speaking as an Englishman describing a Japanese guy playing an American game, I feel like this track really captures the laid-back spirit of baseball. Plus, this is the happiest you'll hear Shinada. His love for baseball is really clear in this delivery. His joy is infectious. So we get our home run. And neither of the two are satisfied. That was nowhere near Akamatsu's level from back then. Despite Shinada's pleading, Shirakawa will not drop it. He'll figure out a way to make that pitch. P's in a pitch. I mean, pod. And in walks Kurosaki. Shinada ruined his life too. Granted, he was the guy hawking that fake bat, so I don't really feel too bad for him. Especially since after Shinada foiled his scam, he told Shirakawa where to find Shinada in the hopes that Shirakawa was out for blood, not batting. Disappointed that we're alive, he says he'll get revenge his own way later, and based on the minigame, I'm gonna guess that's a beanball. 
Outside, we run into yet another figure from Shinada's distant past, high school coach Igarashi. The man is an eccentric and a hard ass. But damn does he get results. Seeing the world in slow motion results. He gives us heat eye. Useful in case you don't even want to try. In one way, this side story might be the most mechanically involved. Not only is there a leveling system, but even a side story master owing to Igarashi. His training is, uh, a mixed bag. Just like the Miyagi he be, he makes us do random odds and ends to sharpen our baseball skills. Fishing, singing, fucking pool. I must have been having the worst luck. It took me an hour to win one game, and this is on medium difficulty. I do, however, enjoy his eating quests. He gives us a hint about what we need to eat, and it's on us to seek it out. Over the course of the game, food has been approached from many angles, so ending on a quiz like this is pretty cool. Nagoya's prized food lies in its chicken, so we have to try three unique chicken joints about town. Not sure if this still counts as healthy training when washed down with a mug of wine, but hey, some studies say that might be good for you. I mean, this is a health food, basically. Igarashi raises our stats and opens up more shops because this mode also has purchasable equipment to further offset the booze. I'm sure Takasugi would be glad to know about my new set of neural gloves and top-of-the-line crimson bat. That's not even mentioning the cleats. And, uh, oh yeah, because I've never mentioned it. We can shop through our phones now. Whatever will they think of next. So, at the batting center board, we get a series of missions and side missions. I guess these would be side side stories. Let's start with those. They're mostly a series of multi-part vignettes about baseball hopefuls and fanatics who Shinada shares his experiences with. From a kid whose talent is risking his still developing shoulder, to a man who has to accept that he's not pro-material and needs to be humbled back to a normal life. All that and more, a series of arrogant amateurs and up-and-coming rookies. The writing is often charming and many of the characters likeable. An eagerness for the sport and the passion it inspires goes beyond just Shinada. It radiates from the whole cast and the stories presented. To expand on that pro-hopeful, this is the other end of dreams, where they can blind you to what you're capable of. I'm of the opinion that if you're not hurting others, you should pursue the life you want. But sometimes hopes can outpace your ability. Settling for less is horrible in its own way. There's no nice way to tell someone that what they want is out of their reach. Some people may be happier in their futile pursuit. Is it right to trip them up? Yakuza 5 takes the stance that sometimes you have to get people to see the truth. Shinada can't get this guy to face reality gently. It takes a few solid knocks to his ego, but Shinada will deliver them. And speaking of knocks, these side stories also get you your other sturdy weapons, so they're also materially worth the time. Yeah, I helped your brother. Give me the knife. <laughs> Back to the main story, it's pretty good. Shirakawa and Kurosaki keep messing with Shinada from a distance, in really childish ways, dragging innocent bystanders into their absurd baseball grudge and testing Shinada's skills, morals, and patience. They get Asada, another former wyvern turned sports journalist, to come and interview the One Day Pro, aware this will rattle his cage. Shinada wants nothing to do with the ragman, so he promises he'll drop the interview if Shinada can home run 5 out of 10 of his pitches. And whoops! Shinada, you just gave him way more than an interview could ever say. This moment with Asada is a key insight into Shinada that you can get pretty early by pursuing the side story. This is also why Shinada is scared to face his past. He has lived in a vague, seemingly unfulfillable hope that one day he will have the dream again. To investigate may show that it's impossible. Not investigating and living in ignorance is the last bit of hope he has left. It keeps him training, it keeps him going, but it's stagnant. It means he'll live in the past forever, but would never have faced it if his past didn't come seeking him out. I have mixed feelings about this. The story slowly teases this aspect of Shinada out over the course of the mystery, and it culminates in some really powerful beats. Asada just spells it out. Shinada isn't happy to hear it, and I guess neither am I. Every prior side story is focused on other aspects of the leads, while using their cast to parallel the hero's journey with its own spin, not to spell out a message that hasn't been delivered yet. They are slightly spoilery if you know their parallels, but they're often not so direct. 
The story does quickly recover by seeing off Kurosaki. He finally challenges Shinada to a showdown and luckily there are no beanballs. He feels that he wasted his youth on a game that didn't pan out for him and is bitter that Shinada still loves it. After an at-bat with the man, Shinada realizes Kurosaki must still love baseball to have stayed so practiced. So he tells him to stop lying to himself and hiding the pain, which we know full well Shinada is doing. This is a good moment somewhat sullied by the fact that Akagi has played the story's hand. This just leaves Shirakawa, and he's got an ace up his other sleeve. If one shoulder is busted, he'll just switch. Man, West Camaro High had some dodgy kids. He throws some fucking monstrous pitches. But honestly, by now, the slower balls are the harder ones to hit. I've never been so hyped for baseball. This swing can't fix Shurikawa's shoulder but it can take some weight off of it. The man is humble. He admits that Shinada is the real deal, and honestly, he knew it all along. But after the home run allegations, it was easier to blame Shinada for what he lost than face up to his own mistakes. He accused Shinada of the pride that he himself carried, the pride that made him hide his injured shoulder until it was too late. And he thinks he realizes something. <laughs> this jokey little exchange hits so much harder than any other side story's more grandiose speeches. These two both lost their shot. At least now one doesn't hold the other to blame for it. He can return to what life he's built for himself and live it a lot easier, the past no longer holding him back. For Shinada though, well, he still needs one more push, and it will come from someone who often gives him a pull. Shinada catches wind that his former manager in the Wyverns, Fujita, has gone over to the Tokyo Gigants, Sawada's team. This is complicated. Fujita stepped down after the allegations. Not banned from the league, but his name was in tatters. So when Shinada hears a couple of angered fans watching, he reflexively defends the man. <laughs> And this gets him a beating he doesn't resist. In fact, he blames himself for getting carried away. That's when he gets a call from Milky. There's leftover cake from their Christmas event, and she asks him to swing by. And it may surprise you, but this leads to my favorite scene in the entire game. Up on the roof of Futomomo, Shinada and Milky talk. There's a lot on Shinada's mind, so he asks Milky if she has any regrets. A life in the sex industry has left her with more things she'd sooner forget. But the two remember the night Shinada arrived at her doors. New in town and more alone than he's ever been, she just held him for an hour without saying a word. ね。
なれるさ絶対なれるって別の自分でも俺は何になろうあーそうだな<笑><笑>はい、フリーで四十分。はい、今すぐおります。And that's my favorite moment. There's such a warmth to it. This is the positive power of dreams. These two sorrowful people can, for a moment, find such genuine joy just indulging in this fantasy. They know it's not real. They know they're going nowhere, but they're also far, far away from this rooftop. Milky can see herself as a schoolteacher, but Shinada struggles to think of himself as anyone else. Because he knows what he wants to be, and knows that version of himself has long since been taken away. There's such a complex set of emotions at play, and then. <laughs> it's ripped away from them. Still, it may have just been a moment. But it made them both happy. It reignites Shinada, and I think this, more than anything else, is what lets him start figuring things out. And as this scene comes to a close, we see Takasugi. And I can't help but think in how many other stories he would ruin the moment, punish Shinada for daring to dream, for even thinking of running away. If not now, then later. But this is actually where he begins to treat Shinada with more kindness. It was easy for him to bully Shinada, to push him around and make threats, because Shinada seemed hopeless, an upbeat robot going through the motions, merely existing. Now Takasugi can see that he still has life in him. It's harder for him to be cruel when there's hope to actually stomp out. Shinada wins him over without even realizing it. There are two scenes in Yakuza 5 that can make me well up a bit. There's the post credits scene, and there's this one. Yakuza 5 has some stretches of really clunky storytelling, but when it hits, it hits hard. This is such a short scene, but I think it says just as much about dreams as anything else. But there's no shame in finding strength in them, even when life is at its harshest, even when you know they won't happen. Shinada's about to walk down one of the darkest roads of his life. Why shouldn't he find some light first? We have yet one more stop before then. On the way home, he sees an odd sight a man in old fashioned noble get up getting laughed at by a couple of lads. The Prince of Pompous is asking for it, calling these two peasants. It's about to come to blows when. Oh dear, he's forgotten his weapons. Ah,、oh, we've all been there. Shinada's dragged into saving him. And well, it's regrettable. The two get to talking. This is Leo Ayana Koji. He has noble heritage, and God, he will not let you forget it. He also has no girlfriend and no idea how to get one, an insecurity Shinada quickly picks up on. So the two come to an arrangement. Shinada will give him dating advice, and a Yanokoji will teach us new moves. He gets a lesson, and then we get one. It's a really nice dynamic. Solving his girl problems basically means. fixing him. All of it. We steadily undress him of his rough personality and his clothes. He steadily becomes less of an arse. And by finding an actual thing to be proud of outside of the circumstances of his birth, he winds up humbling a fair bit. Him and Shinada play off of each other well a stuffy aristocrat versus a laid back smut writer. Ayana Koji's insults aggravate Shinada but ultimately slide off of him since, well, he's by far and away the mature one in this dynamic. Not to mention far too easy going to really be bothered by anything the brat can say. Just to throw this in, there's a portion of the game where the overworld music gets overridden by this really tense track. I decided to do one of his dating advice lessons here, and well, it really changes the mood of the scene. It's like Shinada has a sniper pointed at him. I kind of wish I did all of the training like this. As for his combat lessons. They're hard, and I really did have to break out weapons and play carefully to bring him down. It wasn't always fun, but these battles felt earned. They are really about spacing. Also, for a stuffy nerd bastard. God damn, did Ayana Koji get the best master theme?
techno to bring this guy into the modern age. Keep the battles long so I can keep hearing it. By the end, Leo has a girlfriend and a new lease on life, and Shinada has a bunch of new moves. Not terribly interesting moves, but at least the journey to getting them was. The next morning, Shinada's in a better mood, ready and raring to find the truth. So, the two go over the mystery and we get a little bit more. Shinada, a fresh face no name just signed to the Nagoya Wyverns, was called in to pinch hit against Tokyo Gigant's ace pitcher Sawada. He fouled off the man's curveballs, but on the seventh pitch he read an incoming fastball and sent it flying. He was accused of sign stealing. A man came forward claiming Shinada paid him off to get the Gigant's hand signals, allowing Shinada to know whatever the pitcher would throw. Now, a batter is expected to figure out an opponent's hand signals, but getting them beforehand, that's underhanded. Shinada chased this guy down, but he clammed up and disappeared soon after, and Shinada pretty much gave up after that. The police were brought in because this also came with accusations of match fixing. Apparently backdoor betting was going on and Shinada had a big juicy bet on himself. Takasugi thinks this whole thing wasn't a personal attack on Shinada, but a scheme to destroy the Wyverns. If that was the case, it wasn't a great success. All it did was take out our guy and manager Fujita. Despite Takasugi thinking he didn't do much for the guy, Shinada feels he owes a lot to Fujita. <laughs> He was the man who discovered and brought him into the big leagues and coached him personally. So now Shinada's thinking maybe he was used to attack his mentor. This is as far as they can get alone but they do have a single solitary lead, a massage therapist who left the team around the same time Shinada got banned. Uno. They stop by his acupuncture clinic and the man isn't in. Shinada knows he'll be out touring the massage parlors, and since he's a special kind of twisted, he'll be at places with newcomers. And since he's strapped for cash, all he'll be doing is looking at pictures, which means he's not coming. Back anytime soon. Fuss begins the Uno pervert hunt as Shinada and Takasugi rough it over town trying to find the greasy old bastard. I really love this section. Shinada and Takasugi bond over the course of this light-hearted little adventure. The dialogue is fun and frivolous and sends you about town in a really fun way. It gives Kinicho and its sleaze time in the spotlight. This also lets Shinada and Takasugi play off of each other, mostly by taking the piss out of Uno. Well, Takasugi isn't having fun, but I am. This part also does something that's pretty surprising. <laughs> Running about town seems a lot more dangerous all of a sudden. This is really cool. The gameplay lets us know before the story spells it out that we're looking into something that somebody wants to keep hidden. Those mysterious accidents which befell the Yakuza? Turns out we're treading on that same thin ice. While this section of the story is light, this makes you keep in mind that we're treading into danger. It's not often the free roaming map is used to reinforce the story. In the past it's been a mixed bag, but this could really take you by surprise and it doesn't slow things down at all. They eventually find Uno, and while he's kinda apprehensive to work with Takasugi, a little trickery goes a long way. I love the image of him dashing for that chair to make an entrance. Takasugi's got a flair for the dramatic. It turns out that in all this time, Shinada's never had it in him to talk with Uno about leaving the team. <laughs> Around the same time he was fired, Uno was let go over the phone. 
He too can't think of anyone who'd profit from it. According to him, even the Yakuza lost out. In the wake of the match-fixing scandal, the most lucrative business in town dried up and starved the clans out of Nagoya. So that seems like a bust. Luckily, Shinada forgot his phone. This jogs Uno's memory. Just before he got canned, another batter for the team, Manabe, similarly left his mobile behind after a massage. When Uno went to return it, the man went ballistic, demanding to know if Uno looked at his texts. Uno was dropped from the team shortly after. Well, that's suspicious. And lucky for us, Manabe is still a man about town. He swapped one plate for another and now runs a Yakiniku joint nearby. Hopefully he can tell us something a little meatier. He'd rather Shinada gets the hell out. Luckily, Takasugi knows how to get people talking. Pretty suspect. But Manabe backs down and asks what Shinada wants to know. Unfortunately, the team wasn't clean. The starting lineup was all getting sent shady instructions. Those who disobeyed were shuffled off. Takasugi judges the guy, and honestly, Manabe seems a little disgusted with himself, but justifies it by saying that's how baseball is. It's like meat. What's presented looks good, but no one should see how the sausage is made. Obviously, Shinada isn't satisfied with that explanation. Takasugi asked if Manabe could come forward now that the Statue of Limitations is up. Well, someone else tried, and now they're dead. <laughs> All the criminal shenanigans came to a stop after Shinada left. <laughs> Customers come in, so we gotta go. This part is fantastic. It just slowly turns up the pressure, and cracks are starting to form in our trio. As back at Uno's clinic, the three piece something together. The Tojo and Omi may have lost out in the match-fixing crackdown, but the Nagoya family prospered. With the bigger clans out of the picture, they alone had the city, and they've ran it from the shadows ever since. Uno is still terrified of them and tells Shinada he should walk away. Shinada, ignoring that, asks Takasugi for an introduction, and the man has clammed up. Uno and Takasugi are at each other's throats. Shinada's trying to keep them together, and then... We give chase across town. And we're led into an ambush. Gonna say it, whoever our would-be killers are, They're fucking bad at it. And Shinada, with his heat eye, managed to spot the killer, his former Wyvern's teammate Sakai. He takes us aside and goes on a speech about how the most noble move in baseball is the sacrifice fly, then apologizes as he attempts a few high speed accidents. <laughs> But when we put him down, he gives us a bit more to go on. Fuss ends chapter 2. 
It's a really good, really varied chapter, with a nice mix of gameplay and story, using just a few QTEs to bolster the growing tension. And that tension is really well managed. Shinada's emotional high comes to a head on the roof, and what starts as a light-hearted pervert romp with a hint of danger slowly reveals Shinada to be in the crosshairs of a dangerous, but clumsy, criminal organization. As mentioned earlier, Shinada and Kiryu are both people living life after the dream. Both want to go back, both want to hide who they are, but Kiryu sacrificed himself, Shinada was sacrificed by others. Most of these people don't seem to be evil. They thought they were protecting their town, but their own lives are now ones of paranoia. They can't enjoy what they gained. Their own dreams were bargained away as smokescreens for the Nagoya family's plot. It was metaphorically destroying them. And now that Shinada's here to learn the truth, it's becoming a lot more literal. The plot is collapsing under the weight of one man. I'm gonna speed up a bit this chapter, since I won't be the only one doing that. We flash back to that fateful day in 97. Shinada signs a baseball for his first ever fan. The good times are already over, as the police drag Shinada away. In an interrogation cell, we see their evidence. A man in a jacket met a bloke. Compelling stuff. We then learn that Shinada has been collating pitching data ever since. The patterns confirm what others have said. The two think this goes beyond baseball, so they decide to ask Ushijima. Unfortunately, the man is pro Nagoya family. Before they turned up, the Tojo and Omi used to cause chaos in the streets. At least these guys are nice and quiet. Sure. Shinada gets a call. Milky's brother has been kidnapped. And so has she, as we run to catch a cab to the docks, better known as... Oh god, they got Uno too? Takasugi says he'll get an ambulance and catch up to us. So Shinada heads off alone. He finds Milky bound and gagged. Milky-san! See, Kanai? That's how you do it. Shinada is betrayed. It turns out the shadowy Nagoya family is made up of ordinary citizens. Milky and Ushijima are amongst them. I adore this reveal. Considering I first played these games years ago, I can't honestly say whether or not I saw it coming, but I think it's well foreshadowed, and it's an incredibly unique setup for the series. The twist that a collective of civilians propped up a big scary organization to eject the big families and then establish themselves, running the underworld from the shadows. It's really cool. Fun fact, you will never fight Yakuza on the streets of Kinecho. It's also an incredibly cruel twist for Shinada, who has a real love for these people. Even with the realization they were involved in him losing his dream right in his face, he refuses to believe they're capable of the evil he has seen. And that faith in them, along with Kubota's impatience, may be what saves his life. <laughs> yeah, remember Kubota, the guy from the tutorial? I didn't. He tries to take over the execution. <laughs> Ah, you hesitated. What a fucking hero. Now freed, Shinada buys time for Takasugi to escape. I didn't know this on my first time through because I did not notice most of the mid-fight dialogue. This begins Shinada's extended battle. It's a whopper. Took me 15 minutes of non-stop fighting and running. I'm still following my rule of only using health items I find in stages, and despite having two health bars, yeah, I'm needing them. Kubota grabs the forklift and gives chase. Now, you may think this forklift is weirdly fast. I mean, maybe not. On the PlayStation 3, Yakuza's Kenzan to Zero ran at 30 FPS, and a few gameplay systems were tied to the frame rate. Luckily, this only affects a small handful of systems in small ways. Things like dodging, for instance, have double the distance, which isn't that crazy. 
Well, this forklift speed is similarly tied to the frame rate, making it twice as fast as it should be. This video took so long that now every mainline entry is on PC. I was really hoping the frame rate would be uncapped. I wanted to see how fast we could make this forklift. Sadly, this does seem to be its limit. I mentioned in Akiyama's section that Yakuza 5's scale was starting to turn against it. This gauntlet does throw a lot of enemies at us, but tends to scale back a little for Shinada's sake. For the most part, they come in waves. Plus, we got Takasugi here to run distraction for us. Kubota makes up for his absence by getting three consecutive boss fights. And yet, he still isn't memorable. And so Shinada has done it. He's joined the ranks of our other protagonists and has beaten down an entire Yakuza family. Must feel pretty good. Oh yeah, he kind of liked those people. Hurt and betrayed. Shinada just wants to get out of here. Takasugi says he can't go with the truth dangling within arm's reach. But Shinada doesn't want it anymore. Not if it means someone else he cares about might be involved. He still isn't like the others. He's not emotionally cut out to be in a situation this harsh, not used to this level of suspicion. It's nearly broken him. ただ I've been letting a lot of dialogue run for this part, I just like these characters so much. Their dynamic shifts so well over the course of all this. The masked man got the ball from Takasugi. All the loan shark had to do was ensure Shinada took the job. Kubota's phone rings. Shinada runs to grab it, but Manabe makes the steal. Manabe admits he didn't think Shinada would give up the hunt. Shinada had one last member of the Nagoya to put down. Um, sure. Shinada tells a doubtful Takasugi that a batter of Manabe's caliber can always tell what's coming next. He came here knowing he'd lose, knowing Shinada would kick the entire family's asses after escaping capture and defeat him even after he broke out the knife. Shinada demands to know who's pulling the strings. So Manabe makes a call and gives Shinada his answer. It was the man who brought Shinada into the big leagues, who had shown him such kindness, whose career was seemingly sacrificed alongside his. Wyvern manager, Fujita. The next morning, we see the man plotting, arranging a big trade. Meanwhile, Shinada is... disoriented. But he realizes he should probably tell the masked man what's up. He says he'll swing by, and Shinada decides, eh, he's got time to stretch his legs. You get one block from your door and he rings up asking where the hell you went. This interaction is really funny to me. Shinada is definitely rattled from last night. It's such an awkward moment. Yakuza 5, perhaps more than any other entry in the series, will preface and end story beats with, Okay, free time now! It so often feels crowbarred in, and this example of it is my favourite. It just makes Shinada look so daft. But hey, we're already outside. Let's go do sub-stories. You think I care about leaving that guy hanging? It's Daigo. He left the story hanging for two whole parts. Let's start with an odd one. A club manager lets Shinada know there's a well-paying secretary job going. 
The details are vague, and no matter how strange our hastily thrown together resume is, Shinoda's brought in for an interview. He aces it, and it looks like the job is his. But there's been a bit of a misunderstanding. It's an obvious bit. It knows the audience has seen gags like this, so the comedy lies more in winking and nudging the audience, seeing the characters talk past each other until the boss turns up in a loincloth and a tussle breaks out, and not the kind he wanted. What is interesting is that this substory features an entirely unique battle track. This is Vendor Pop by Skankfunk, better known as Hideki Naganuma, composer of the Jet Set Radio and Sonic Rush series, among many other things. It's nice to have him turn up. It definitely makes this scenario a lot more memorable. His track works well as part of the punchline to this small comedy of errors. This song was actually composed for Super Monkey Ball, an earlier Nagoshi-headed game. It's wild how I've been talking about Yakuza 5 for several hours now, and can still pull out interesting little odds and ends like this. There's just so much here. Shinada gets the best puzzle in the game, trying to arrange an editor's passion project into a legible story from scrambled notes. This one took me a while and was a really inventive little distraction. There are a few puzzles here actually, from maths and memorization puzzles during our stint as a store clerk, to what is actually the worst puzzle in the game, and it's similar to one I like. The funniest part of this quest is in how absurdly contrived the setup is and how the game knows it. Himoji here is starving, and will refuse to eat anything not purchased with his lucky coin. However, what we buy must be a Nagoya specialty that is as close to 500 yen as possible. Yeah, this whole setup is a stretch, but I respect the balls of it. A greater focus on puzzles like this does do well to capture Shinada's more mundane, but in a way, much more difficult life. He's had to scrape by on very little for years, and one wrong move could have had him like Himoji. We know he's gone days without food. We also get to play the sleazy paparazzo that Haruka was working to avoid. Don't worry, this guy has it coming. Shinada's substories have a lot less focus than other characters, juggling his money troubles, his love of baseball, and the town's facilitation of and his role in the sex industry. There's a lot to work with and no easy way to sum it all up. A big part of the benefit of substories for other characters is in that besides being fun diversions, they take these larger than life characters and bring them down to earth, putting them in relatively mundane situations which funnily enough tend to be out of their depth, which funnier still winds up lending them some. Shinada doesn't really need that, he's already plenty down to earth. So a few of these substories take the opposite tack and heighten his character a little, putting him in situations which play to his goofier side or otherwise make him more heroic. This mostly comes with him helping girls in the sex industry. The stance the game takes is that there isn't shame in finding work within it, but there are definitely those who'll try to make you feel that way. It's also fraught with danger if you don't know what you're doing, and it's scarily difficult to find out the right things to do. Precious few enjoy the job free of pitfalls. I'd say this makes for a better exploration than the idol industry gets. It at least outlines a somewhat nuanced view, and it presents the downsides without rationalizing them as something that should just be put up with. When an underage girl trying to pay off her dad's medical debts is turned away from a club, she doesn't listen when Shinada says this is not a world she is in any way prepared for. He worries his words sound hypocritical coming from a smut journalist. That's when we learn some gangster types have arranged a gig for her. And this does lead to a speech that is probably Shinada at his most courageous. Shinada is probably one of the most fascinating characters in the series for this alone. While he's involved in far sleazier work than anyone else and is a goofball, he knows the business and knows what it can do to people. How sharp he is can be hard to spot under his usual upbeat persona and self-doubt, but it's always there. Let's move away from the sex industry and talk about Cox. Shinada saves a man from losing his, then wonders how good it must taste. But perish the thought! This prize Cochin is far too valuable for that. It has another calling. Shinada is given a bird and welcomed into the Cochin Cup Classic. He's promised that a strong bird can make him millions. It won't, and even if it could, I wouldn't bother. 
This game is a turkey. It's a creature raising racing game. You're given a starter cochin and can find a couple more out in the world. Not that you really need to vary up builds or anything, but it's nice to have more hens. There's a set of trainers you can send your bird to, and their payment is interesting. The quality of their service is dependent on the items you give them. If I could use stuff from the item box, I wouldn't mind this too much. But having to hawk it back and forth across town time and again to make my bird race viable was tedious and costly. I'm meant to be making money, but my profits are paltry. You raise stats, enter a race, and hope for the best. I kind of wish this game had weight divisions, because then we could have some real bantam weights. Eventually, your first generation Cochin won't be quite up to the task and will need to duck out. So you pick a partner and selective breed your way to higher stat caps. And this means more running back and forth across town to get them back up to chicken scratch. This is by far my least favourite town activity, and it takes by far the longest to complete. Now, that's only two hours when I total it up, but that was two hours of absolutely minimal and miserable interactivity. This is done for completion. Not for fun, not for cash to spend elsewhere in the game. This is the only activity that I would describe purely as foul. And unless I was possessed and had to 100% Yakuza 5, I would not touch it again. Okay, I'm not actually that upset about this. I mean, think about it. This is the first minigame I'd call a total cock-up. Even if I don't like the comedy minigame, it had a cool idea at its base that got me thinking. It took this long for a game that I just outright didn't care for, and one bad egg hardly ruins this batch. So, um, what else is there? Uh, the locker keys are now tickets for a lottery. It's slow and boring and the item pool sucks, but you only need to mess with it if you're really into crafting. <laughs> Okay, um, what did, I had something to do. I feel like I had something to do. Oh yeah, Daigo! Osoizo. Tell it to the Tojo. Shinada tells Daigo everything that happened. The Nagoya family was a front meant to keep real Yakuza out of town, captained by Fujita. And its members, led by Ushijima and Milky, elected to turn themselves in this morning. They're done, but Shinada isn't. He still refuses to believe any of them are capable of murder, so he will not rest until he's found the real mastermind. This is when Daigo says that all of this backs up a suspicion he had, a man he knows has to be involved. He gives Shinada his pay and sets off to confirm something with Fujita. Hearing that name, Shinada says he's coming along to get his own answers. And then Daigo reveals that he's Daigo. Shinada runs for his yearbook, but he's told not to bother. Daigo's picture won't be in there. In their third year of high school, the team once again made it to the finals to qualify for Koshien. They were to play Kamaro Tech, but a gang from the school tried to threaten Kamaro West's players into forfeiting, so Daigo went and beat all of them up. This landed him in juvie, but thanks to him, the match went ahead without interference. That's Sawada from the intro? Man, you guys have a history. Shinada asks why Daigo risked so much for the team, and while he has been missing for a few years, he is hip to the theme. Daigo says that the dream making it to Koshin was the entire school's dream that summer. Back then, Daigo had no dream of his own, but saw value in protecting their dream. Knowing that a life in the Yakuza awaited him anyway, he decided it was more important that they get to Koshien than him getting to graduation. You're the opium of the people, Shinada. Kōshin 
So, Daigo's been doing well. Yakuza 5 makes me like him a lot more. Even if I'm not entirely sure this is a great use of his time considering the whole looming war and traitor in the clan thing, I suppose he trusts Madarami and Kiryu will have that well in hand. But then he says precisely the wrong thing. That comment of giving his dream back to him, turning back 15 years, good intentions just like the Nagoya had. Shinada is about to get really, really determined. And it's so fucking good. This is your fault, Daigo. Fugger the Game Award goes to the sixth chairman. Congrats, Daigo. You've earned it. He tries to placate Shinada, but the man has just realized his entire life has been controlled. Anything less than wrestling it back himself wouldn't be worth it. Let's see how that lost time looks. Oh my is right. He's built like a tank. Okay, get ready for the music to kick in. God, this scene is so sick. Okay, awesome. Shirtless fight on a rooftop. I'm only 78 hours in. 18 if we're only counting the story. And it goes to Shinada. The least Yakuza Yakuza protagonist going. But hey, he earned it. This is a great fight. Largely, again, because of what's going on under the surface and in our ears. The boss track is an amazing remix of Shinada's theme that removes all of the sillier elements to let us know that Shinada has gotten serious. Right now, he has his eyes on the prize and nothing will stand in his way. I wish Daigo had more health so I could spend longer listening to it. But then, Shinada must have taken off a couple life bars before the battle began. You won't find this song on the soundtrack since, well, it's actually a replacement. In the Japanese version, this fight is considered important enough to have a licensed track. Wild Romance by Kyosuke Himuro. For safety's sake, I won't be playing it, but I will link to a music video which has the track translated by Damaki and covers Shinada's part. I love the video, it captures Shinada's journey so well. The lyrics are also more or less perfect, not just for the fight alone, but the journey so far. I mean, they are perfect for this fight if you want to make it way more homoerotic, which, well, it's a Yakuza game, so you can't really go wrong there. A common motif of this part has been lying to oneself. Shinada told Shirakawa to accept the truth of his life long before he could face his own. How Shinada's last genuine happy moment has had him locked in time for 15 years, training for a day that he'd never actually taken a step towards until he was forced to. Shinada is probably the most complex character present, and it's in the guise of an upbeat idiot. I mean, he is an upbeat idiot, but you know, he's a complex one. He's also the most grounded character, because the thing is, while the specifics of his dream are extraordinary, the general idea is by far the most relatable. Most everyone has a complex and contradictory want and fear of their dream. 
Few of us will share Shinada's loss, but I'm gonna bet most of us have shared his want. Risking comfort can be just as terrifying as settling for mundanity. It may take extraordinary circumstances, but it's better to confront what may be than to waste away, only putting forward the effort that isn't scary, that only serves to let yourself say, it might happen one day. It's also a great penultimate part since it wraps back around and acts as a parallel to Kiryu's story. Two Tokyo men hiding from their past, only to be pulled into the open by Daigo, begin to slowly learn their identity has never quite been hidden. Then their run-ins with a local crime family lead to them confronting the Tojo. Both want to set the record straight, clean up their identity. And it's just such a neat way to tie it up. Like Kiryu took back control of his identity fighting the clan, Shinada is fighting for control over his own life. And it's against the guy who was in charge of all of those men. At the start of this part, I'm thinking about how it's interrupting the absolutely non-existent flow. By now I'm thinking, god damn, this was perfect. Where the hell did this come from? I'm stuck between thinking that man, I'd cut Saijima for twice as much Shinada, and then realizing this was just the perfect length. It hit all the notes it needed to in such good time. So Shinada brings down Daigo, and the two will set off to face Fujita together. It's good to see he's back to himself. Yep, he's even retreating into himself. And as he burrows into his paper, he realizes something. Shinada tells Daigo to go on ahead and darts off the train. Takasugi, meanwhile, comes to collect. At the Wyvern Stadium, Sawada lies in wait. The two reflect on how strange their lives have been. Sawada, a Nagoya native, wound up getting recruited to Tokyo after his victory at Koshien. Meanwhile, Shinada, a Tokyo boy, wound up being sacrificed for Nagoya after one at bat for the Wyverns, the eternal underdogs. Fifteen years ago, Sawada made a promise to Fujita that upon the manager's return to baseball, Sawada would return to Nagoya and take over the family. Shinada tells him that they're finished, which he already knows. He's here for one last job. <laughs> The ones who turned themselves in were let free. The family is controlled from way up on high, so Shinada demands to know who's pulling the strings, and he's pointed to Sawada's Omi handlers sat in the dugout. This is a cruel twist. These people who thought they had defended their town from outsiders were all along being puppeted by the Kuraha family of the Omi Alliance. An internal schism within the clan led to the Kuraha forming the family so that they could hold the entirety of Nagoya from themselves, without the rest of the Omi even knowing. Just like Shinada, the entire town has been dancing to the Yakuza's tune. Even the Yakuza were dancing to the Yakuza's tune. This twist goes all the way to the top. Sawada himself says he's no batting genius. He sold out to the Omi in high school. They orchestrated his winning streak through Koshien, made him a top pick for a big team. With an ace pitcher like him indebted to the Yakuza, along with a bought manager in Fujita, match fixing would be a walk in the ballpark. There was just one hiccup in the plan. Daigo saving Shinada's team. For Sawada, his battle with Shinada was the one honest match he had to play, and he managed to hold him off. So, sir. This sounds odd, like history would nearly repeat itself. The topic turns to their one Major League face-off, the second misstep in the plan. The Wyverns were meant to lose 1-0, but the Gigant's batters hadn't scored a single run and the game was approaching its end. 
So Fujita brought out Shinada to face Sawada, the one man who was totally innocent to what's going on, but they knew he couldn't hit his curveballs. The plan now lay in extra innings, but there's a wrinkle in that plan. Sawada says it was Fujita's command, but before he can explain, you only tell him he's gone on long enough. Strike one. Good test. So the two make a deal. They make it out of this alive, they'll answer each other's questions. The battle ends with the eternal rivals teaming up to save baseball. Shinada beating up the Yakuza on the diamond is about as on the nose as this story gets, and hey, I'm not complaining. Now it's not just about Shinada, we're taking back control for Nagoya as well. <laughs> Didn't catch that. <laughs> hey, let's have Shinada try pitching. Out of the park. And so, at long last, sports beats crime. And as they lay amongst the sprawled out bodies of the Kuraha, Sawada answers why he threw that fastball. Fujita had long been racked by guilt. He hated that Sawada's talent had been wasted as a whipping boy for the Yakuza. He knows that the man can beat Shinada with his curveballs. But what Fujita wanted was real baseball. He asked Sawada to make that pitch so that before his career ended, he could see the sport he loved one last time. Sawada wants the answer to his question elsewhere, but Shinada can only give his answer here, on the diamond. So he starts clearing bodies. The two get ready to settle it, because for Shinada, this is his real final boss. The duel kicks off, and once again Shinada is just fouling balls, but his senses are sharper than ever. <gasps> and then they're back in that moment 15 years ago, and he doesn't throw a fastball. No matter how glorious that moment was all those years ago, for Shinada, it was meant to just be the next step in their rivalry. He spent high school trying to figure out Sawada's fastball, and he did it, but he could never hit those curves. Not until now. How the fuck do you make a character this lovable? <laughs> and thus ends the story of the greatest chuckle fuck to ever walk the earth. Well, sort of, he's still in the finale, but we'll get there. That was a damn good story. It's well paced, it's endlessly charming. It's my favorite exploration of dreams and identity in the game. It doesn't waste one moment of its runtime, and Shinada has three climactic battles back to back, each of them resolving a different aspect of his character. Each of them earn their place and give us key little insights into Shinada as he grows more and more at peace with his past. 
It feels so strange to me that it's when Yakuza 5 is trying to be Yakuza, it's often strange, cloying, a bit too much. But when it comes down to Earth, toys with a new kind of character or reframes an old one, that freedom and fresh perspective lets them nail what they struggle to do when it's trying too hard. Tell a high energy, dynamic, and sort of complex character story, albeit one that wears its heart on its sleeve. Take Sawada. He has been in this story from the start, but he was only really introduced 20 minutes ago. But thanks to what came before and how the two talk, I felt their rivalry right away. I buy how meaningful it is to both of them. It's one last confirmation of his love of the game, of the fact he never gives up. It was never enough that his home run was the best moment of his life, because also on his mind was the fact that he couldn't hit one of Sawada's cursed curveballs, and he knew he'd have to fix that. Well, first he had to hit the curveball life had thrown at him, but all along, he was waiting on Sawada's. Okay, so now that Yakuza 5 is done, bases are loaded and we got ourselves a cleanup hitter. It can finally bring it on home. We're now approaching the end of one of the most jam-packed activity centers of a game I've ever seen. To cover Yakuza 5 in the way I have is admittedly not clever or efficient. To try to get you to see how big this game is, by making the biggest goddamn video I ever will, to express its scale in literal form. But I hope I have so far successfully made it a fun and interesting journey that captures Yakuza 5's breadth of activity and tone. It has had its ups and downs, and this lead up to the finale will be just as bumpy. The opening scene is sadly a little weak, though it's a problem only really apparent in retrospect. We open in Fujita's office. He's written up a confession saying that a lot of trouble could have been avoided if he just took this route from the get-go. He's killed. His letter goes up in flames. A gun is planted in his hand and an Omi pin on the floor. Despite being the opening note of the introduction, this is a tiny mystery in the grand scheme of things, not largely relevant to where things are going. That's not my real problem. Where this winds up feeling hollow is in how we never get Shinada's thoughts on this. We never even learn if he learns Fujita has died. This man was incredibly important to him. Their meeting was a pivotal part of Shinada's going to Tokyo. But Shinada and many other characters feel different here. And it's very strange. Bases are loaded, the cleanup hitter is here, and he's gonna foul off a few pitches. This is the first problem the pre-finale runs into. It can't make room for everyone and everything at the table. And I don't expect it to try, but things have changed, and many of these changes are strange and unannounced. Character beats promised earlier go unremarked upon. Motivations suddenly change, and strange new perspectives are bolted onto old characters. What happened to Fujita was less an advancement of the mystery, and more an immediate culling from it. RSVP revoked. Over the course of this video... series... I have had a character counter for everyone outside of substories. If they had ongoing relevance of any sort, I tried to remember to jot them down. Yakuza 5 has a cast over 60 strong. That's an insane number to keep track of. Luckily, you don't need to chart all of them. I mean, hey, we're one down already. So if I cull all but the characters who have a lasting, meaningful, and dynamic role in the main plot, one which has to be followed over time and affects other characters, that leaves me with... 30. That's still more people than I actually know. But then, owing to that wonderful theme of identity, most of them are hiding who they truly are, so uh, we're right back up to 60. The finale at first struggles to fit them all in, and then stops trying. But by then, it's too late to really answer all of the questions these characters alone have raised. I like parts of Yakuza 5's finale, but it has a lot of problems, and this is one of the more understandable ones. I think the biggest issue is that it's big. In Yakuza 4, the finale was a singular chapter. All the pieces were in place, so it tossed them at each other. In Yakuza 5, it's another part. Four chapters of maneuvering, and then the grand finale. And it doesn't actually have four chapters worth of stuff to do, and that's kind of surprising. I mentioned during part 3 how you occasionally have to look back and admire just how big and varied an adventure it is. Well, now it's so large that it can weigh down on itself. Memories from further back are really fuzzy. Names, faces, and events are starting to blur. So I walk into Kamurocho and this finale with a mix of vigor and apprehension. Kinda like Kiryu. With that in mind, the final part's first port of call is reminding you who is important and why. 
Kiryu notices he's being followed, but presses on into the city regardless. A host at Stardust tells us that the town has been strange lately, with the Yakuza more or less disappearing. You know, I haven't thought about the Tojo much lately, but imagine you're in the clan and you're not one of the ten people involved in the Shadow War. As far as you're aware, Daigo is gone, Majima is dead, and Aoyama was killed by Daigo's traitorous bodyguard. Two tiny clans managed the former two, and the fourth chairman came out of hiding, and then gave your mate to hiding. I'm kind of amazed Tokyo isn't seeing a ton of panicked infighting, land grabs, bids for power, and families jumping ship. We saw what happened when Daigo was comatose. This looks like a large chunk of the upper management just fractured without explanation. There should be pandemonium right now. But okay, I'll buy it for the sake of the story. The 30,000 strong Tojo itself has gone to ground. Kiryu decides to confront his tail, letting himself get ambushed in an alleyway. The two have a really awkward conversation, but I love that Kiryu has no patience for Baba trying to act cryptic. Still, Baba tries to be Machiavellian, saying that if Majima's death hadn't drawn Kiryu here, then they would have had to change their plans. And Kiryu has a better response to meeting a man involved in Goro's death than his sworn brother did. Kiryu's just done with these people. Now to be fair to Baba, he does have something up his sleeve, but he is being very roundabout, saying that since Kiryu is getting violent, they'll have to fight. Let's talk about Baba's unique battle theme. Ikimasu! Okay, that's really all you need. Baba is a kid in an adult world. He's out of his depth, stuck between his old loyalties and his new appreciation for Saijima. His backstory and twist strain belief considering who he turns out to be, but there is an agreeable character under that. He's not brave or wise enough to know how to cut ties, and so he's trying to wriggle his way out from under his own boss and escape the conspiracy alive. He's a worm, but you don't begrudge a worm for trying to survive. He didn't start this fight to stop Kiryu, he wants to see if the legends are true. He needs every assurance that these people will win out. So let's get the kid believing in dragons. I don't hate Barbara as much as it may seem, but I still find him dull and it's funnier to take the piss out of him. Plus the dialogue before this fight is very stilted and doesn't convey subtext well at all. It feels like a limp excuse for a fight when really there is something there. And this is another something that the final part is going to consistently suffer from. You really have to claw out the meaning and, not to sound lazy, but I usually don't find myself needing to do that. Most of the time it's pretty clear why cool things are happening. You know, in subtext or text text. So after Kiryu beats him, the two go back to Noosa Reina where we get some juicy info. Along with repeating basically everything Daigo told Kiryu at the beginning, but with a few more details. I'm going to omit a lot of the repetition. So Aoyama and Morinaga were working together from the get-go. Moriyama were meant to kill Daigo, but after he evaded their plot, Aoyama went rogue and made a bid for the Tojo himself. Morinaga killed him to try and get the plan back on track. And he went about this cleverly. They had two jobs in Fukuoka, assassinate the chairman and lure Kiryu back to Tokyo so he could be killed there in big showy fashion. It turns out the Tojo were preparing for the wrong thing. All along they thought a war was coming. What was really happening was a plot to demoralize the Tojo so badly that they would be susceptible to being absorbed. That's why Kiryu couldn't die in Fukuoka. He needs to die on Tojo turf for the biggest impact. Kiryu then asks who's running this plot since Watase didn't seem the type. Barbara explains that there's also a lot of confusion on the Omi side. Watase isn't in on it, the Omi guy in Nagoya is dead, and that leaves just one possible ringleader. Ah, oh, Yakuza 5, you sneaky bugger. Now we got character switching. Across town, Saijima is waiting on Serizawa.
He's been dealing with some work issues. The case is dragging on and people are losing faith. Man, how meta. How very meta. Katsuya drives past so that Saijima can be told who he is. And then the big man is given his job. Track down Morinaga. And this leads us, for the last time in the series, into Purgatory. After this game, the Florist of Sai will be totally absent from future stories, and his minor role in this game likely speaks as to why. You've no doubt noticed by now that Serizawa is a little shady, and spoilers, he's not who he's claiming to be. Remember, Hanaya here hates a lot of the Yakuza, and knows everything that's going on all over town. I find it really doubtful a man with his knowledge and connections doesn't know who Serizawa really is, and would be really worried that this man is in town, standing right outside Kamurocho Hills no less. Upon arrival, he makes it clear he knows what Saijima is wrapped up in and what he's in it for. He definitely knew Saijima was coming. Here's how this scene should have opened. Saijima, mate, why are you hanging out with the Omi chairman? Oh him? Well he drove me over- Hang on, he's fucking who? He's who? Actually, yeah, why didn't I recognize him? And then Serizawa's plan is basically fucked. Except it wouldn't be, because I have no idea why he has us hunting Morinaga, actually. But Yakuza 5 is basically playing crime thriller jazz at the moment. It's doing a little freestyle. From a writing perspective, the florist has always been at least a bit of a crutch. He's an easy fix when the story is written into a corner, but he's also very restrictive. Villains have to be written around him, mysteries have to evade his watchful eye, and, well, he can see everywhere. He does help the story, and I'd say so far he's been used well, but he is also a limiting factor in where a villain can be and what they can do. In this moment, Yakuza 5 makes the florist blooming stupid. It ignores what the series has made him capable of and hopes you won't realize what's quite wrong here. And admittedly, I didn't until way later. I think someone involved in the writing must have done, must have realized the problem Kage brings, and hey, since he hasn't actually had any big involvement in the story since 2, they just figured it was easier to drop him. The series has really evolved beyond the need for him, he's vestigial by now. So what is Kage really doing here? Well, he's here to give Saijima another Colosseum moment. The tiger wants Morinaga's scent. And funny thing, someone else came here asking after the same man. Yeah, yeah it is. In the Colosseum we see... Hey, I know this guy. D don't tell me. Aizawa! That's Aizawa! I remember he was underground, but I thought he was dead. I mean, looks like he's on the way there. This is going bad. But then he finds his resolve and comes back with murderous intent. Wow, Saijima really took the bloodlust out of these people. Worried by Aizawa nearly killing the guy, Hanaya refuses to tell Aizawa where Morinaga is. So Saijima and Aizawa sit down and talk about the guy. Aizawa and Morinaga came up in the Tojo together. Slightly smaller big man here believes Morinaga betrayed everything they stood for. But without him, Aizawa has no idea what to do next. Morinaga pissed on their brotherhood, and that pisses Saijima right off. <laughs> Saijima decides to remind Aizawa how important that bond is the only way he knows how, by beating a reminder into his soul. He wants Aizawa to find his Kyodai and get his answers, and if those answers aren't good enough, beat him until he's satisfied. Get his brother back onto the path of righteousness. And so the cage descends. <laughs> I think this bit is serviceable, ignoring everything I said about Hanaya, which really isn't that bad in the moment. The problem is, as I've said, it's kinda hard to remember Morinaga and Aizawa after so much time away from them. It deflates a lot of the emotional impact of this moment. Still, I can see Aizawa has spirit. Problem is, Saijima's is Herculean. Down he goes. The florist comes out, Saijima having given him the match he wanted. And for that, he's willing to give the two Morinaga's location. All right, I'm ready to find the guy and remember who he is. Yeah, 
どんな現実が待っていようと俺は兄貴の今を知りたいです一人で道を歩いていけない気がするから森永の今の居場所それは警視庁カムロ署地下2階の霊安室だ Fucking Memento Morinaga! So that ends the last meaningful interaction with the florist of Sai. Five games, culminating in a really mean prank. I can think of less honorable ends. Date's reintroduced. This scene raises suspicion that Katsuya murdered Fujita and Morinaga. And that's going nowhere, but this scene did also reintroduce Date. He'll head to Serena and say meaningful sounding things about Kiryu. Now, while Katsuya isn't responsible for either death, he has killed Watase's mood. He's heard that Osaka Enterprises has moved on Kamurocho, and worse still, the Tojo are not fighting back. He can't let that rat fuck get ahead. <laughs> <laughs> We're on chapter 2 now, and this finale is still setting the table. And for Akiyama, 500 million is on it. This is Katsuya's offer for cancelling Haruka's debut. What are you doing? you to the two do their routine again. And Akiyama doesn't buy Katsuya as evil. He thinks Kanai is the real conniving one. When Katsuya talked about Park's death, Akiyama saw real remorse. So he can't see Katsuya being really as bad as he makes himself out to be. And yeah, talking about Park hits a nerve. It is a solid moment, seeing that Akiyama can actually figure out someone he bounced off of before. ただいま... Hey, Hana. And he collapses. But Shinada has been waiting. Ano... And he needs money. Is there just an aura around Shinada? Does the game just get more expressive in his presence? So, the two exchange everything they know. Sawada was, for whatever reason, aware that the Kuraha family was plotting an attack on a concert. So Shinada is here instead of looking for Daigo, and he wants to pay the cancellation fee. Akiyama confesses that he's looking after Haruka and will not terminate the show. Too many dreams are riding on it. He'll just have to deal with any threats. What's really amusing here is that they float the idea of a bomb threat, but Shun is willing to take that chance. Hey, new idols are always at risk of bombing. At least this kind takes a few people with you. Let that be a lesson to the audience. Get your dreams done before you go to the big show. There's no guarantee you're coming back. Anyway, these two need more to go on, so they decide to team up and track down the company that books the Japan Dome, the mysterious Mao Incorporated. The gameplay for this section is really simple, just two easy objectives about town. But honestly, I sort of wish a lot of the finale was more this kind of speed. It's a lot of exposition that honestly does more to knot the story up than tie it together, when what I really wanted was more of the leads meeting up and playing off of each other. Shinada and Akiyama go together really well, I'm having a blast just walking around having them tag team goons as they work to get a piece of the mystery. You get way too little of a good thing as in no time flat you're at the company, and Shinada just stands silently behind Akiyama, adding nothing to the scene. It's almost as if he should be doing something else. But hey, the president has some startling revelations. Katsuya, Park, and Majima were all friends. Why, Katsuya and Majima still hang out. T-Set going to Osaka Talent was actually a ploy devised by Park and Katsuya both. Their idol's rivalry is a calculated move to drum up buzz. And as far as this guy knows, the concert wasn't getting cancelled. It was merely getting postponed by a single day. <laughs> Well, 
Akiyama has no idea what to make of things anymore, and yeah, I'm right there with him. Chapter 3 opens with Katsuya doing naked thumb push-ups in his hotel room, so in this scene we can see his crane. I mean, the bird on his back. In animal symbolism, the crane represents good fortune, peace, longevity, and healing. In Chinese imagery, the animal also ferries souls to heaven. This is a very good reveal. In conjunction with what we just learned from the Mao president, it gives us a lot of insight into Katsuya, namely that he is indeed a man of peace. He was trying to find the letter to protect his friend Majima from the rest of his organization. He couldn't be straight with Haruka and Akiyama because he didn't want to involve civilians in a Yakuza dispute. And it is a confirmation that he does not intend to cancel the concert. He's carrying Park's wishes, her soul, to that stage. The man puts on a front so he can live up to the bird on his back. He puts out a news report seen by Kiryu and Saijima, announcing that T-Set will be replacing Haruka at the Japan Dome. Kiryu manages to interpret this as a message meant to summon everyone to the hills, and gives a little message of his own for Baba to pass on to Haruka. <laughs> Meanwhile, Saijima goes to get answers on an injured Aizawa's behalf. Shouldn't you be reporting to Serizawa? Oh, maybe Haniel let him in on things. This leads to a really fun extended battle sequence where we can choose to play either as Kiryu or Saijima. I do sort of wish they ran into each other and whoever you didn't pick came along as an AI fighter, but no joy, unfortunately. Katsuya has had the place shuttered, setting the stage for either of the two to fight their way through. It's really nice to see the place finished after so many games. This joint has been under construction since Yakuza 2. That's six years of construction. Just standing in this place gives a great sense of resolution, that in some way, things are over, they're changing. Still, all this real estate couldn't fix the Tojo's money problems. It's still cursed. Let's talk about these stairs. Did you know Yakuza 5 has stair attacks? I discovered these by total accident. They're not very useful, but they're awesome. They send people tumbling. You have to stand at a very exact distance from enemies while around stairs to get them off, and even knowing they exist, I can't trigger them consistently. <laughs> stairs are pretty rare throughout the game, so I find it fascinating that they have unique interactions. The fight continues inside and- Hey, Katsuya! Your boys are ruining your mate's tower! You're a bad friend, Kachan. All right, I'm coming up there. Let's see how you like it. Yeah, that guy's definitely dead. Speaking of killing, let's keep going up. Is that the highest point you can throw people from in the series? This battle is shorter than last game's trek through the tower and less inventive. There's nothing akin to the darkroom gimmick. It is going to be followed by three back-to-back -back boss fights, so maybe it's playing a little on the safe side. Inside Katsuya's hotel room, we find the man waiting on us. Saijima. But we're waiting on one more. I love that Watase must have missed everybody and everybody on the way up. Katsuya leads the group to the roof and begins what is perhaps the craziest play in the series. Katsuya knows something is going on, and that he's been painted as the perpetrator. He thinks all of the recent events that he's been made to look guilty of were orchestrated by a shadowy puppet master, in a bid to get these four to Kamurocho where they would all kill each other, taking down the Tojo and Omi heads without needing to take them head on. And having figured that out, what's the plan, Cats? Well, he's brought all of them up here to kill each other, figuring that a grand showdown like this will definitely bring the Mastermind out into the open, where the survivor can learn the truth. This is, by my reckoning, both the raddest and the maddest plan in the series. It almost feels like a parody of the logic these stories seem to run on, an utterly boneheaded move that depends on the story and villain contriving to sheer willpower. I'm all about it, but god is it stupid. If you want peace, prepare for a brawl, eh, Katsuya? But hey, they all want to know, and so do I. So one by one, the shirts come off. <laughs> Yep, logic has definitely been set aside, 
but in its place is a ton of energy. It blusters past how stupid it is on sheer bravado. <笑>お好きに。<笑> I do adore that before they begin, Katsuya realizes he should probably warn them not to actually go too hard on each other. Yes, we'll play into his hands, but be careful not to actually throw them too hard. If we really beat each other to death, that's a bust. I'll keep it in mind, Cats. God, this is so daft. They're even taking it in turns. They're staging falling for it by actually falling for it. Now, the music is sick, but it even has a sort of, okay, let's get to work energy about it. After the two Tojo versus Omi matches, the two Tokyo boys are left standing. So it's time for a rematch. And we can pick this time. I actually got a little cocky in this fight. <laughs> Tried to get some tiger drops and tiger dropped me. Oh god, he can use heat moves. Okay, that's the maximum ill luck. And I'm dead. It's time to mention I am playing on legend difficulty. It's a game about legends. I had to. Higher difficulties affect enemy health and aggression. They're harder to kill and want to kill you harder. Legend difficulty has one more stipulation. You don't get retries. It's right back to the start of the chapter. Or, uh, your last save, but I wasn't saving. I was just going through it. I think it's a good time to mention that holding a shoulder button and X is fast forward. I only learned that recently and it came in handy. Alright, back up the tower. Kiryu and Saijima fight to a standstill. Oh, you lovable fucking idiots. Just as they pass by the verge of realizing this plan has some holes in it. They do. The shooter is none other than Detective Serizawa. Oh, he was not going to incapacitate. Everyone on the other roof is confused. But don't worry, Kurosawa's making sure they're going nowhere. Kiryu demands to know why he's killing his own men. Kurosawa says he hasn't spared these idiots a fort since he became chairman, so why spare them now? Their role tonight is as sacrificial pawns, and they played their part perfectly. Saijima is disgusted, and Watase is distraught. He charges for his boss, begging for an explanation, saying he lived for nothing more than making the man proud. <laughs> Disgusting as this is, his loyalty would have brought him right along with what he wanted. What to say is basically a different character from the guy we saw in part one, who with his boss dying had seemingly tossed the man aside. Now he's ride or die. Which isn't a total contradiction, it just seems odd. Still, his voice actor sells his pain on pure passion. <laughs> Kurosawa then has a strange answer. <laughs> He despises the kind of Yakuza these four are. This is to him a cleanup of both clans. He sees their idealism, their leading by charisma, and their commitment to codes and honor to be a corrupting force on a Yakuza that should be led by pragmatism.
I wouldn't call Kurosawa my favourite villain by a long shot, but I find him an interesting one. Former villains who played with themes in this way tended to mirror one of Kiryu's virtues. Kurosawa is instead antithetical to Yakuza as a whole, particularly Five's core themes. This isn't a meta thing, but it is Yakuza 5 leaning on its own construction. That last scene, a dramatic rooftop showdown, is a franchise convention. Kurosawa punishes the heroes for thinking it would actually solve their problem, turning their own cliché against them. It was a setup to knock them down. Yakuza as a series sides with those who have conviction. If a character has a strong belief, they are presented with a degree of dignity. They hold power, no matter if their belief is for good or ill. In the last game, Munakata didn't really believe in anything. He was a selfish figurehead who wanted power for its own sake and dressed it up in fancy language. That's why, the moment he was disarmed, he crumpled and gave in. Katsuragi got a similarly undignified end. It's why Kanai in this game only looks imposing, but is effectively powerless. And it's why Aoyama died a sniveling wreck. Kurosawa, funnily enough, does have conviction which the game respects. And that conviction is a smouldering hate for the series' convictions. He wants to tear down the virtues the series often champions. Kurosawa also plays on the theme of identity. Where others struggle with theirs, he weaponizes an assumed one. But what does he have to do with dreams? It may seem obvious that he would decry them. But let's put that to bed for a second. <laughs> Kurosawa has a great reaction to this. Just tired annoyance. Katsuya stood not just in the way of that bullet, but in defiance of Kurosawa's entire philosophy. Watase's reaction, meanwhile. His actor is putting everything into this, to the point I'm almost certain he's going so loud he had to be compressed back down. That's the sound of you being drowned out, Kurosawa. Kiryu and Saijima pull themselves back up and stand in defense of the Omi officers. Oh good, Daigo's here. Never thought I'd say that, but he is the only man in the Tojo allowed to use a gun against other people. Kurosawa asks how he tracked him here, and Daigo says he's suspected him for a while, before the betrayal in Fukuoka, before the mysterious re-emergence of the Nagoya family, but when the man told him he was sick. I'd say that eyes are the window to the soul, but that saying is painful. Kurosawa questions why Daigo went ahead making alliances if he suspected him of something. I'm going to admit that I may be being stupid, but I don't get why that would become a bad idea. So Daigo dodges that. He turned Kurosawa's plan to his advantage. Him and Majima played along, knowing the Omi's inside men would bubble to the surface, where they could easily be dealt with. It also gave Daigo a chance to meet the other major Yakuza in the country, learning what he could from them. Kiryu demands Daigo not to do this, but the chairman is now standing on his own two feet. Daigo wins the draw, but having missed most of the scene, doesn't quite get Kurosawa. He walks over and offers him a shot at redemption, have the dignity to take responsibility for his actions, or leave it to Daigo to send him on his way. From behind, Daigo is shot by Kanai. Yeah, I can imagine this is the guy Kurosawa went to with this plot. Hell, Kanai echoes the boss's sentiments. Kiryu goes ballistic as Daigo collapses. 
大悟キュー話してくれ大悟が He's on the verge of jumping the tower, and we get one of my favorite Kiryu moments from the pre finale finale. <laughs> Kiryu obviously does care a lot for Daigo. From the get go, he probably would have wanted to help someone so dear to him. His survivor's guilt gives him a great deal of fear of getting involved in other people's lives. It's one of the downsides of his selflessness. He sees himself as a liability, someone who always fails others. In all of his heroics, all he ever sees is what he failed to do. Kiryu's relationship with Daigo is sadly mostly a product of Yakuza 2. Their interactions thereafter are minor, and I find that a bit of a shame, since it feels like there are a ton of words left unsaid between these two. But that's also tragically the point of their relationship. Kiryu has failed Daigo time and again. He's always too late to help him avert disaster. Kiryu is a man deeply riddled with regret. And bullets, but mostly regret. That ends chapter 3. Or 4. Kinda 5. Crossroads is a bit of a waste of a chapter. It's an hour of mostly tedious exposition and entirely annoying supposition. There are a handful of good moments, but it's maybe 5 minutes of substance. <laughs> ですね。間違いなく。でも、そいつが復讐を望んでいないんだとしたら、夢を取ります。そいつの夢も叶えるためにね。それが仲間ってもんじゃないですか。悪かったな。いきなり話しかけて。after Kurosawa's reveal and Daigo's shooting, it's one last pump of the brakes. We see the remnants of Dynachair practicing in a dingy studio. They talk about Park's letter and how Haruka is worried she won't be able to fulfill Park's dream and find her husband. You're a little slow on the uptake. The T set crew wander in, and before Yamura can chase them off, Nakai tells them that actually they're working together now. Park and Katsuya, who's in the hospital right now, had planned a big gambit from the beginning in turning these three into an idol supergroup, and they're performing their hit new song a few days from now. You fuckers are getting off so easy. It's a good thing you made two apologies. Genuinely, experiencing this for the first and second time left a bad taste in my mouth. They just get to turn around, walk in, and say we're all friends now, and these lot can't turn it down because it's basically the only shot they have. But this is treated as a heartwarming reconciliation when really it just feels scummy. T-Set are just way too mean-spirited in their own part, and the apology that in my eyes does more to redeem them is the one that's predicated on losing. To the game's credit, I kind of think they know this is not going to go well. Mai and Azusa do treat Haruka a lot better from here on out, but these girls are just on very different wavelengths. I don't buy them getting on for long. Anyway, Haruka now has to not only learn how to dance in time with, but lead two other dancers. With days. Well, good luck. But not before Barber comes along with a message. The two go to a nearby park where he passes on Kiryu's words and the two get to talking. The news that she's performing again doesn't exactly fill Barber with joy. Barber, without being able to say why, tries to talk Haruka out of doing the show just after giving her the message to never give up. Too spineless to spit it out, he confesses that Kiryu is nearby and tries to guilt her into seeing him, hoping he'll pull Haruka out of the concert and him out of this mess. Haruka thinks on this, but turns it down, saying the two of them have both sacrificed too much at this point. It's bittersweet, but Haruka knows how her old man ticks. I think this scene is the one time the game really gets across what it wants with Barber. He's conflicted, and it's not just pathetic, but sympathetic. Being one of Kurosawa's lackeys, he shares their lack of belief and capacity for ruthless pragmatism. The difference is that he wants to believe in something. He wants Kiryu and Saijima to win, but he's too scared to fully put his faith in them and pull out of Kurosawa's plot. And he hates himself for this cowardice. Before she leaves, Barber solemnly asks how Haruka knew she could trust him, and she replies that he strikes her as the type of person Kiryu would consider a friend. And this further crushes him. Yep. 
ぱり俺はまだダメダメだな<笑> Haruka heads back to the studio and you get two warnings before you progress This is the last time you'll have control of Haruka Best of luck Haruka I bet you can handle the concert without me Anyway, that's the good bits and the first quarter of this chapter. The gang is at New Serena. Kiryu is just wrecked, and we're about to be right there with him. This is going to be 45 minutes of waffling. Date kicks this off by talking about how New Serena is the crossroads... Uh? Uh? ...of Kiryu's life. A place where he and people who follow his convictions always wind up at pivotal points, alongside recapping Kiryu's history with the joint. There's nothing really wrong with this speech, as a long-time series fan, it's pleasant to hear just how much we've done together. Then Akiyama comes in, and this is where the scene turns irritating. He has everybody's accounts, he has a picture of a terrifying Majima, and he thinks he has the whole thing figured out. What follows is a long tale, in which Akiyama supposes the thought processes of Park and Majima, romanticizing and aggrandizing their possible off-screen intentions and explaining just how much struggle they should have gone through, how deep their relationship must have been despite it all. It's torturously saccharine, and really only served to make me like the two less, to say nothing of Akiyama. This is wank. I hate this attempt to make characters more interesting off-screen. Assuming Akiyama is near the mark, it honestly just makes Park worse. She knowingly put Haruka and others in the sights of the Yakuza. At the end of the day, very little of this comes around, and it's just Akiyama guessing at their motivations while Detective Date goes, Damn Shun, you're so smart and rich. You should have my job and my ex-wife. Date, to his credit, is in favour of cancelling the concert. And by now, Akiyama, in the most agreeable he's been in minutes, agrees. Damn it. But Kiryu stirs from his slumber to tell them not to. They point out that Haruka's life is in danger. Is he willing to risk that? And well, Kiryu can't quite handle it. He heads up to the roof. And in a moment that is admittedly nice in concept, Kiryu and Saijima swap roles from last game, with Saijima having to give him back his sense of purpose. Kiryu confides in him that he's genuinely scared, and for the last year, for the first time in his life, he's felt lonely. <laughs> Saijima explains that what matters is family. Even when Kiryu was in jail for 10 years, he had those he cared about waiting on the outside, and that made anything bearable. Saijima, mate, you were on death row. You know how death row works, big man. Hamazaki really saved you from a rude awakening. Anyway, he tells Kiryu that even without Yasuko and Majima, and while he's clearly forgotten about him, let's throw in Sasai, you know, to be sassy. Well, even having lost them, he never feels lonely. Because he knows that they lived life on their own terms. Which is by and large not true of either of them, but hey, it works on Kiryu. Not like his speech from last year was much better. Kiryu returns to the bar. He's the best character in the game, Kiryu. They've got a plan of the venue, and since it's a repurposed stadium, Shinada knows where they'd plant an assassin. This gets the group talking about that fateful day Shinada got kicked from the league. He reveals that on the day, no one was actually in place to intercept signals. Kiryu points out that Shinada could have proved his innocence if he'd just come forward with that. And they're about to do my boy dirty. I don't hate the dream spiel Shinada goes on, but fuck I hate the basis of it. Saying that fans should be kept blind to any dirt behind the scenes, only seeing the shiny end product that helps them dream again. Besides being patronizing, besides being something said by someone trying to cover his own guilt in Shinada's own part, this undermines Shinada and everything he went through. It seems to ignore that he was a sacrificial pawn meant to kick off a match-fixing scandal, which probably did just as much, if not more damage to the sport's reputation and those dreams than him trying to tidy up his image. It's a line of thinking that would let the sport remain just as corrupt, but excuses it so it can look squeaky clean while people who work within it continue to be exploited, tossed aside, and have their own dreams ruined. Something Shinada's own part dealt with? This speech is trash. 
but really does explain the idol industry apologism in part 3. It's another problem a lot of the pre-finale suffers from. It wants to have big, profound sentiments, and it takes every opportunity to try and provoke a meaningful-seeming moment. Even if the idea is half-baked, delivered by the wrong person, or just really fucking stupid. It lands a couple of shots, but with Machine Gun Fire, you'll do that on quantity. Chapter 4 finally ends on Kurosawa, sat in the Millennium Tower and surrounded by bodies. さあ、So that's the pre-finale, and honestly I'm not too fond of it. I like the fight on the tower. I like that Barber does actually have a good scene. He pays off okay. There are a couple of good moments, but I think it's hamstrung by format. It somehow feels like a continuation and an entirely new angle. Important seeming questions are and will be left hanging while left field swerves take the fore. Characters seem out of step with how they were presented earlier. Weirder still, like all prior parts, it has its own style. But that style feels like it's trying to find a median of all prior parts. And it creates a weird tonal soup. It leads to great character beats and strong emotional moments, standing shoulder to shoulder with really artificial speeches and wonky rationalizations. Sometimes a single line can be all four of these things at once. I suppose in that sense, it really is a perfect amalgamation of Yakuza 5, all of its best aspects mixed with its worst indulgences. Wild inconsistency may not be something to strive for, but it does keep you on your toes. With the concert a day away, we've some free time before the finale finale, and there isn't much to really do in Camarocho. Well, okay, there's everything to do in Camarocho, except go to Love in Heart, which I find kind of funny considering Shinada, but hey, that would be a bit of a bust man's holiday. He also absolutely refuses to play baseball in his hometown. Shinada can't do the two things that kind of define him where he was born. Besides that, everything is still here. Hours of minigames and side content, but we've covered much of it. Camarocho has a cold and uninviting air about it. It's a strange vibe to have after spending tens of hours before getting here, and I find it really cool. A combination of time and tone make the town take on an unfamiliar feeling. You'd think getting back here would feel like coming home, but this isn't home. Not anymore. The disconnection that Yakuza 4 quickly alleviated is allowed to sit here, and it works for the story, though it does have a few downsides. One major contributor to that emptiness is a lack of substories. There are disappointingly few, leading to little downtime for group interactions, which is a bit of a shame. What is interesting is the focus of those remaining substories. First off, Kiryu can find the local Cafe Alps on the ropes, in need of something to bring back business. Kiryu calls Tatsuya, but he won't be available. You need to finish all of his requests, and that isn't possible at this point in the game. Now, as I've said, I like when content interconnects and rewards exploration. I'm less of a fan when systems gate each other. It's a fine line to walk. Granted, what this does is gate Amon behind you getting certain upgrades. It's a sly promise that this is going to be tough. You're gonna need two health bars for this one, and I needed a lot more than two. I mean, yeah, I beat the clan. Tricky buggers, except for Saijima because he is just that broken. Even Haruka gets a secret, easy to miss showdown against Noah Amon. But they're all dessert. The real conclusion to sub stories is the game asking, how'd you like dinner? As I said long ago, Yakuza 5's tourism is mostly done through dining. So first off, it makes certain that you have been engaging with that side of the game. 
The final substory then is Akiyama needing to figure out some suggestions for new Kushikatsu variations based on regional delicacies. Looking for leads, he goes to his fellow leads. And the final test of Yakuza 5 substories. Do you remember what every city specialized in? All along, the game has taken you to diners, made you look high and low for certain foods. This checks whether or not you've been paying attention. I wish there was more, but I do love how humble an ending it is. There is actually one last secret substory which I didn't do. In the Underground Mall, a place this chapter never actually leads you to or flags up, you just have to remember it exists, a shopkeep gives you a giant souvenir fetch quest which would require backtracking to each and every town if you hadn't already stockpiled these items. This is not necessary for full completion. It's just there to get you a few goodies, and it's there if you have somehow ran out of things to do in Yakuza 5. There is one other odd addition to this finale. Should Akiyama visit his hostess club, Elise, he's told by the new manager Yuiko that business is bad and they need a shot in the arm. So she suggests getting girls from out of town. This leads to Akiyama, once again, asking for help from the lads. And if you've won the hearts of their respective hostesses, you can ask them to come down and help out at Elise until the troubles are over. Obviously, I didn't do this. Credit for this footage goes to Gogglebox Fairy. Doing this unlocks the final boss hostess. According to Yuiko, she's just past training. She's got the looks and she's got the energy. She's perfect. There's just one problem. She's got a bad personality. That's, uh, that's far from perfect. So, Akiyama turns to Kiryu to be her first client and see if she's ready. When Kiryu points out this isn't a good time, we get what is perhaps my favorite exchange between the two, with Akiyama threatening to tell Haruka about her dad going to cabarets. It's childish blackmail, and it works. Long story short, she's good at her job, and by all working together and poaching people countrywide, we save Elise. The fact there's a final boss hostess is just inherently funny to me, and that is about the only escalation left for the system beyond full voice acting. It's genuinely kind of incredible how not just the story, but many of the activities and systems have a narrative that all build towards conclusions in Kamurocho. It's not just that Yakuza 5 is so many games in one, it's that it's so many games progressing in tandem that can make it feel so mind-bogglingly large in scope. And before I move on to one big final activity, I would be loath to forget the giant cone. The victory road for how much build-up it gets is a little limp. Around town you have a chance of running into Raiden. He's the local qualifier. Kiryu puts him down a couple of times and comes to learn he is irredeemably evil. A mercenary who delights in bloodshed. And while he isn't allowed to kill here, he makes sure to end his fights by permanently crippling his opponents. When the Victory Road finals open up, the gang aren't surprised to find out they're the competitors. Though Kiryu warns he will not be holding back. He refuses to let any of them go up against the monster. This can be tricky. You're limited to a single health bar. Oh, I've grown soft worrying about that. And with it, you must survive four battles back to back. First against the three other player characters, and then Raiden. If that tie didn't sit well with you, well good news, Kiryu wins here. Oh, poor Shinada. And Raiden, he is a six health bar monster. This is a test of endurance, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. This is selfish of me to say, but while the speech to Raiden is great, I can't help but feel a little let down after a whole game of build-up. I was expecting a real pop-up. I was expecting the Coliseum to feel like a big event. This is just a slightly longer tournament with a villain at the end. And afterwards, it's just the Colosseum again with some quality of life improvements. You're given more information on how to score points and when you're doing well. I do quite like this, besides making progression and point scoring more easily read and immediate, it encourages riskier, more aggressive play, giving the arena battles a unique drive. Plus fighter rankings let you see if a tournament has worthwhile challenges, since the points you get to climb the ladder are relative to positions on the board. 
It is still dull to have to grind out unlocking tournaments per character, but hey, I can at least play as every character this time. That's cool, but I have to point out something. I do enjoy playing as each fighter outside of the Colosseum, but inside it, that varies a ton. For Saijima, this is incredibly easy, and for Kiryu, it's about right. For Akiyama and Shinada, it's just not that enjoyable. It's not that it's hard, it's that it's not balanced for them. Fights take ages, especially for Shinada. All the other characters have damage dealing counters and options to really play aggressive. Shinada lacks the toolset to keep fights moving. You're going at the AI's pace with pitiful damage output, which is a bit of a shame. I do love playing as Shinada, but when the content is balanced around Kiryu, it leaves half the roster in the dirt. So with that in mind, it can't be said that Akiyama and Tanamura were left out without reason last time. Kiryu and Saijima really are just on another level. Besides that, not much new to say. It's the Colosseum. I've never gone all in on it because while I do enjoy Yakuza's combat, the same arena over and over again quickly leaves me tired. I like variation and motivation. I lack the patience for this. I did get to unlocking 100-man deathmatch on at least three characters, but I didn't unlock the final three big challenge tourneys before boredom got the best of me. If I had a custom tourney mode and could set up fights, then I'd be set because Yakuza 5's combat mechanics are simple but stellar, second only to zeros as the series goes. So, um, that's it. That's everything I feel like talking about. There's only the finale left. The finale finale, the proper one. All right, first things first, get everyone fed, one by one. Man, this place used to do ice cream, that's kind of sad. Okay, all right, I'm so excited, I'm going to sleep. We begin at the Japan Dome. Maya and Azusa are on top of the world. Haruka, meanwhile, is pretty withdrawn. And not just because if she bombs, or gets bombed, that's gonna ruin a few dreams. A few times throughout the finale, it hops back to Haruka, and she's starting to have doubts, likely spurred by everything that's going on. Barbara's comment about Kiryu weighing on her, and really, just the realization that all along, this may not be what she's really wanted. But all along, she's trying to convince herself otherwise. Iko. Meanwhile, me and the lads are about to hit the idol concert, but the mama runs in. Kurosawa has seized the Millennium Tower and he has Majima hostage. Uh oh, we better get over there. Something about this shot is just really funny to me. Holy shit. Look at Shinada, he was ready for that. That practice back in Nagoya paid off. Still, he's not quite ready for the goofy shit that's about to follow. <laughs> they inspect the bodies and find Tojo pins. Akiyama, as he does, kicks into gear and explains these must be Omi imposters trying to incriminate the Majima family. Then comes the second wave. I love this. It's dumb as hell, but the escalation is fun to get caught up in. The whole town is at risk. They spend five minutes discussing what to do, the aura of their conversation teleporting the boys back every camera cut. Shinada offers to go and save Haruka, saying he'll fly under the radar and knows the stadium, and he gets Kiryu's blessing, as if he needed it. Saijima's taking Majima, no question. So Kiryu and Akiyama, they'll keep these guys busy. And we kick off. The finale finale is over an hour of brawling, and it will be great. It begins with an awesome battle where Kiryu and Akiyama team up against an army of Kurosawa's lackeys. It's great that we get to fire up Dragon Spirit one last time and just go to town saving the town. Kanai tries to muck in, but he's just nothing to Kiryu. And this shot is hilarious. Oh man, that's satisfying. Meanwhile, Team B, B standing for big, trek through the sewers, which, oh god damn it, man, the Kuraha fought of everything. Not much to say, it's a sewer level. Though mid-combat dialogue rears its head once again. 
Saijima telling Shinada he's going to find a guy called Barber at the show and to tell him that Saijima will wait on him no matter how long that takes for an oath of brotherhood. Shinada, meanwhile, can't believe the absurd lengths these guys go to for each other. It's a nice dialogue, but I feel bad for these guys. Their health won't drain while the cutscene is going on, so they just get smacked around for over a minute. Okay, we're done. Here's the anesthetic. After clearing a path, the two split up. The finale really does live up to the scale Yakuza 5 promises. It could only feel bigger if the Tojo came out of hiding to throw a few swings, but they'd just be getting in the way. This is war, and it has a backing track. Seeing as his skyscraper ambush didn't quite work last time, Kurosawa wants to try again. He wants to ruin rooftops for these people. Just because you don't see the fun in it. Saijima demands to see Majima, and his other brother from another mother is dragged out in chains. Kurosawa heads over, lets him free, and hands him his knife. <laughs> If Saijima doesn't beat Majima to death, Kurosawa is giving the order to shoot. Majima's sorry he let it get to this point, but now he doesn't see any option but to play along. What's really great about this scene is how Saijima and Majima start turning the tables on Kurosawa, both in foiling his plan and chipping away at his resolve. Kurosawa delights in breaking their morale, in lording over how he thinks he has these people figured out. But then, before the fight begins, Saijima thanks Tsubasa, saying he's glad to have a shot at his bro, and this just pisses Kurosawa off. He hates that this is exactly what Saijima would want, that despite all of his efforts, he just can't break these people. The fight is a Majima fight. Last time it was hard because Saijima was slow, but, well, Saijima just has no weaknesses anymore. He's the apex predator. Even Majima's IF-7 tech can't make this fight hard. Uh, Saijima, you may need to see Emoto. The blood loss is clearly worse than you thought. No, you can't afford to lose more blood. The fight goes on, and these two are just having the time of their lives, and Kurosawa can't handle it. He demands they keep going, until he realizes something must be wrong. <laughs> they turn the ambush back around. On every level, these two just wreck Kurosawa. They so completely turn the tables on the smug fucker, it's great. We flash back a while and Barber finally decides to do the right thing. One look at the guy. It's all it takes. And and Shinada invents a reason to kick the guy's ass. But don't let the fans know. Okay, this does improve a little bit. Even if it's absurd that Shinada is telling an assassin that it's better to admit his deeds, kind of flies in the face of assassination, Shinada wants to punish his misdeeds and sloppy work. He said to the man who was walking away, 
And well, it's a final boss, I guess. Yakuza 5 has a lot of repeat bosses. The only one who's getting something new this finale is Saijima, and even then, that's only new in the context of this game. But yeah, it's Barber. I mean, maybe he'd be a daunting fistfight for Haruka, who I'm sure could tiger drop him into next week. It's easy, and it's weird that this is the best note they could figure for Shinada to go out on. The fight itself is fine. It may as well be 2D, because I instinctively tried to frame it against the backdrop because it looks sick this way. <laughs> Okay, to expand on this fight and be fair to both characters, it's also worth noting this fight doesn't use I Believe in You as its backing track. Besides being a finale and thus in need of something to say it apart, I think there's a bit more under the hood here. For Barber, this isn't a fight against Saijima or Kiryu, someone he had previously put stock in, even if it took him until now to decide to do right by them. This is Shinada, an unknown, who picked a fight with Barber over a matter of personal responsibility. Shinada had only just found it in himself to take his life into his own hands, and he's trying to make Barber do the same. Not putting his belief and his fate in Tsubasa, Saijima, anybody. This is a fight for Barber to do right by himself. Or Shinada just wanted to beat fuck out of him. Why not? Okay, rock a bye Barber and the fight ends with a meteor tackle. Shinada collapses, and as he watches the show, his emotions get the better of him. Baba, overcome with regret, goes for the rifle. Feeling that in going this far, in not putting his faith in Saijima and living up to his hopes, he has failed him. Kosaka got the boys from Abashiri out here to come find Baba. Saijima gave them a ring and told them what to do. As Shinada watches, he's sad that unlike him, Baba has a place to go back to. Prison. I mean, hey Shinada, the rifle's right there. Mm -hmm. どうだ、<laughs> and that ends the story of the greatest chuckle fuck to ever walk the earth. Never before has a game made a discount at a brothel so emotional. Shinada is a one-shot character. On the one hand, I'm a little sad. On the other, it was mostly perfect, and seeing as perfect don't exist, that's about the best you can be. Shame about Fujita, though. He's the best character in the game, Kurosawa. Are you surprised? It was Baba. I'm starting to really doubt your ability to predict people. Realizing he's been thoroughly beat, Kurosawa goes for the easy out. You know, Daigo really missed his calling in life as a hitman. So now that Kurosawa is totally disarmed and Haruka is safe, it seems like we're... 
Oh god, they're still going. It seems there's still life in the old man yet. <laughs> well, a little. Katsuya asks why all the schemes if he's so close to the end of his life, and the man finally breaks and does a Yakuza thing. Kiryu gets a call. Not now, Kiryu. He's told to get to Tojo headquarters on the double. Akiyama says he'll clean up here, and the two finally split. As Kiryu goes, Akiyama wonders something to himself, in a line that is both unbelievably clunky, weird, and awesome. So, it feels so strange to me. Akiyama has had the least personal investment in this, and that's saying something considering he literally invested the most in this. And this is about the best meaning they can fish up for him. And his final boss is Kanai and crew again. Which is a little lame. For a guy whose character boils down to cowardly prick, he sure is persistent. Ah, oh, it's a little bit different. He's got a knife. I guess he was running to a payphone. <laughs> Even after the fight is done, Kanai won't stay down. He gloats that it's only a matter of time until more of his boys arrive. They're not the best characters in the game, Kanai. The clans from all over the country flood Theater Square, telling Kanai that Kurosawa's men have been mopped up, their dreams all brought together, bonded by their clashes with the Tojo. He's wanted by every Yakuza in Japan. I fucking love the music to this. God, that's so fucking good. That's the analysis. It's fucking good. It's stupid as hell, like so many other things, and I love it. You beat up a large man many times. As a money lender, you'll be glad to know, we are in your debt. This isn't a terrible ending, it just feels like the one character resolution that is a resounding shrug. Akiyama's motivation near the end weirdly shifts from protecting a dream in spite of danger from the Yakuza, to hoping this battle will solidify his place amongst the legends of Kamurocho, something that was established as the case within moments of his introduction last game. Now, with the way the finale was playing out, yes, someone had to protect the town, and these battles are enjoyable. It's just the amusing amount of thematic weight that is suddenly created for this that sort of swings Akiyama's motivation in a really funny direction at the last moment. Kiryu arrives at a Tojo HQ now blanketed in snow and bodies. The inside of the building is quiet, he makes his way up to the meeting room, where he comes face to face with Kurosawa's partner in crime and beneficiary. Aizawa? Back on the Millennium Tower, Majima is probably freezing to death, but that's irrelevant. Kurosawa finally explains why he did all of this. His climb up the Omi totem pole was not pretty. From his start in some no-name family, he clawed his way up by taking on work no one else would touch, enduring punishments for failure no one should suffer, and having to kill his own superiors to advance. He arrived at the top with his pride shattered, and was not happy with what he found up there. Then, earlier this year, he's told he's not got long left. 
and he panicked. He wanted to leave behind something worthwhile, and he had to find someone to leave it to. The twist of it is, all along, we have been seeing in action the twisted, desperate carrying out of a terminally ill man's dreams. In the winter of his life, he wanted to do something that took on greater meaning than himself. And underneath the terrible methods and his delight in others' suffering, he did it at least in part to spare somebody else all the suffering he himself had to go through. There is but a tiny glimmer of selflessness. Back at HQ, we see Aizawa's side of this. Kiryu yells that Aizawa doesn't deserve to sit in Daigo's chair, and he retorts that if he doesn't, does Daigo? He ascended to the top on nepotism, with a formerly powerful dad and the backing of the fourth chairman. Did he really earn his place? And Kiryu can't fully argue with this. Aizawa goes on that the Yakuza are too focused on connections, on charisma, on talent, when really, it should be ran by strength. This speech is alright, don't embarrass yourself. This all sounds like he begrudges Daigo for succeeding on nepotism, but then accepting his dad's plan to be handed leadership through little effort of his own. That sounds a lot like nepotism, but that's why Kiryu is here. Aizawa believes that if he can defeat Kiryu, he, by his own philosophy, deserves to stand at the apex of the Yakuza. There's a wonderfully soulless dynamic between these two. The cruel old man handing over unfathomable power to a stuck-up, presumptuous, pontificating idiot who does not care for him. The tragic irony being that the strength Aizawa speaks so highly of in some way describes Kurosawa's ascent. A man who climbed a mountain of bodies on his own strength and was broken by the experience. Kurosawa tried to spare somebody else that pain, but they're too naive to know better, to appreciate what they're being offered. They romanticize something that does not deserve it. Meanwhile, Haruka is debuting her hit single, before Kiryu hits this guy plurally. It's not even a word at this point, it's just sound. Fuss begins their final song, a solemn ballad dedicated to the person by their side. A song about how as life diverges, there's only one place they can be. Barber didn't kill Haruka's career, but boy howdy, their lyricist is trying. Anyway, I love this transition. Kiryu agrees to give him his fight, but first, the lesson that talent alone never makes a person. Hard work, dedication, and always growing are what do it. Oh, it was this game I heard it from. Kiryu is so fucking cool. それじゃあ俺はあんたを倒し。<laughs> Look at this guy trying to play it cool after screaming like that. Okay, you want Daigo's chair so bad? Fucking have it. Final boss, and it's good. 
He has so many fucking health bars. He has more health bars than every character put together. This is a drag out brawl and he's tricky too. When I was playing years ago, I had to bring so many health items to this fight. Now I can get him without, but yeah, he's a solid final test. Also, the music. It feels weird to describe a song as energetic and weary, and that's weary in a good way. It captures how far we've come. This is the final challenge for the player, and the last hurdle Izawa has to clear for his dream, for the carp to become a dragon. This is a final fight worthy of the journey. Plus, when I call it a drag out brawl, I mean a drag out brawl. As Kiryu wears him down, proves his own belief wrong, he literally drags him further and further away from the seat of power he craves so much. The battle goes from the meeting room, out into the lobby. Oh, that's not good. And finally, they're out brawling in the snow. Aizawa didn't clear the Dragon Gate, he's gonna fall at Tojo HQ's, right back down the waterfall. Over the course of this fight, Aizawa sees his dream slip from his grasp. Awesome. I fucking love Yakuza 5. As Aizawa lies in the snow, Kiryu tells him to fight his way up. He will be there when he has truly earned his shot at the top, as long as it takes. Kiryu may not share Aizawa's worldview, but he doesn't reject it, that if Aizawa had the strength to pull his way to the top, he will have earned it. But Aizawa cheated. He took shortcuts, betrayed those around him, he decried Daigo's nepotism while trying to excuse his own. In losing, he has been shown how he falls short of his own ideals. That strength he talks up, it doesn't belong to him. His fight with Kiryu was lopsided from the start. Kiryu had been fighting for hours, his wound had already reopened and only got worse as the fight went on. Kiryu wasn't even at his best, but he still came out on top. I can understand if you think the last second reveal of Aizawa's true self is lame, that all along he has been lying and is more or less a new character for it. I personally like it. It works with the theme of identity and brings a valuable, penultimate view on dreams. Sometimes they can be misguided, naive, selfish. Sometimes an ultimately fair goal can come from a foul place. Sometimes, before we chase our dreams, we need to position ourselves to do so. We need to be worthy to pursue it. As I said, this was the penultimate dream. As Kiryu's own strength leaves him, we rejoin Haruka back on that stage. And well, she's about to follow in her father's footsteps. She turns and bows to her bandmates, and having fulfilled Park's dream, decides to close the curtain on all of this. <laughs> Oyano 
She thanks all of those who have helped her, but says that to do this, she had to hide those she truly cared about, and she can't do that anymore. <laughs> okay, shouldn't do that. <laughs> A fucking sea of Yakus are just hanging out in theatre square watching the idol concert. With Akiyama just chilling. He's just hanging out. It's a good speech. It's a good speech. It's a good speech. And yes, it is the final statement on dreams. And seeing everyone who came along on this crazy ride, all here to see what we fought for, it's really, ch it's funny, but it's really charming. I'm not trying to ironically distance myself from loving this, but come on, look at it. It's hilarious. Haruka has realized after fulfilling the dream that it isn't really hers. Her place is elsewhere. She sacrificed so much, got to the top, and just like Kiryu, she realized her dreams were far more humble, so she wants to step down. She's doing exactly what Kiryu did so many years ago. And when you climb to the top, people won't let you down so easy. And this apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But caught up in the emotions of the moment, having seen Kiryu on TV earlier that day, she hates that to live this life, she has had to reject her own parent. Dreams can blind, they can embolden, they can be shared, they can be stolen. They can creep up on us at any time in our lives. They can be so much bigger than we are. They can be corrupted by those who don't get it. They can change people's hearts for the worse and for the better. They can carry us through so many trials. And when lost, they can follow us like a spectre. Dreams are great and terrible, and so is Yakuza 5. And right at the end, after pursuing the dream for so long, Haruka realized where her real dreams lie. The last observation of dreams in Yakuza 5 is that you may truly reach it, only to realize it's not what you wanted, or that beyond that dream was just another one waiting. It could be the second you reach it or so much later, but for many of us, we're made wanting. Fulfilling your purpose may leave you itching for a new one, and sometimes grand aspirations aren't as fulfilling as just having a place to belong. The game says, ironically, appropriately, that sometimes the biggest isn't the best. And while the series won't be as kind to Haruka as what I'm about to say is, there's no shame in shifting gears. She could have picked a better way to go out, but we don't control our dreams. They control us. Sometimes we may be powerless before what we want. All we can do is run after it.
夢じゃないのか、うん、違うよ私はここにいるよ Every part of me says I should hate that. To really fucking go, am I dreaming? The balls of it. To end on another ambiguous fate for Kiryu, even if later games have remedied that. God, there was a prequel after this, that's mean. Hey, Uncle Kaz, have you seen Majima about? I've got a letter for him. But I love it. It just stabs right through me. The ambiguous ending, even if overused, does have its place when much of the finale was focused on the ability of dreams to sneak up on you from a variety of angles, and concluding on the message that one dream, achieved or not, may well just be the prelude to another, yeah, that's what we're looking at. But that's not for this game. Still, let's indulge a fantasy for one moment. Every game in the series has had a premium adventure mode, a way to access all of the side content and sub-stories at once with no chapter progression or pesky story elements to muddy the experience. If you're in Yakuza for the side content, I'd honestly just advise speeding through the story to get here. I personally like the two intermingled. In most entries there has been a mode where Kiryu and Haruka can hang out and do activities around the hubs. In Yakuza 5 this lets Kiryu and Haruka tour the entire country. Playing games, eating out, seeing the sights. It's charming, though it's never much been my speed. In Yakuza 5, it does have one rather touching flourish. After enough wandering around any one hub, or if you chance into it, Haruka and Kiryu will have a dialogue. This dialogue is very strange and oddly bittersweet. It doesn't quite acknowledge it, but it seems almost cognizant of the ending, or at least exists in some strange parallel to it. Like, despite being together in this mode, there's a self-aware melancholy that this isn't how things really are. And even here, these two are holding back the words they want to say to each other. It's low-key, but it left an impression on me. And on that note, one last little example of just how much stuff is in this game, a non-canon holiday for two of the leads. I think we'll end this. Yakuza 5 is big, huge, colossal, grandiose, towering, pretty stonking large. Perhaps the only game that's so big that by the end, I can both struggle to recall the opening and somehow be nostalgic for it. Thinking of those chill days where I was just driving my taxi, only earlier that week in story terms. And this is its greatest strength and most glaring weakness. When comparing favorites in the series, People seem to gravitate towards 2, 5, 0, or more recently 7, with outliers for every other entry depending on what about the franchise most appeals to them. 5 has so much good in it, but it also just has so much in it. If you ask me if I love 5, I'd say sometimes. Like it? Sometimes. Dislike it? Sometimes. Hate it? Nah, no, never that bad. The characters can be so likeable and complex, their struggles interesting in a way that got me reflecting on myself and thinking about what they want, what I want. My reading on dreams was likely just as telling of me as the game, but I think that is one of its strengths. It approaches the abstract value of dreams wonderfully. It shows the downside of dreams so often while never shattering them, while never misunderstanding why people ascribe so much meaning to them. Never understating the strength they give us, both in the mundane day-to-day -day and in those pivotal moments of life. It has so much to ask about them, so many potential lessons to take away. It doesn't have some grand answer to dreams, but then you can't have one. We each have our own and pursue them in our own way. The best we can do is learn from watching others. No one but you will know what you truly want, and even you may not be so lucky as to know. It's just that it says the word so much that it does start seeming silly, seeming thoughtless. You have to be open to play on the game's level, explore those aspects. Or you could be like Kurosawa, be a bit of a sourpuss. But even that guy is harboring a dream, loath as he would be to admit it. But it also has long, tedious stretches. It awkwardly shunts dreams where they don't really belong. It has some really underserved characters and you can see it's trying, but it struggles to make all of them sing. I'd be amazed if it could make all of them sing. 
As an activity center, it's amazing. There is so much here and so much of it is genuinely enjoyable. The fact that there was this much to talk about is testament to the fact that it isn't just quantity. There's so much value and so much joy to be found here. But Yakuza 5 also gives me a slight melancholy for silly personal reasons, because it's also something of a transitional title. A good few recurring characters and subsystems make their final appearance here. Nothing that I'd consider a great pillar of Yakuza's narrative or design, but they finish in such strange, humble form. The Florist, Revelations, Inner Fighter. The only thing that could be said to go out with a bang is bespoke arcade games with the fantastic Gun Rain. It's obviously doubtful this game was intended to be the final appearance of these things. That's just the way it wound up. And with so much jockeying for attention, it would be weird if they announced their finality so much if their termination was somehow a planned thing. At the end of the day, that's what it all comes around to. The series will never go for this scale again. Even the JRPG-styled Yakuza 7 isn't quite as wide in scope as this. And while this is an amazing entry that has something to offer everyone in the fandom, it is massively inconsistent. And on some level, that is charming if you're someone like me who likes really digging into this stuff, which is hardly a market to cater to. I don't think it singularly excels in any one arena beyond size, but in that arena, Yakuza 5 is the reigning heavyweight champion. Thank you for watching. Really, thank you for sticking with me through this epic project. I hope I'm using that word appropriately, I know it's been mutilated by the internet. This has been a long road, but a satisfying one to walk. We're already long past other Patreon goals, but I hope you'll understand a break to see some other games before we continue on to Yakuza 0. Some VR, some Eurojank, something to give everyone what they want. If you want to support me on Patreon and put me even further behind my obligations, please do. You'll find a link in the description. If one-off payments are more your speed, I have a Ko-Fi I sometimes remember to link. If that isn't your style either, I understand, but please do spread the video to anyone you think might be interested. But don't blame them if they say, you realize how many hours that is, right? I have stuff to do. I hope I've entertained you. I hope I've gotten you more interested in Yakuza. And while this may be way too lofty for a gaming video, I hope you'll take some time to think about your dreams. They're complex buggers. Tricky. And while we may never truly figure them out for ourselves, while they may be daunting, they give us will. They give us purpose. And that's worth any number of hassles. Thanks for watching.